The story unfolds in the secret forest, cloaked in obscurity, with the atmosphere permeated by the redolence of time-worn trees and moist soil. Ning Yur and Lin Feng stood on either side of Su Yun Lan, who struggled to keep up with their pace. Ning Yur, a beautiful and cunning young woman, is engaged to Su Yun Lan, the adopted son of the Demon King's family. However, Ning Yur had no love for him and was instead infatuated with Ling Feng, a typical retainer involved in their political engagement. Su Yun Lan is adopted by the Demon King out of nowhere, and Ning Yur can't understand why her father had chosen Su Yun Lan over him. They continued their journey. And Ning Yu bantered Su Yun Lan, a good for nothing loser. Lin Feng glanced at Su Yun Lan and shook his head, having questions about what Ning Yu's father was thinking when picking Su Yu Lan as her fiance. Ning Yu just laughs it off and brags about how lucky Su Yun Lan is to be with her. Lin Feng couldn't help thinking about Su Yun Lan's past. He had been a typical retainer to the Demon King's family. Su Yun Lan remained silent as the two talked. He had always known that he was seen as a loser by Ning Yuer. However, he couldn't help how he felt about her and would do anything to protect her. Ning Yuer suddenly turned to Lin Feng with a mischievous glint in her eyes, telling him she had no idea what her dear father was thinking either. She promised Lin Feng that her heart always belonged to him. Lin Feng raised an eyebrow in surprise. He had never expected Ning Yuer to make a move on him so blatantly. Ning Yuer placed her hand on Ling Feng's chest, and he reciprocated by telling her he wasn't worried about it and would man up to her father once his trial was finished. It's his way of trying to be diplomatic. Ning Yuer's expression turned sour. A sudden idea occurred to her, suggesting taking care of Su Yu Lan while they were alone and with no witnesses, gesturing to finish Su Yun Lan's life right here. Lin Feng's eyes widened in shock, telling her to be careful as he is still the king's adopted son despite his weak form. As they continued walking, a rustling sound interrupted their conversation. Something or someone seemed to be hunting them. Su Yun Lan's instincts kicked in as he saw the demon approaching, pushing Ning Yu out of the way. Lin Feng springs into action, drawing his sword and preparing to fight as Su Yun Lan has his back to the ground while the demon is on top of him. Ning Yu watched in horror as Su Yu Lan desperately cried for help fighting for his life. The demon on top of him is about to get the taste of Lin Feng's blade. Despite all the chaos, Ning Yu saw an opportunity to end Su Yu Lan, as she suggested to Lin Feng a moment before the demon attacked. She asked Lin Feng for confirmation whether he agreed to what she suggested. This is a perfect chance for them. Lin Feng did not speak a word and continued to charge the demon and raised his sword, setting up to stab with a heavy blow. Lin Feng successfully stabbed the demon on top of Su Yu Lan. As the blade pierced through the creature, Lin Feng's heavy force made the sword get into Su Yu Lan's torso, causing him to bleed. Ling Yu watched with a cruel smile as Lin Feng's sword spurted blood, drenching the ground beneath them. He grabbed Su Yu Lan's head, trying to make him closer as he spoke coldly. Lin Feng told him that if he was going to die today, dying on his blade would be better, as if it was an honor, and in the end, he managed to finish them both. Su Yu Lan was confused and just blurted why while coughing with blood. She acknowledged Lin Feng commending him for being decisive. Lin Feng withdrew his sword, leaving Su Yu Lan helpless on the ground, drenched in his blood. Lin Feng reassures Su Yu Lan that he will inform his majesty about his tragic end. Ning Yu looked at Su Yun Lan's lifeless body, whispered to herself that she was sure of what she saw. It is dead. Lin Feng and Ning Yu turned and left Su Yun Lan's helpless body to writhe in agony. A man watched the scene with pity, exclaiming how tragic it is for someone born with a body suitable for demonic cultivation but betrayed by his own betrothed and her paramour. He knew all too well what it was like to be betrayed. This is an opportunity for him to borrow Su Yun Lan's body, seek revenge, and rewrite history. The man named Xu and Qiu Chuo did not waste a second of this window of opportunity for him. He feels very motivated as he clenches his fists. Xu and Qiu Chuo vows to blow away the darkness and finish his revenge this time. A bright light flashed, and Xu and Qiu Chuo found himself in his own realm, possessing Su Yun Lan's body. He looked down at his new form, marveling at how different it felt from his old body. Xu and Qiu Chuo, now Su Yun Lan, knew that demons only react to alive humans and sudden noise. With Su Yun Lan's particular body, he could avoid being detected as a human. However, he knew he had to be careful and avoid making the same mistake Su Yun Lan did. He remembered the ultimate technique of demonic possession, passed down by an ancient clan called the Nine Circles of Hell. Su Yun Lan had been the last living descendant of this clan, 
and the technique allowed the user to take over a demon's body. The stronger one's spirit, the stronger the possessive power. Su Yun Lan remarks about the power of demonic possession as he observes a demonstration. He explains that this technique is the ultimate way of possessing a demon using one's spirit. A moment later, Lin Feng and Ning Yu are kissing when suddenly Ning Yu notices something unusual. She exclaims in shock, realizing that demons are present. Lin Feng identifies the boss as the demon general. Su Yun Lan appears in front of them, disgusted by their behavior, and threatens them with a death stare. Lin Feng and Ning Yu are felt great danger as they watch the demon's presence. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan glares at them menacingly through the demon's eyes. As the battle raged on, Lin Feng fought valiantly against the demons, trying to protect his love, Ning Yu. They found themselves surrounded by a horde of demons. Lin Feng fought bravely, striking down as many demons as he could. But for each one he fell, two more seemed to take its place. Lin Feng was determined to protect Ning Yuer, the woman he loved. So he shows off some skills while fighting the demon, hoping to impress her with his bravery. Ning Yuer was unimpressed. Instead, in her mind, she belittles him. Finally, Lin Feng realized that they were outnumbered and outmatched. He is determined to find a way out. But just as they were about to flee, something unexpected occurred. Lin Feng felt a sharp pain as Ning Yuer pierced his back with a knife, causing the demon to divert the attack to Lin Feng to protect herself. Lin Feng could not believe Ning Yuer had done that to him. He coughed up so much blood and was about to ask why she did that when Ning Yuer interrupted him. Ning Yuer then insulted him as a slow, dimwit man, with a hint of disdain in her voice. Desperately, Lin Feng turned to Ning Yuer as he pleaded his feelings while in a dire time. Ning Yuer smiled, and her disdainful gaze made him feel small and insignificant. Ning Yuer suggests that he offers his blood to the demons as if his life is worth nothing to her. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan watched from a distance, his face unreadable, wondering how she got away and just brushed it off as if it won't matter, as everyone had their turn in the end. Su Yun Lan looked around, trying to determine what had caused the disturbance. Suddenly, he heard a woman's voice and the unmistakable noise of a horse. A woman on a magnificent stallion was galloping toward the demon. She had a sword in her hand and slashed through the air with incredible speed and precision. As he stood there watching her plunged into the battle, stabbing at the demons with ferocious fury. Her abilities impressed Su Yun Lan, and wondering why she was using so much power merely to rescue his body. While he glanced in the distance at the woman, he heard her voice again. Su Yun Lan grasps the demon's body weakened with a groan. He disengaged and collapsed to the ground as he cast a spell before him, feeling weak and helpless. The moon shines brightly in the gloomy night as the chilly wind blows. A young lady having a hot bath while chatting with her pet is perplexed as to why the gentleman she saves is surrounded by demons. At this moment, Su Yun Lan couldn't believe his luck as none of them seemed to notice him. His thoughts raced as he tried to piece together what had happened to him. Su Yun Lan slowly regained consciousness, but before he could fully comprehend the situation, a woman's voice interrupted his thoughts, catching him off guard. Su Yun Lan, who had fainted, wondered what had happened. He is suddenly surprised to find himself transformed into a squirrel. The woman is unaware that her pet's spirit got invaded by the Su Yun Lan spirit as she teases his pet who is not fond of water. Su Yun Lan felt disbelief in his perspective when he saw a lady's bathhouse with a nude woman alongside him, and later realized that he must have messed up the technique and ended up as her pet squirrel. As the woman slipped into her clothes, she said they checked on the man's body. He felt waggles on his body while seeing the woman change her clothes. Su Yun Lan's thoughts raced as he realized that the body they would feel was his own, and he needed to touch it to get back into it. He quickly dives to contact his body as they get close to it and regains full consciousness. Su Yun Lan made it a success. Finally, he was back in his body, confirming that his stomach wound had been treated and bandaged. As they are the only two people in the wilderness, Su Yun Lan believes this woman is the only one who treated his wound and saved his life. However, he doubted this woman seemed distant and to be concealing something, yet he felt something odd about her. Su Yun Lan knew he had to be going. But before he could, the woman mumbled something about looking for the fabled sword. As the woman tries to leave without saying a word, Su Yun Lan stops her and offers to guide her to the Sword of Legend as a token of gratitude for saving his life. As they approach the sword's location, the woman offers to climb since Su Yun Lan is injured. The woman steps forward and jumps so high that she pulls the sword out of the tree. 
she is surprised that it is the star splitter she's been looking for, a mighty weapon. After she landed on the ground, she asked the man why she knew the location of the sword. Su Yun Lan reveals that he knew of the sword's location as he chanced upon it and silently thanked the sacred scroll. In gratitude for the woman saving his life, Su Yun Lan offers her the sword as a gift. The woman is surprised that such an important sword is now hers. Then the woman introduced her name, Yuan Ying of the Xuan clan, tossed the jade tassel to him and assured him to help him. Su Yun Lan remembered her name and whispered it to himself, Yuan Ying. A group of people waiting outside of the spirit world exit as they anticipate the arrival of someone. One exclaims that someone is coming out, and the other asks who it is. Another one recognizes the person as the princess, and is excited to see her return. The fourth one points out that the princess has found the sword and is indeed the strongest of her generation. They all gather around and notice there is someone else behind the princess. A man recognizes him as Su Yun Lan. The man that recognizes is revealed to be the demon lord's eldest adopted son, Qiu Yixuan. However, some people insult and mock Su Yun Lan, calling him a loser adopted by their family. Qiu Yixuan responds by saying that he couldn't even die quietly, showing his resentment towards his adoptive family. Ning Yuer, who appears distressed, begins to cry and lament the loss of her loved one, Lin Feng. She then turns her attention to Su Yun Lan, calling him an opportunistic coward who abandoned her and left to die. Yuan Ying tries to defend Su Yun Lan by asking him to clear up the misunderstanding but he refuses and insults them. In his mind, Su Yun Lan thinks about how manipulative Ning Yuer can be and how she could talk the Grim Reaper himself into giving her extra time. Cao Yik Shuen then punches Su Yun Lan, letting a fight break out. Su Yun Lan thinks that if he fights back, he will give himself away as he tries to keep his identity a secret. Qiu Yik Shuen puts a cape around Ning Yuer's shoulders and assures her they will not let Su Yun Lan's dishonorable behavior pass. He promised that the cowardice would be met with firm punishment. The people around them are impressed with Qiu Yik Shuen's response. Even someone stated that he seems like an intelligent and responsible young man. However, Yuan Ying calls Qiu Yik Shuen a hypocrite, suggesting she may know more about the situation than she lets on. Qiu Yik Shuen ordered his guards to apprehend Su Yun Lan, and the group began to disperse. A moment later, Ning Yuer is suspicious of Su Yun Lan, making her think he might know too much. However, she kept the thought to herself. The first rays of daylight began to peek over the horizon. Su Yun Lan walked down the streets and was lost in his thoughts. It was dangerous being Su Yun Lan in this world. He had nearly died twice since arriving here, but he had to remain on his mission, a purpose that he was determined to fulfill. He thought back to his previous lives, and memories of his past flashed before his eyes. In his first life, he had been the proud son of the Xuan clan, the most substantial family of cultivators in the kingdom but they had been framed and brought down by the so-called disciples of the righteous path. They killed him coldly and forced his father to become their demon king. In his second life, he was a scientist of the 21st century. He studied natural laws and scientific philosophy, but it did not bring him any closer to taking revenge for his bloody end. And now, in his third life, he had returned to his birth world as his father's adopted son. He had become Su Yun Lan, a retainer family's son adopted by the sect leader. But not everyone was happy about his return. Even his family members looked down on him, seeing him as a lowly nobody who should disappear. Su Yun Lan had a plan. He was determined to turn this wretched world on its head. He knew that everything rode on having power, money, and even political backing. And that's where the Heavenly Scroll came in. It was a powerful tool that could make him rich beyond his wildest dreams. He prayed to the scroll to make him prosperous, he whispered to himself, holding onto the scroll tightly. Somewhere else, a man and a woman are engaged in a game of odds and evens. The man is frustrated and loses a round to the woman, who taunts him with a laugh. Right then, a stranger came in. Su Yun Lan whispered a set of numbers to the man and bet on the odds. The man is surprised and irritably asks who he is. The woman interrupts, asking the man whether he is scared to keep playing. The man takes offense and follows the stranger's bet on the odds. The woman announces her bet on three, three, or five odds, which the man wins in the game. However, the stranger whispers to the man again, advising him to bet on evens for the next round. The man followed the stranger's advice and won the next round with evens. The stranger then whispers another set of numbers for the next round, which the man follows and wins again. The woman becomes suspicious of the man's winning streak and accuses Su Yun Lan of cheating. The stranger challenges her to prove her allegations. As the tension rises, the man reveals his identity as a nobleman and throws his royal crest. 
indicating his power and influence. The woman and others in the establishment immediately kneel in respect. Then, Su Yun Lan introduces himself and offers his service to the noble. The noble, pleased with Su Yun Lan's assistance, thanks him and asks him to rise. Su Yun Lan also expressed his gratitude. Meanwhile, the manager appeared in the establishment. He them by apologizing and welcoming them to the establishment. He then introduces his name, Chang Huo. The nobleman recognizes Chang Huo's dragon ring and realizes he is a retainer of his older brother. Chang Huo offers to report any issues directly to his lord, the second prince. However, in his mind, he thinks of the nobleman as a good-for-nothing spoiled kid who won't amount to anything. The nobleman is taken aback by Chang Huo's words and seems hesitant. Then the nobleman sighs and tells Su Yun Lan to leave and return the winnings. But Su Yun Lan intervenes, saying he will handle the unpleasantness. Su Yun Lan then insults the manager, Chang Huo, calling him derogatory and smacking him. This causes a commotion. The people around them are surprised. Chang Huo tells his men to get Su Yun Lan, but he stops them, interrupting the manager that he is looking out for him. Su Yun Lan then tells Chang Huo that he disrespects his grace and that there is a death penalty for disrespecting royalty. Chang Huo panics, and Su Yun Lan continues to insult him. The nobleman seems amused by the situation, thinking Chang Huo is a dumb man. Su Yun Lan humiliates Chang Huo further by giving him a dog bowl, reminding him where he belongs. Chang Huo is furious and vows to get back at them. The nobleman tells Su Yun Lan to leave, and they eat at the Immortality Pavilion. Chang Huo is left fuming and smashes a plate in his hands, feeling an incredible frustration. He then tells his guard to find out who Su Yun Lan is as he vows to get his revenge. Later in an inn, two men discuss their lodgings. The nobleman is complaining that they could only book second-rate rooms due to booking at the last minute. Su Yun Lan responds to the complaints with annoyance, thinking that their room is actually a presidential suite. As they are talking, the nobleman introduces himself as Lai Tan, the youngest son of the current emperor. He boasts about his ability to get them into any place in the capital for entertainment, and Su Yun Lan notes that he seems proud of himself. He also observes that there is a vast difference in character between Lai Tang and his sister. Su Yun Lan introduces himself as the second adopted son of the Demon King. Lai Tang is amazed to hear that Su Yun Lan is the second son of the Demon King and thinks that they must have been fated to meet. He jokes that a loser son like Su Yun Lan and a good-for-nothing prince like himself make a great pair. Su Yun Lan jokes about their conversation sounding a little inappropriate, which confuses Lai Tang. He asks for clarification, and Su Yun Lan responds that it means close friends. Lai Tang asks Su Yun Lan for his opinion on the gambling game they just played and compliments him, calling him a betting god. However, Lai Tang is not satisfied and shows disappointment in the quality of the alcohol. He slams his cup on the table before deciding to find better alcohol. Su Yun Lan thinks Lai Tang needs to watch his mouth since he is only 13 or 14. As Lai Tang leaves the room, Su Yun Lan hears a squirrel outside the window and realizes that his possession technique works on small animals too. He engages in the Nine Circles clan possession technique and possesses the squirrel, causing his body to fall at his feet. He realizes that it has worked and feels pleased with himself. Suddenly, he jumps out of the room to get on top of the tree and slips, which startles Su Yun Lan. He is relieved to have not fallen and thinks that he needs some time to adjust to his new body. Meanwhile, he also saw Ning Yuer with his grandfather in the inn, and hears the conversation with his grandfather by asking why she needs to marry Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan thinks that he suspects Yuer of being a fraud and wonders what new trick she's planning. Ding Yuer's grandfather explains that the engagement is an alliance between their clan and the Demon King. He reveals that Su Yun Lan has a rare property in his blood, which makes him invisible to demons. Ning Yuer is surprised to hear this and remembers how he survived a sea of monsters without a scratch. However, Ning Yuer points out that Su Yun Lan cannot use cultivation techniques and is no better than a commoner. Her grandfather explains that the gods granted him this blood, a waste, except for their clan's traditional mantis spider blood art. He explains that the technique, when performed together by a man and a woman, this technique will steal the man's blood and spirit. Ning Yuer's grandfather convinces her that with Su Yun Lan's blood, she can become a cultivation prodigy and be immune to demons. Ning Yuer seems excited about becoming an unmatched genius and asks if they will suck out Su Yun Lan's blood and leave him to die. 
Her grandfather confirms this and reveals a bottle of poison from the venom of thousands of insects that completely disintegrates a person's insides, causing an agonizing death. Su Yunlan thinks it's disgraceful that such a prestigious noble family is plotting against him underhandedly. Su Yunlan recognizes the poison is the same one that killed him, and he thinks that the Yongwei clan must have been involved in his premature death. He stared angrily at the two people inside the room from the outside while leaning against the tree. Ying Yuer and his grandfather didn't realize that someone was watching them. Afterward, Su Yun Lan's body now possesses his own. The sound of leaves floating can be heard in the background. While pondering about the Yongwei clan being one of the culprits he was after, he wonders if they have more sordid secrets. He is in a precarious situation with enemies approaching him from all sides. His fiancé's family wants him dead, and he cannot face his father now. Su Yun Lan realizes that if he cannot get out of this arranged marriage, he will surely be dead. Just then, his friend Lai Tang offers him a place to stay. Su Yun Lan thinks this is just what he hoped for. The wind blowing can be heard as he makes his way to Lai Tang's place. He comments on how luxurious Lai Tang's home is, with the area for entertaining guests taking up a whole courtyard. He also notes that the prince's mansion is built next to the princess's, which he thinks might be a stroke of good fortune. As Su Yun Lan is exploring Lai Tang's place, he notices a squirrel and realizes it is the princess's pet squirrel, then wonders if it came from the princess's mansion. Su Yun Lan calls the squirrel and hugs it. Su Yun Lan then uses the Nine Circles Possession Technique to transform it into a squirrel. He exclaims that he is coming for his princess and thinks that maybe he'll get lucky today with another beautiful view. When Su Yun Lan successfully lands in squirrel form, he already understands how to use his body form. Su Yun Lan realized he had run into the room as he looked around. He was taken aback by the size and how spacious the room was. Then he noticed someone was taking a bath in the tub and jumped straight up to see the naked body of the woman who had no idea of his presence. He was so flustered by what he saw that it made his nose bleed. He spotted the naked woman in the tub just in his mind. The woman then stated that her pet squirrel had not brought a towel with her. Su Yun Lan wonders why every time they encounter it always seems like an AV episode. On the other hand, Yuan Ying appears to have shifted her posture in the tub to expose some flesh on her legs in front of her pet squirrel. That's when Su Yun Lan's thought nosebleed doesn't end. Su Yun Lan is numbing himself to relieve his suffering and control all his focus and the body. Then Yuan Ying suggested that she use the squirrel's body as a towel to dry herself off because the squirrel didn't bring her a towel. That's when Su Yun Lan curses while flees away from the bathhouse. He calmed down again and whispered that he was alive in the 21st century and uncensored hentai thing was nothing. The realization of being single for three lifetimes came in. He is making an excuse that his current circumstance is riskier than using his possessing technique, as if his spirit is going to depart from his body. Su Yun Lan looked around the room, trying to get his bearings. He had been so busy running away that he hadn't been paying attention to where he was going. But now that he had stopped to catch his breath, he realized he was in a grand chamber filled with ornate furnishings and expensive decorations. As he looked around, his eyes fell upon a table in the center of the room, and on that table was a letter. It was addressed to a cousin, Her Highness, and it looked like it had already been opened. He quickly grabbed the letter and began to read it. The letter was from the garrison general reporting that everything seemed business as usual for the last few months. However, the second prince showed distrust and formed his own faction. And to make matters worse, the recent training exercise had been an excuse to bully the troops. The letter pleaded with Her Highness to marry and produce an heir, hoping it would bring peace to the troops. It was signed with a message of loyalty, a hope that once the head of state recovered from his illness, her Highness would take the throne. Su Yun Lan's mind raced as he read the letter. The princess won the heart of the soldiers pledging their loyalty as they asked her to bear an heir. This meant she had ambitions to rule over the kingdom and become the empress. But Su Yun Lan wasn't interested in the throne. He had his own agenda, revenge against those who had wronged him, a personal mission he cannot set aside. This also looks like an opportunity for the princess' ambition. He could use her power to exact his revenge if he could marry her and help her take the throne. Meanwhile, Lai Tang was looking for her sister, asking the maids about his sister's whereabouts. The maid assured him she would tell his sister he was looking for her. At the same time, Su Yun Lan noticed Lai Tang's presence and decided to return to his own body. Lai Tang continued to wait for his sister, and he noticed the squirrel heading toward his mansion. Confused, he followed it with his gaze, but Yuan Ying had already exited the room. Yuan Ying asked him if he had seen his pet squirrel, and Lai Tang informed her that her pet was heading toward his mansion. Yuan Ying, frustrated with the pet's behavior, wanted to give her a piece of her mind. 
However, Lai Tang interrupted her and excitedly told her to meet a mysterious man he had just met, Su Yun Lan. Then the strong winds began to howl in the yard. Su Yun Lan thought possessing the pet squirrel's body might cause him bad luck. Unaware of the situation, Lai Tang was excited and enthusiastic about introducing his sister to Su Yun Lan. It turned out that Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan had met in the secret forest, where he had helped her find the Sword of Legend. Lai Tang was impressed by his new acquaintance's heroism and thought he was excellent. Then Lai Tang invites Su Yun Lan inside the palace. Yuan Ying wondered if Su Yun Lan could be a spy sent by the second or seventh prince. She couldn't shake off the coincidence of meeting him twice and was suspicious of his motives. Inside the palace walls, a maid pouring hot tea into a porcelain cup echoed through the air. The graceful and elegant princess, Yuan Ying, looked up from her cup and spoke to Su Yun Lan, inviting him to a tea ceremony she hosted in her backyard the next day. She hoped that Su Yun Lan could attend, but it wasn't just any ordinary tea ceremony. Yuan Ying was expecting all the talented men who had gathered to challenge the secret forest to attend as well. Su Yun Lan was intrigued by the idea of the tea ceremony and decided to attend it. He assured Yuan Ying that he would move mountains to make it happen. As Su Yun Lan spoke those words, his thoughts were already racing. As the guests arrived at the princess's residence, the host announced their arrival one by one. The second prince and the seventh prince entered and were followed by Xu and Qiu Yi who is the demon clan heir, and Ning Yu who is from the Yangui sect. Wai Sheng and Hu Wenyu from the Lai and Hua families respectively also made their way into the banquet hall. Xu and Qiu Yi's attention was immediately drawn towards Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan was sitting next to the youngest prince. In the meantime, Ning Yu recognized Su Yun Lan. She is wondering why he was present at the gathering. Qiu Yi in an irritable mood grabbed Su Yun Lan by the shirt. He called him a waste of space and demanded that he get down from his seat. Wai Tang intervened and asked Qiu Yi to let go of his guest Su Yun Lan. The second prince stops Qiu Yi and reminded him that they were not in a demon clan meeting room and that he should be mindful of decorum. Qiu Yi finally let go of Su Yun Lan and took walk away, as the second prince willed it. Su Yun Lan thanks the second prince whilst comparing him in his thoughts to how Lai Tang seemed to be very young. The second prince got interested and was piqued at the sight of Su Yun Lan. The ceremony then began, and Yuan Ying spoke to the group. She is explaining that they had been called together to discuss a difficult but vital topic, how to feed their people. Yuan Ying continued, explaining that the population was growing rapidly, and their resources were dwindling. It was clear that they needed to find a solution as soon as they can to ensure that no one will be hungry. Su Yun Lan realized that Yuan Ying was referring to the large drought in the northwest. Huey suggested that increasing grain production and distributing noble lands to farmers could solve the problem. An old person praised Qiyi's idea, much to Su Yun Lan's suspicion. He knew that Qiyi worked for the seventh prince, who had asked him to present the idea as his own. Yuan Ying called out to Lai Tang and responded right away with a sarcastic remark and criticized Qiyi's suggestion, causing confusion among the others present. Lai Tang becomes irritated. He pointed out that the eldest princess had mentioned that and acknowledged the importance of the matter. Lai Tang knew that simply donating food would not solve the problem in the long term. They needed to head the problem off at its source which was the drought itself. He suggests that the immediate course of action should be to send shipments of grain to the northwest to feed the drought victims. Huey, who is present there, thinks to himself about how unexpected it was for the Playboy Prince to come up with such a thoughtful plan. Lai Tang then addresses his sister, saying that the Northwest drought is a national disaster, and the royal family alone should not be responsible for providing relief. He proposes that they should appeal to all noble clans and sects to work with them in this time of urgent national need. He suggests that donating food alone would be like bailing a leaking boat. He proposes that his sister should send for all their aqueduct engineers to organize them into task forces and send them to the Northwest to irrigate the land and end the drought. The crowd and Yuan Ying were impressed by Lai Tang's insightful plan, and Su Yun Lan couldn't help but smirk. Su Yun Lan felt superior and mocked them as ancient people and believed that he had made his first move in the game of chess with Lai Tang as his pawn. Later, Su Yun Lan wakes up feeling refreshed and energized, realizing that he had not slept so well in a long time. He decided to go and find out what Lai Tang had planned for the day. Su Yun Lan approaches a servant and politely asks to be taken to Lai Tang. A servant informed him that Lai Tang had left early that morning to attend the court and had not yet returned. Suddenly, a royal guard barged in, demanding to see the princess. Su Yun Lan started to feel uneasy and worried that something had happened to Lai Tang. Just then, Su Yun Lan notices Ying Ying, a squirrel pet of the princess. He then orders the servant to return to their chores so that he can interact with the squirrel, Ying Ying. 
He then turned around and calls out to Ying Ying. The squirrel Ying Ying quickly sprang to Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan demonstrates the Nine Circles possession technique to Ying Ying, and they engaged in a playful exchange. Su Yun Lan decided to go and see what was going on at the princess's place. He then sets off toward the princess's place. Yuan Ying is shocked to hear that her brother, Lai Tang, has been thrown into royal prison. She questions the imperial officer about what happened, and he reveals that Lai Tang had criticized the court's solutions to the northwestern drought, which enraged the emperor. As the conversation continues, Su Yun Lan is observing the scene and realizes that Lai Tang is not the type of person to make such statements and suspects that it may be part of court machinations. Yuan Ying is worried about her brother's well-being and decides to go and explain things to their father. Su Yun Lan immediately possesses his body to stop Yuan Ying from making a rash decision. Yuan Ying was curious and has become increasingly suspicious of Su Yun Lan's knowledge of Lai Tang's situation. She then demanded to know how he knew that something had happened to her brother, and questioned him about his intentions and who had sent him in. Su Yun Lan was caught off guard and realized that he didn't have enough time to think of an excuse to explain his presence. He stumbled over his words, trying to come up with a plausible explanation. He told Yuan Ying that he heard from someone that her brother had left for the morning court in high spirits. However, he had seen an imperial officer rushing into Her Highness's estate just now and that had made him assume that something had happened to Lai Tang. Yuan Ying was skeptical but decided to hear him out. Su Yun Lan warned her that rushing in without a plan could only make things worse. She was about to push past Su Yun Lan when he stopped her again and suggested a plan. Su Yun Lan told Yuan Ying that he could free her brother in her place. He was well versed in irrigation systems and knew how to navigate the underground passages, assuring her that he could resolve the matter and asked for something in return. Yuan Ying was hesitant but agreed as she realized that she had no other choice. However, Su Yun Lan has an ulterior motive, and asked Yuan Ying for something in exchange. Meanwhile, Lai Tang was sent to the underground prison, and he was immediately greeted by a group of rowdy prisoners. They jeered and taunted him, making comments about his clothing and how he must be someone important. They likened him to a snowflake, fragile and delicate. The royal guards pushed Lai Tang to his cell. Lai Tang couldn't help but feel a wave of fear wash over him as the heavy jail door clicked shut, locking him inside. He let out a sniffle and whispered for his sister's help, hoping she could somehow hear his plea. But the prisoners were quick to pick up on his vulnerability and started teasing him further, mockingly asking him why he is shaking. They boasted about the prison's death row being more interesting than the royal court, and how even Princess Ying would keep them company at night. Lai Tang could feel his anger rising, he could snap at any given moment. In a fit of rage, he started cursing the prisoners and threatening them with violence. He even went so far and started to smack one of them in the face. One of the prisoners in front of him laughed off his outburst. The man remarked that Lai Tang was a firecracker. Though he was just crying earlier he had proven to be tougher than he looked. Lai Tang is taken aback by the man's statements and wants to know who he is. Meanwhile, in the royal court, Su Yun Lan entered and immediately drew the attention of the courtiers. All eyes are on him as he made his way toward the emperor. Su Yun Lan greeted the emperor and humbly presented himself as the representative of the princess. He then proceeded to report the truth regarding the northwestern drought, speaking confidently and eloquently. But the emperor was not easily impressed. He called out his name Su Yun Lan, accusing him of presuming too much by appearing before him. The king assumed that Su Yun Lan was there to plead for mercy on behalf of his son. Su Yun Lan explained to the emperor what happened to his highness as he must have been misinformed which causes his raving. However, before Su Yun Lan could plead his case, a couple of royal officials rudely interrupted and started to mock him and reminding him that he is just a filthy commoner. The officials' behavior was appalling, and they seemed to have no respect for Su Yun Lan who is trying to do the right thing. Su Yun Lan did not back down and instead, he challenged the officials' accusations by asking what made them think that his report is fake he manages to criticize the officials' presumptuous behavior. The official was quick to deny any such intentions and begged the royal majesty to take no heed of Su Yun Lan's ravings. Su Yun Lan was far from giving up. He pointed out how the officers were trying to dictate the royal majesty's family affairs, trying to make them sound unacceptable. He also reminded them that the royal majesty had wisely led the country to prosperity, and that he would not fall victim to false words. The official was outraged, but the royal majesty intervened, noting how clever Su Yun Lan's tongue was. 
he silenced the official witch's minister he and turned his attention to Su Yun Lan's, allowing him to speak. Su Yun Lan thanked the royal majesty. The royal majesty made a gesture for him to proceed with what he was planning to do. As Su Yun Lan continued to discuss the highness's standpoint, describing him as someone who does not speak lightly to the common people, the second prince intervened and gave an explanation of why he commended his younger brother for having such brilliant ideas during the tea gathering. He proceeded to beg for mercy on his behalf which caught the royal majesty's attention. Then Su Yun Lan spoke to the royal majesty about him. His highness discovered the cause of the drought. Thinking back to the time when he had utilized prophecies from the divine scroll and facts from the 21st century to determine the reason for the drought. However, using the heavenly scroll cost him greatly. Something in him was being sucked out. His whole body was momentarily in agony. He knew he had to be careful in the future but right now he must get through it. The royal majesty then asked to hear the investigation results. He started explaining while investigating the records regarding the drought and found that water sources had dried up in large areas of the northwest, and the rain had not visited them for a fortnight. Along were also buried in the records, the death toll had been highest in the western regions, indicating that the source of the drought lay in the west. However, this statement was met with skepticism from some royal officials, who started accusing him of being presumptuous and not knowing what he was saying. The official claimed to have managed farmland for dozens of years and therefore would have noticed any signs of a drought. Su Yun Lan remained calm and composed as he responded to the official revealing that several months ago the agricultural reports had already indicated extraordinary decreases in grain production in that area. He pointed out that the official could not have missed such an obvious warning of an impending drought. The official was taken aback and puzzled how Su Yun Lan could know such things. Su Yun Lan continued to present his findings, stating that he had sent some demon clan underlings to investigate the canals on their territory bordering the northwest. They had found fish carcasses floating in the water. This indicates that new water had ceased to flow into the canal. Su Yun Lan summarized that this was the cause of the northwestern drought. He implored the royal majesty to send workmen to the northwest and to set his highness free. The royal officials looked at each other in shock and disbelief. Some court officials were surprised by Su Yun Lan's argument, with some even commenting on what they thought was a good-for-nothing prince. The royal majesty was impressed by Su Yun Lan's intelligence and seemed intrigued by his proposal, then ordered Minister Lai to investigate all water feeding into the demon clan's canals immediately. Overseer Han was also instructed to put Su Yun Lan's aid plan into motion forthwith. Then the royal majesty leaned forward. Su Yun Lan smiled feeling relieved that he had managed to convince the royal majesty. The royal majesty warned Su Yun Lan that his investigations should not yield the promised results. He would have his head as a consolation prize. Su Yun Lan accepted the warning and promised to deliver on his proposal. Su Yun Lan feels the tense situation in Princess Yuan Ying's estate, as he stands before her with her sword pointed at his throat. He is confused and alarmed by the sudden aggression asking if he has done anything to deserve such treatment. However, the princess seems to be unconvinced and began to cite the example of Lai Tang, who was imprisoned for speaking out of turn in court. Su Yun Lan is nervous as the princess draws a small cut on his throat, realizing that any sudden movements could be fatal. He wondered why Lai Tang's behavior is being linked to him. At this point, a maidservant interrupts their conversation, informing the princess that the Yongwei sect has sent for Mr. Su. The princess is surprised at this news and turns her attention to Su Yun Lan, who remains silent. The princess accuses him of being in league with his fiance, Ning Yuer, to deceive her. Su Yun Lan realizes that the misunderstanding is only getting worse, and he needs to act fast. Yuan Ying is annoyed by Su Yun Lan's silence and ordered him to leave and attend to his fiance, Ning Yuer. Su Yun Lan thinks that Princess is assuming the wrong things. However, he needs to leave and sort out the issue with Ning Yuer and the Yangwei sect. Su Yun Lan arrived at the meetup location and is suspicious of why Ning Yuer had called him there. He knew that she had an ancient cultivation art that could steal his blood and spirit energy, and according to the Heavenly Scroll, she would poison his dessert. He noticed a squirrel running up a nearby tree. Suddenly, an idea struck him and used the squirrel to reveal Yuer's true intentions. Ning Yuer arrived, and she greeted him with a smile and a flaunt of her dress. Su Yun Lan said he waited for a while. When Ning Yuer tripped on her ankle, Su Yun Lan quickly caught her before she fell to the ground. She thanked him and continued to act affectionately toward him. Su Yun Lan asked why she did call him there. However, Ning Yuer changes the subject and just taunts him with his impatience. Ning Yuer then offered him a pastry she had made and urged him to try it. Su Yun Lan was hesitant, knowing that it could be poisoned, but decided to play along. 
Ning Yuer noticed that he wasn't eating and tried to feed him. Su Yun Lan couldn't help but think that if he wasn't warned by the Heavenly Scroll or if he was the old Su Yun Lan, he would be dead by now. Suddenly a squirrel appeared in the room and Su Yun Lan offered a piece of pastry to the squirrel. Ning Yuer was caught off guard when Su Yun Lan did that. She became anxious and tried to retrieve the pastry from the squirrel. But Su Yun Lan stopped her and suggested that they both have a piece. Just when they were about to eat, the poor squirrel suddenly died. Su Yun Lan confirms that the pastry was indeed poisoned. So he threw the pastry and the cup away in disgust and confronted Ning Yuer, accusing her of trying to poison him. Ning Yuer was caught in the act and couldn't deny her actions. Su Yun Lan was furious and started calling her names. He pointed out that she colluded with her lover to try to get him killed. He couldn't let his guard down around someone as deceitful as Ning Yuer. So Ning Yuer was speechless. The tension between Ning Yuer and Su Yun Lan was escalating rapidly. Ning Yuer had drawn her sword and pointed it towards Su Yun Lan calling him an ungrateful bastard. Su Yun Lan was surprised by her outburst and asked why she was allowed to try to poison him, but he couldn't insult her. In response, Ning Yuer pulled out a drug and offered it to Su Yun Lan. She promised him untold riches and protection from the emperor's wrath if he took the drug. Su Yun Lan countered by suggesting they take the drug together and share the wealth. However, Ning Yuer threatened to drug him by force and was about to swing her sword when she suddenly stopped. She noticed the jade tassel that Su Yun Lan was holding in his hand and realized that it belonged to the princess. She demanded an explanation, but Su Yun Lan refused to answer her questions and announced that he was going back to the princess's estate. Ning Yuer was left in disbelief and called the princess a slut. She was envious of the princess and wondered what the princess had that she didn't. Ning Yuer vowed to one day have her chance to ascend the heavens. After the altercation with Ning Yuer, Su Yun Lan found himself focusing on other things, such as plans from the emperor. Suddenly, a cartwheeled vehicle rushed towards him, and he was dragged into a wheeled vehicle by two unknown men. Su Yun Lan initially thought that it was Ning Yuer's people and asked them who they were. The men did not answer so he swung a sharp knife the intent to defend himself. Acting fast, the man opposite to him caught the blade with his fingers, telling him to cool down. Su Yun Lan was silent and looked at the old geezer. The old man said that he wasn't an enemy and had only followed orders to take him back to the court. Su Yun Lan recognized the man in front of him as Tang Baeyun, the captain of the uniformed guard and the brother of the majesty. He respectfully greeted Tang Baeyun who told him that his brother wanted to see him in the royal court. Su Yun Lan understood and responded that he appreciated the attention. As Su Yun Lan arrived at the royal palace, the guard announced his arrival. Su Yun Lan was honored to be in the royal majesty's presence as he filled his voice with respect. The royal majesty commanded Su Yun Lan to rise, telling him that there was no need for formalities. The royal majesty made a solemn announcement to the court, revealing that the cause of the drought in the northwest had been found. He proposed that the problem was in the western canals. Lai Tang expressed admiration and gratitude towards Su Yun Lan. Minister he was also impressed and agreed that it was as he said. Other officials commended the youngster for showing some potential. The royal majesty was relieved that the crisis had been averted and wanted to reward Su Yun Lan accordingly. Su Yun Lan saw this as an opportunity to escape his engagement and bravely asked for the hand of Princess Yuan Ying. The court officials were shocked at Su Yun Lan's audacity and started to mock him for his lack of wealth and status. Lai Tang admired Su Yun Lan's boldness, but the royal majesty was hesitant to let him marry Princess Yuan Ying because of his low status and asked his daughter. Princess Yuan Ying, on the other hand, looked up to her father and spoke out, reminding him of a promise he had made to her. She requested that her father must honor his promise to fulfill Su Yun Lan's request. The reaction of the court officials were shock and disbelief at the princess's decision to marry someone beneath her. Then the royal majesty silenced them all, as he was also hesitant to allow such a marriage due to the difference in rank, and all court officials nodded in agreement at what the royal majesty said. After much debate, the royal majesty relented and allowed Princess Yuan Ying to take Su Yun Lan as his fiancé. It implied that she would take him based on their respective ranks, with the person holding the higher rank typically taking the other as their spouse. Then the royal majesty dismissed the assembly. Su Yun Lan expressed his gratitude, and the court officials continued to express their disbelief. In the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan felt accomplished knowing that he had solved the issue of his engagement to Ning Yuer. Su Yun Lan then met Princess Yuan Ying and Lai Tang in the room. Yuan Ying excused her brother to go as she had a matter to discuss with Mr. Su, so he asked Princess Yuan Ying what the matter would be. Princess Yuan Ying summed up their situation with the outside world and expressed gratitude to Su Yun Lan for saving her brother's life. 
to pay him. She accepted to marry him in front of his royal majesty. Su Yun Lan admired the close bond between the siblings. Princess Yuan Yin looked at Su Yun Lan with suspicion. She was known for her impatience towards anyone who she felt was trying to manipulate her. She didn't care how he had barged into the court with unclear intentions and warned him not to use her brother for his personal objectives. Su Yun Lan stuttered out his response, but Yuan Ying maintained her gaze on him and allowed him to proceed. However, when Su Yun Lan asked for a possible presumptuous request, Yuan Ying quickly told him not to ask. But Su Yun Lan humorously asked for her money, which left both of them silenced. Yuan Yin thought it was ridiculous for her fiancé to ask her for money when they were just engaged. Su Yun Lan, on the other hand, was confused by her reaction and wondered what she meant when she said he might not. Yuan Ying asked him what he wanted, and Su Yun Lan explained that he needed money to settle himself in the capital. Yuan Ying allowed him to take money from the treasury in the future but didn't want to be bothered with trivial matters. So Su Yun Lan happily walked out of the room. But Yuan Ying stared at him with frustration and thought of him as a typical commoner. Meanwhile, at the second prince's estate, Su Yun Lan was beside himself with excitement. He thought he had just been given access to the imperial treasury and was eager to spend his new wealth. Lai Tang then spotted Su Yun Lan and confusedly asked if he had walked out from there. Su Yun Lan responded humorously if he was supposed to crawl. Lai Tang's arm was placed over Su Yun Lan's shoulder and he excitedly suggested they go out and celebrate. Lai Tang also talked about an interesting guy he met in prison, which made Su Yun Lan wonder what kind of people he saw there. However, Su Yun Lan was particularly interested in the Ning family estate, where his ex fiance lived. He asked Lai Tang about the Ning family estate, so Lai Tang told him about the Ning's pawnbroker shop, which specialized in refined black iron, a rare and valuable material that he had heard about from his sister. On second thought, Lai Tang asked why Su Yun Lan was thinking about his ex fiance and if he was thinking of getting back with her. In an awkward situation, Su Yun Lan told Lai Tang that he was overthinking it and offered to go out for a drink. Su Yun Lan had an awkward face, mouthing the word pawn shop and refined black iron. He thought that the ancient world might have kept rare materials and skills secret, but a modern scientist could use them to his advantage. Su Yun Lan saw an opportunity for revenge against the Nings and decided to use the money he had borrowed from Yuan Ying to fund his venture. Lai Tang was creeped out by Su Yun Lan's cold smile. At the royal fiancé pawn shop, people discuss rumors of the princess's fiancé buying out pawnbrokers in the eastern district for a high price. Some mention the fiancé offering a high price for the low-quality yellow slurry, while another suggests selling it to the sucker who bought out the pawnbrokers. In the other scene, a shopkeeper in the pawn shop buys all the yellow slurry from the individuals, while Su Yun Lan just sits and listens to them. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan thinks to himself that the people in this era have outdated metallurgy knowledge as he recognizes the yellow slurry as chalcopyrite, a copper ore, and plans to refine it into copper and use it to make bronze based on his knowledge of modern metallurgy. He also thinks that the Nings have a monopoly on the production of black refined iron, but he will use his 21st century knowledge to make metal that is much stronger. At the Ning estate, Ning Yuer thinks he overestimated Su Yun Lan and then planned to send a gift fit for a royal wedding a dozen carts carrying tons of yellow slurry, hoping to bankrupt him. Meanwhile, at Royal Fiancé Pawn Shop, an employee informs Su Yun Lan that the Nings are making trouble, and brought a couple of dozen carts of slurry. Su Yun Lan meets Ning Yuer, who cracks a joke about the street under the weight of her carts. Ning Yuer then says that she heard that he needed a large quantity of yellow slurry, so she brought a dozen of carts. Su Yun Lan turns towards Ning Yuer and tells her that he indeed needs an amount of slurry for ore refinement then orders his employees to transport the goods into the warehouse. The individuals around him couldn't help but gossip about his plan. They found it ridiculous and laughed at him, calling him a fool. Ning Yuer, on the other hand, sarcastically questions the quality of the armor that can be made from slurry-grade materials if it would break even if not worn. But Su Yun Lan assures her that he knows what he's doing and left her to take care of his matter. Su Yun Lan commands his staff to inform the people of the updated prices. The staff quickly makes the announcement to the town of the updated prices, causing a frenzy in the village. People rush to gather as much slurry as they can find and sell it to Su Yun Lan. Some say he was a bit crazy for buying such low-quality materials, while others saw it as an opportunity. Ning Yuer orders her four largest pawnbrokers to spread the word about Su Yun Lan's offer. She knows that by doing so, she can take advantage of the situation to make Su Yun Lan poor and ruin him, so if the princess kicks him out, he can crawl back to her like a dog. 
At the same time, in the smithy area, the workers inform their boss, Su Yun Lan, that they have forged an item according to his instructions and acknowledge that he has turned waste into treasure. At this moment, Lai Tang arrives to see Su Yun Lan. He is greeted by Su Yun Lan who informs him that there is a new weapon for him to try hot off the forge. Lai Tang asked what it was, and Su Yun Lan replied by revealing it to be a dagger, which was recently forged at their workshop. Lai Tang seems surprised, questioning Su Yun Lan's decision to spend so much money on a dagger. As Lai Tang is inspecting the dagger, he accidentally drops it, and it falls on a ground, piercing right through it. He is amazed at how sharp the dagger is and asks Su Yun Lan how he managed to make it. Su Yun Lan reveals that he used a special process to refine the slurry he bought, creating a unique alloy that is both durable and sharp. Also compares it to the best weapon-making material in the world, which is claimed to be the black refined iron used by the Ning family. He even suggests that his dagger is better than anything the Ning family could make. Su Yun Lan then requests Lai Tang to take Met along to witness tomorrow's exchange between the princess and the Ning heiress. A staff member is thanking Ning Yuer for organizing the four largest pawnbrokers to monopolize the newest shipment of black refined iron, used to create unmatched armor, and he is confident that even the high and mighty princess will need to seek their stock. Ning Yuer expresses her disdain for the high and mighty princess, who she believes has only been lucky to be born into royalty. However, her smugness was short-lived as the eldest princess arrived. Ning Yuer knelt and honored her princess. But in her thought, she's plotting to sell the black refined iron armor to the princess for a high price. Princess Yuan Ying ordered them to rise and then instructed General Lai to begin the inspection of the new military equipment. As Lai Tang and Su Yun Lan entered the room, he couldn't help but boast about his dagger and shows off to General Lai and offered to test the armor's strength. He then pokes it with his dagger. To everyone's surprise, the armor was pierced with ease as well as Ning Yuer. Princess Yuan asks what's going on, and Lai Tang said that he has a dagger made by Su Yun Lan. Ning Yuer gritted her teeth and was unable to believe that the armor made of genuine black refined iron could be penetrated so easily. Su Yun Lan mocks her by revealing that even common farmers have black refined iron tools, and Ning Yuer's family should be ashamed to call themselves the number one weapons manufacturer. Ning Yuer fell to her knee unable to grasp and accused Su Yun Lan of spreading lies and slander, claiming that Ning's would never lie or cheat the crown. The princess interrupted Ning Yuer's and told her to compose herself in front of the court before instructing retainer Yu to investigate to Yun Lan's claim. Yuan Ying expressed confidence that the truth will be revealed soon. Lady Ning is then cautioned by Yuan Ying to be mindful of her words. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan, who is silently observing, is amused at the support of the princess showing. Suddenly, retainer Yu is returned and reports to princess that her fiancé, Su, isn't wronged, and concludes that the farmers are using tools made of black refined iron. Ning Yuer was left in disbelief. Retainer Yu immediately approached Princess Yu and Ying to take a closer look to confirm that the tools are indeed made of black refined iron. Princess Yu and Ying then throws the thing to Ning Yuer. Ning Yuer was in disbelief and wonders how this could be possible, suspecting that Su Yun Lan may have set her up. She then kneeled and bowed to the princess and admits her family's mistake in their inspections, showing remorse and accepting any punishment that the royal family deems. In her thought, she needs to focus on damage control and plans to make someone pay after it. But Su Yun Lan came in front of her and then mocks her for her downfall, calling her a stray mutt crawling on her last legs and commenting on her shallow beauty. Ning Yuer thinks of Su Yun Lan as a loser who now dares to act better than her and feels angry and resentful towards him. Ning Yuer watched as Su Yun Lan walks away, she felt powerless to oppose the princess, but the thought of losing to Su Yun Lan was unbearable. She just waiting for a perfect opportunity to stab him with poison. But Ning Yuer grits her teeth in frustration as to why Su Yun Lan walks back to her. Ning Yuer is caught off guard when Su Yun Lan stepped on her wrist, causing Ning Yuer to drop the poison shiv in her hand. Su Yun Lan smirked and looked at her hand, where he noticed the poison shiv, and accused Ning Yuer of plotting to stab the princess. Ning Yuer denies the accusation and claims that she only wants to kill Su Yun Lan. However, Su Yun Lan is convinced of her treachery for plotting to stab the royal fiancé which is him then orders the guards to arrest her and throw her in the royal prison for crimes against the princess's fiancé. Left furious, Ning Yuer continues to make threats and curse Su Yun Lan. She vows to one day to get her revenge. But he calls her crazy for making threats when her own life is in danger. Yu and Ying questions Su Yun Lan if it's connected to recent events about the yellow slurry he purchased. Su Yun Lan admits to using his metallurgy skills to extract black refined iron from the slurry, which he used to strengthen a dagger with tungsten and a little stronger than ordinary black iron. 
So Yuan Ying was amazed and knew that he was not someone to be underestimated. Su Yunlan then surprised Yuan Ying by presenting her with a gift. Since the princess is not overly fond of cosmetic products, Yuan Ying stammered out of surprise. Su Yunlan presents the golden regalia that he made with a material more precious than black refined iron. He presents it as his bride price and hopes that she will accept it. Yuan Ying was shocked at the notion of a bride price. He then humbly asks for a favor as Yuan Ying allows him to speak. Su Yunlan requests that when the northwestern drought ends and the rebuilding process begins, he wanted the princess to ask her father to grant pardons to all convicts who aid in the reconstruction efforts. Yuan Ying agrees to the request, acknowledging that the reconstruction will need manpower. On to the royal prison where Ning Yuer is locked up. Her grandfather visited her and she asks for help, but his grandfather refuses as she has committed crimes related to the royal family. However, the only option his grandfather has is to give her to the emperor's younger brother, Kayan, who is known for his inappropriate behavior and she has to become his 38th concubine as a way to avoid punishment. Later, during licking Kayan's toe, Ning Yura thinks about her current situation and feels bitter about how she a prodigy has been forced to marry someone like Kayan. She then thought of seeking revenge against Su Yun Lam. In the middle of that, Kayan felt satisfied and rewarded Ning Yuer with a pat then asks her to bark like a dog, to which Ning Yuer responds by barking. Meanwhile, at the princess estate where Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying's wedding is being celebrated, Princess Ying thanks everyone who has come to celebrate their wedding. Several people offer their congratulations including the second prince, the seventh prince, head chef Peng, and Prince Kayan's mistress Ning Yuer. At this moment, Su Yun Lan wonders how Ning Yuer was released from prison and maybe sold herself to escape in the prison and consider her a joke. The whole time, Ning Yuer feels jealous of Su Yun Lan to be doing better while she's not. Afterward, a minister reads out the imperial decree which awards the princess 200 pounds of gold and a bolt of pure silk. And the majesty acknowledges Su Yun Lan's talent in resolving a drought and iron working talent, then grants him a mine on the city outskirts, 100 smithies, and appoints him as the royal armament purveyor. Su Yun Lan proudly accepts and honored the imperial decree. In contrast, Ning Yuer blames Su Yun Lan for stealing everything from her and sending her to waste away in prison. Ning Yuer also criticizes the princess for marrying a retainer and accuses Su Yun Lan of cowardice for leaving her and Ling Fen in the spirit realm. But Su Yun Lan brushes off Ning Yuer's accusations and is confident in his favor. Others chime in, labeling Su Yun Lan a low-ranking servant who dared to cancel his engagement with Madame Ning. Just as the people had said, Lai Tang asks Su Yun Lan what they should do about this rabble, then Su Yun Lan assures him that things will work out in their favor. Amidst the commotion, a royal representative urgently reports that a group of commoners has gathered outside the estate, demanding to see Su Yun Lan. Yet, Su Yun Lan is in awe of people asking by his name. Ning Yuer is pleased to see Su Yun Lan in trouble, but Yuan Ying tries to settle the situation. However, the crowd becomes increasingly unruly, demanding to see Su Yun Lan, the royal fiancé. On the princess's estate, a large group of people had gathered, demanding to see the royal fiancé. Ning Yuer, observing the commotion, sarcastically suggested that Su Yun Lan must have done something wrong to cause such a stir. However, Su Yun Lan appeared confused about why the crowd had come to the estate. To his surprise, the group confirmed that he was the royal fiancé they had been searching for, and they thanked him for upgrading their farming tools, praising him as a god amongst them. Ning Yuer and the others were surprised that the people were not there to complain, so Lai Tang cheered for Su Yun Lan. Suddenly, the crowd presented Su Yun Lan with a giant elephant penis, claiming that they had caught it as a gift to help him beef up his manhood. Yuan Ying noticed the farmer's comments about enhancing Su Yun Lan's masculinity, causing him to briefly feel scared. The crowd also showed gratitude to Su Yun Lan for getting rid of Ning Yuer, whom they accused of overcharging them for farming tools. So Ning Yuer responded to the crowd's insults with anger, while Su Yun Lan ironically remarked on her exposed attempt at crying. At that moment, Ning Yuer's aggression escalated when she unsheathed her sword to attack Su Yun Lan, shouting to slaughter him like a hog. However, Su Yun Lan immediately crossed his bare hand to block the sword, and Yuan Ying was able to save him from harm. Su Yun Lan showed signs of relief by showing an affectionate response to Yuan Ying. Ning Yuer, on the other hand, criticized Su Yun Lan for hiding behind a woman. But Yuan Ying was furious with Ning Yuer for causing such a scene on her wedding day and dared her to act with such impudence. She then cut Ning Yuer's face, telling her that her death sentence may be revoked but she would suffer for the rest of her life, punishing her by taking away what she had polished for years. Ning Yuer felt incredible pain as her face was cut. The crowds were shocked by Yuan Ying's strength and talent, as the strongest of her generation. Even a decade of training couldn't save Ning Yuer, since her abilities had intimidated some and she could compete with and even outperform her elders. So Kayan, who had brought Ning Yuer to the wedding, felt humiliated and dragged her to his home. Su Yun Lan thought to himself that his score with the Nings was settled 
but there were still others who wronged him. Meanwhile, at the Demon Clan's sacred summit, the Demon Lord was congratulated on exiting seclusion. One of his demons informed him that Su Yunlan had disobeyed his arrangement to marry into the Ning family and was engaged to his adopted daughter, Princess Ying. In addition, rumors were spreading that Su Yunlan and Princess Ying were siblings committing incest. The Demon Lord ordered them to bring Su Yunlan to him. The night was deep when Kyan swept through the lavish halls of the brothel, admiring the beauty of the women. He was then approached by a woman who offered him a mask for his pleasure, and another woman who teased him to catch them. Kyan eagerly accepted the invitation and made his way to the room with the women, consumed by sexual desire. Upon removing his blindfold, he gasped and cursed upon seeing one of their faces. Later on, a royal police officer arrived on the scene after a gruesome murder. The victim was the crown's younger brother, Kyan. The officer urged everyone to stay alert and promised to find every piece of evidence. The examination of the body revealed bite marks and traces of a demonic sleeping potion. Based on the evidence, a demon committed the murder, possibly disguised as a concubine according to one police officer's speculation. They noted that the demon wasn't alive, as the estate guards weren't able to sense its life force. The police officer doubted that it could be the demon clan that entered the city yesterday. The head officer approved and instructed one of his police officers to write the piece of speculation, and prepared to submit their findings to the majesty. At the same moment, in the princess's estate, servant Yun informed Princess Yuanyi that her husband had been taken by his adoptive father, the demon king. Princess Yuanyi was shocked and requested to be prepared to see the demon king at once. On the other hand, Su Yunlan, who was apparently kidnapped, confronted his captors and questioned their audacity for attacking the princess's husband on her estate. He later recognized them as members of the demon clan and revealed himself as the clan's third son, asking why he was being treated that way. The demon people accused him of breaking off his engagement and told him he knew what he had done. Su Yunlan explained to them that it wasn't an engagement but a death sentence, as Ning Yuer had tried to kill him, and he just acted in self-defense. But they dismissed his explanation and informed him of a more significant offense they were there to address. Then they showed him a letter from the palace, revealing the emperor's brother is dead. Su Yunlan was shocked and realized that Ning Yuer's husband was eaten by a demon. He thought to himself that this was a big deal but didn't understand what it had to do with him. The demon lord appeared, revealing that the matter was related to him. He told Su Yunlan that he was the last remaining member of the Su clan and a descendant of the shamanic Nine Circles clan, and the victim was also his enemy. The demon lord, who was Su Yunlan's father, accused him of daring to claim that it had nothing to do with him. But Su Yunlan stammered as he called out to his father. On the princess's estate, Su Yunlan greeted his father who seemed angry and resentful towards him, which made him nervous. As they spoke, Ning Yura's grandfather suddenly appeared, reminding Su Yunlan that he signed his death warrant when he broke off his engagement with Ning Yura. So Su Yunlan sighed and asked if he was Ning Yura's grandfather. He thought that Ning's family was disgraced and ruined, still making trouble and determined to take revenge against the whole clan. Moreover, the grandfather accused Su Yunlan's clan of using demonic possession to commit an attack, which made Su Yunlan unsure if he was bluffing or not. Suddenly, Meng Qi, the right hand of the demon clan, spoke up, suggesting that the case was not yet resolved and there were loose ends. Su Yunlan believed that his uncle Meng Qi, whom his father trusted, was supportive and might take a favorable turn. However, Yuan Ying appeared and claimed she could prove Su Yunlan's innocence, stating that he was with her all night and had no chance to commit the murder. The demons agreed with Yuan Ying, while the demon lord appeared uninterested and thought he had evidence. Yura's grandfather, however, was not willing to let him go easily. So Su Yunlan said to Yura's grandfather that he was a bit pushy and mocked him to be a crook from a disgraced family with a personal vendetta against him. This angered Yura's grandfather, and he gestured that he would not hesitate to attack Su Yunlan. The demon lord intervened, stating that he was not present for the argument or the explanations. Whether Su Yunlan was a criminal or a murderer did not concern him. He declared that if he decides to kill Su Yunlan, it would be solely his decision. As the princess's consort, Su Yunlan pleaded with the demon lord to spare him and called him an old man, then promised to bring the real murderer in seven days. The demons were quite surprised by Su Yunlan's audacity and called him a reckless whelp. In the middle of that, the demon lord reminisced about the past when he was referred to as an old man. He remembered spending time with Su Yun Lan when he was a child. Young Su Yun Lan had told his dad that spending the whole afternoon fishing was just lame and even added that going to see some courtesan was a better option instead. So the demon lord scolded Su Yun Lan for suggesting visiting a courtesan and lectured him on the importance of fishing for meditation and self-cultivation. Su Yun Lan, immaturely, called him a hooligan and continued to disrespect him by calling him an old man. 
The demon lord requested to be addressed as dad, but Su Yun Lan persisted in calling him a little old man and laughed mischievously. Back to the present, the demon lord had made an agreement with Su Yun Lan to wait for seven days to find the real murderer. The demon lord promised to take the murderer's life as compensation, which Su Yun Lan accepted. To ensure Su Yun Lan's safety during this time, the demon lord instructed He Yan, the grand supervisor of the demon clan, to protect him. He Yan agreed and promised not to fail the demon lord. Su Yun Lan believed that He Yan was his childhood friend from a past life, making it easier to work with someone familiar. In the palace, where Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan were having a conversation, they confirmed that he was the last descendant of the Nine Circles clan. Su Yun Lan explained that his ancestry had made him a target for the Nings. Yuan Ying expressed concern about uncovering the murderer in seven days and asked for a plan. Su Yun Lan reassured Yuan Ying that he planned to take matters into his own hands to eliminate his enemies and the root of the problem. He believed that revenge could not wait and he must act swiftly. At the capital outskirts Demon Cliffs, He Yan and Su Yun Lan were hiding from the zombie demons. He Yan asked Su Yun Lan about his plan, and Su Yun Lan told him to hide while he handled the situation. He Yan was surprised when Su Yun Lan grabbed his butt and told him not to be weird. So Su Yun Lan apologized, saying that his hand had slipped but his thoughts revealed that He Yan was his cherished companion from a past life. While standing on the cliff, as the leaves fell in the wind, Su Yun Lan took charge and began his investigation from within. He then used the Nine Circles ultimate technique to possess a zombie demon in the capital outskirts. Having successfully possessed the zombie demon, Su Yun Lan interrogated them to uncover any manipulation over the past month. The scene shifted to official Mao's residence. The sound of wind and dry leaves swept across the mountains, setting the scene for the events that were about to unfold. Su Yun Lan had been possessed by zombie demons, and he was expressing frustration because no one remembered the murder that had occurred. He began to question whether a demon was even responsible, despite accusations from the Nings. As they made their way back to the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan apologized for overusing his possession technique and feeling loopy, so He Yan suggested taking him to see the princess. On the way, they encountered Yuan Ying, whom Su Yun Lan greeted warmly, pleased to see her waiting for him. However, Yuan Ying gave him an annoyed look because she was distracted by Su Yun Lan and He Yan's affectionate behavior. So she clarified that it was just a morning walk and left them both. Su Yun Lan grew concerned by her reaction and tried to stop the princess, asking her if she was jealous. This caused Yuan Ying to deny it grumpily and accuse him of being jealous. Su Yun Lan showed a poker face but still proceeded to explain that he and He Yan were not in a romantic relationship and joked about saying no homo. He then pointed out the male restroom where He Yan was and said that he might look like a quiet maiden but he carried a big stick. Yuan Ying was surprised, but Su Yun Lan assured her that she was the only woman in his heart. So Yuan Ying blushed as she understood. Yuan Ying nearly forgot to tell Su Yun Lan something important, piquing his curiosity. Meanwhile, rumors were spreading at the inn that another relative of the crown had been found dead, and the perpetrator was a member of the Nine Circle Clan. There were also rumors that the princess was the mastermind behind the killings and was making her husband Su Yun Lan do the dirty work. Yuan Ying, on the other hand, informed Su Yun Lan that another uncle of hers was killed by a demon while he was out investigating, and rumors were rampant throughout the city. Su Yun Lan expressed frustration with the commoners gossiping all day. Yuan Ying assured him that there was no use getting angry at them and that she believed in Su Yun Lan's innocence. She offered to lend her personal army to Su Yun Lan to help with the investigation. So Su Yun Lan showed relief, thanking her for her love, and declared that it was up to the two of them to root out the villain behind the scenes. In the princess's estate, he Yan confirmed front Su Yun Lan about why he went to town to buy breakfast and handed out tools to the farmers. He scolded Su Yun Lan for taking the princess's personal army with him, thinking that it was a waste of time. However, Su Yun Lan brushes it off by offering He Yan some drunken pavilion drumsticks, which He Yan loves and thanks him for. He Yan is surprised when Su Yun Lan knows he loves the drumsticks and gives him a seductive look. But Su Yun Lan jokes by showing his middle finger and telling him not to do that. Ian laughs and remarks that Su Yun Lan's reaction is just like her old best friend's. So Su Yun Lan thinks to himself that he is He Yan's old best friend, even though he is in a different body now. Su Yun Lan tells He Yan that they need to go to an Legong's estate in two days, but He Yan asks why, as Su Yun Lan's investigation deadline will be up by then. But Su Yun Lan assures him that he will understand once they get there. Two days later, they arrive at Enlegong's estate, where Enlegong, the emperor's younger cousin, greets them. Su Yun Lan respectfully tells him that they have good news. However, Enlegong diverts his attention to He Yan's beauty and makes a lewd remark, which angers He Yan. But Su Yun Lan explains that he is 100% man. 
So Im Legong invites them inside but is surprised by the sudden arrival of strangers who jump over his fence, causing him to tremble. Su Yun Lan calmly faces the corpses, as he had expected their arrival, and sarcastically introduces them to An Legong as their company for the night. So An Legong rushes out to the area. He Yen asks Su Yun Lan how he knew that they would attack An Legong's place tonight. Su Yun Lan reveals that two days ago, he had the princess's personal army working with farmers to gather intel, which showed some unusual movement at An Legong's estate. They also discovered that Grandpa Ning had visited the estate, and he just pretended to be out buying breakfast to make a connection with An Legong and secure an invitation to his estate. Su Yunlan says that they are there today, and everything has played out as he expected. Ning Grandpa suddenly appears, and Su Yunlan announces that they have come to catch the mastermind. Ning Grandpa praises Su Yunlan for having good calculations, instantly ordering his puppet corpse to attack Su Yunlan and He Yan. So Su Yunlan tells He Yan to take care of his body, then collapses onto He Yan's shoulder in a fast paced situation. As the puppet corpses attack both He Yan and Su Yunlan's bodies, demons suddenly appear and fight them off, leaving He Yan surprised. When Su Yun Lan reveals that he had the troops pretend to be farmers and sneak demons into the city, Ning Grandpa gets fearful and grits his teeth. Su Yun Lan then shows his demon general form and smirks. Grandpa Ning shivers and grits his teeth in fear when Su Yun Lan is behind his back in demon form. He explains that he had the troops pretend to be farmers to sneak some demons into the city and hide them at An Legong's estate, just waiting to catch him today. Su Yun Lan smirks. He then appeared in front of Grandpa Ning in the form of a demon general, causing him to feel terrified of Su Yun Lan's presence. Grandpa Ning remarked that Su Yun Lan could really possess demons. In response to this, Grandpa Ning challenged Su Yun Lan, asking if his demons were a match for his puppets. But Su Yun Lan simply smirked and confidently accepted the challenge, daring Grandpa Ning to bring it on. After the challenge was accepted, Grandpa Ning diverted the attack toward He Yan and Su Yun Lan. In response, Su Yun Lan released his reserve demon troops from near his body. He then revealed to Grandpa Ning that he had reserve troops and called him out for underestimating him. So Grandpa Ning revealed an ace up his sleeve and ordered the puppet army to ignite themselves in the second ignition phase, causing them to self-explode and dive toward their targets. EM was surprised by the explosion and the puppet's attack. He felt the heat from the puppet as it almost punched him. However, Su Yun Lan stopped it, warning them to pick on someone closer to their size and know their place. The puppet growled, but Su Yun Lan kicked its chin, remarking that the bigger the bark, the weaker the bite. Su Yun Lan added that they were all just flesh and no soul. Despite his warning, the puppet still set itself on fire and rushed towards Su Yun Lan for a punch. However, Su Yun Lan easily sidestepped and countered the puppet's attack, saying it was his turn. He smacks the puppet's face and it crashes to the floor. Now, he forms his fist with fire and delivers a powerful punch to the puppet's face. However, he is also exhausted. He mutters to himself that he may have overestimated the puppet, that it was all bluff and bluster. Looking at his hand, now covered in blood, he wonders why it is bleeding. Just then, he notices Grandpa Ning's quick escape and commends him for his swift move. Meanwhile, Grandpa Ning assures himself that the ultimate technique requires a lot of stamina, and Su Yun Lan shouldn't be able to catch him. As Grandpa Ning flees, a woman puppet begs him not to leave her behind and pleads for an antidote. Suddenly, all the puppets explode, filling the air with the sound of their dying growls. Su Yun Lan cannot believe that they are capable of blowing themselves up. Right after, he feels something splitting apart from his head. It was the energy he used during the clash, and he disengages from the demon general form. Still in an Legong estate, He Yan wakes up Su Yun Lan, so he asks how long he was out. He Yan responds that it was probably a quarter of an hour. Su Yun Lan asks He Yan about the corpses, and He Yan explains that he thinks they were drug driven by an apathy drug that affects all types of unique corpse related cultivation. So Su Yun Lan is disgusted by the technique of turning living people into puppets. They find a tassel on the floor from the Ning family, whose clanmates were turned into puppets by old man Yuanju. Su Yun Lan orders He Yan to preserve the living dead and take them to the demon clan, which he does. The morning comes, and Su Yun Lan seems rather pleased with himself and boasts about his heroic act yesterday. However, it seems that his boastful attitude does not impress Yuan Ying, and she simply huffs with crossed arms. Su Yun Lan wants Yuan Ying to believe him and asks He Yan to confirm his story, but he Yan is unimpressed and hands him a letter to read. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan's expression changes dramatically upon reading the letter, which reveals the news of Ning Yuanju dying from an illness. In the Demon Clan main hall, Su Yun Lan reports to the Demon Lord. The Demon Lord asks if the mystery of demons attacking the royal family has been resolved, stating that his time is up. Su Yun Lan shows his smile and confidently announces that the so-called demons in the capital were actually living dead puppets created through apothecarial means and controlled by a talisman. He reveals that only the Yun Gui sect has the ability to make such puppets and Meng Qi suggests 
that the Nings of the Yungui sect are the likely culprits. The demon lord responded that the body of the Ning family patriarch was found the previous day, prompting Meng Qi to ask the demon lord if he suspects someone may be using the Nings. The demon lord appears convinced and not hesitant about his suspicion. He tells Su Yunlan that the violent demonic activity in the border districts is connected to what transpired in the main hall and assigns Su Yun Lan the responsibility of investigating these violent border demons. Given his demon possession technique, a successful hunt for the real murderer would be possible. Su Yun Lan stumbled over his words to accept the task. Later at the princess's estate, Su Yun Lan is distressed and worried about the investigation, likely due to his recent marriage. Su Yun Lan sarcastically thinks that he doesn't want to be pressured if they want to have a grandchild anytime soon. Suddenly, Lai Tang appears and asks Su Yun Lan if the case has been solved but got distracted by He Yan's appearance and has inappropriate thoughts about him. Lai Tang makes a vulgar comment about He Yan's appearance and lastly, his chest and boasts about his own status and power. He Yan with an unimpressed look notices Lai Tang's behavior and expresses concern, while Su Yun Lan tells that Lai Tang may be unmedicated. Later, inside the estate, where a maidservant poured tea, Yuan Ying is concerned about what their father said to him. Su Yun Lan reassures her that things are almost wrapped up but reveals that their father is sending him to investigate demonic activity at the border, which makes Yuan Ying worried. She raises her voice as she shows concern to Su Yun Lan and tells him that he doesn't have war experience and it's a suicide mission, which Su Yun Lan heartens her to not worries that he and He Yan were together. Then Lai Tang interrupts him by questioning his decision and expressing concern for his family, which made Su Yun Lan frustrated to answer Lai Tang. Lai Tang asks permission from her sister to go with them. He believes that with his help, no one will be able to lay a finger on them. Yuan Ying declines him permission. However, Lai Tang runs after her and begs his sister by telling her that it's his future on the line. As Yuan Ying realizes that she underestimated his brother and sees an opportunity for him in preparation for the throne and thinks that he's growing up. She then agrees to let him go but advises him to stay open-minded, be cautious, and avoid recklessness, which makes Lai Tang happy. After being given permission, Lai Tang becomes excited and rushes over to He Yan, promising to keep him safe, causing He Yan to give him a weird look. Yuan Ying instructed Su Yun Lan to keep a close watch on Lai Tang and prevent him from acting foolishly, to which Su Yun Lan agree. Additionally, Yuan Ying gave something to Su Yun Lan and offered her personal army to accompany them and ensure their safety since she couldn't join them. As he expressed his gratitude to her, Yuan Ying also reminded him to return home safely. Su Yun Lan shows his affection by kissing her. As Yuan Ying was startled, her mind raced and affectionately mentions his name. Later, at a street side where a group of people notices Su Yun Lan's carriage passing by. They express their admiration for the prince, with some even making inappropriate comments about the princess. He Yan with a smirk, comments on Su Yun Lan's popularity, which Su Yun Lan disagrees with. Amidst the disturbance caused by Lai Tang while asking He Yan to open his mouth, He Yan responds with frustration, cursing Lai Tang. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan became serious, recalling how he was treated when he was suspected of a crime, feeling that the people want him to die but now the people were treating him in favor since he was back. However, he realizes that the people only cared about the promise of fortune and power he represents. He Yan then changed the topic, asking Su Yun Lan about suddenly sending him to the border while Lai Tang distract him. Su Yun Lan expresses his belief that the royal majesty sees him as a tool. He then shares where he accepts the royal majesty's order in the royal court, trying to be humble in his request for rewards. He thought that the more humble he sound, the gung-ho he was going to be rewarded. However, the royal majesty agrees with a fakery smiled at Su Yun Lan and mentioned that they are family after all. Su Yun Lan thought that conveys his frustration as he does not receive a significant reward from the royal majesty despite his show of humility. He puts on a facade of humor by laughing and calling the royal majesty family in a sarcastic tone. The royal majesty assigned a task, sarcastically told him as his favorite son-in-law and threatens severe consequences if he fails. Su Yun Lan feels annoyed with the royal majesty for putting so much pressure on him. He believes that nothing in life comes for free and everything has a cost. The royal majesty reveals investigation into falsified sales accounts of Ning's warehouse involved the sale of black refined iron to the western border, catching Su Yun Lan off guard. His stuttered response revealed concern about the area, which has seen years of unrest and chaos. He also expresses anxiety about the potential consequences of a large shipment of black refined iron, which could start a rebellion. The royal majesty expressed concern and stressed the need for capable aides to investigate. 
Su Yun Lan was chosen and then accepted the task. Yi Yan awkwardly smiles and praises the level of trust the father-in-law has in him. Su Yun Lan asks why his idiot brother Kui joined them. Yi Yan demands to be respectful towards Kui, as he informs Su Yun Lan that whoever solves the border chaos will be named the head of the Black Cavalry. Su Yun Lan comments on the high stakes. Yi Yan reveals that he will be the judge for this competition. Su Yun Lan makes a playful comment to get on Yi Yan's good side. However, Lai Tang distracts them as he tries to make a manly expression, but Yi Yan stops him by hitting him. Su Yun Lan tries to calm them both but decides not to continue. Qi interrupts by opening the cart curtain, surprising Su Yun Lan, as Qi vows to prove himself at the border, and insults Su Yun Lan by calling him a loser who married a princess by luck and is a waste of space. Su Yun Lan mocks Qi, calling him a simpleton, and questions how he became an heir to the demon clan. Qi takes offense and retaliates by calling Su Yun Lan a bastard. Su Yun Lan ordered a royal guard to remove Qi, and the royal guards intervene by holding a spear to Qi's neck and ordering him to step back. Qi insults the royal guard in fear and yells that Su Yun Lan is nothing without his wife from a distance. He Yan explains that Qi was adopted by the demon lord after his father passed away and that their clan's lord was friends with Qi's late father. Su Yun Lan acknowledges this information. However, in his mind, he decides that he will spare Qi's life for now due to their family relationship. But if Qi continues to anger him, he won't make things easy for him. Later, in the burning heat, the area of Mount Stratus is also known as the Black Cloud Mountain, where all of them arrived. Su Yun Lan expresses relief at finally arriving. Lai Tang, on the other hand, warns He Yan to be careful not to lose his footing and offers him a drink, reminding him of the dehydrating effects of the desert in a romantic way. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan and others have scandalous thoughts about He Yan and Lai Tang. He Yan catches them and tells them to get their mind out of the gutter. Suddenly, a man appears and introduces his name as Minister Liu Mang approaches them and greets Su Yun Lan, apologizing for being late. Su Yun Lan recognizes Liu Mang as the person His Majesty asked him to keep an eye on. Although Liu Mang doesn't seem like someone who would cause trouble, Su Yun Lan decides to observe him further. At that moment, Qi arrives and is greeted by his people who offer him red wine and a place to stay. Minister Liu Mang invites Su Yun Lan to continue inside as well, while Su Yun Lan observes the situation with a thoughtful expression. Later, at the banquet in Mount Stratus where Su Yun Lan is attending with Minister Liu Mang and Qi, Minister Liu Mang explained that resources were scarce, to which Su Yun Lan was disgusted with the mediocre food they were served compared to the lavish feast enjoyed by others. Believing that Minister Liu Mang was a rebel, Su Yun Lan planned to report him to the authorities. Minister Liu Mang asked about her retainers. Su Yun Lan claimed they were on a date when in reality they were secretly investigating. Meanwhile, a servant informed Qi that his companions were outside, which makes Qi excited. Suddenly, a strange guy bursts into the banquet and accuses Su Yun Lan of being on an unstoppable murdering spree in the capital, causing Su Yun Lan to question himself. The stranger challenges Su Yun Lan to a fight, claiming to be the number one warrior in the West. In the main hall, the warrior said sarcastically to Su Yun Lan's receiving gracious invitation. Qi believes that his evil intent is a success, as the warrior came prepared, and the first day is like a Hongman feast, a banquet organized with the intention of murdering a guest. As Su Yun Lan tries to find a reason to refuse and leave, but before he can, the warrior thanks him for his blessings and strikes him with his fist. Su Yun Lan is stunned out of shock, fearing that he may not have the strength to withstand the impact. As the warrior attempts to strike, a man then suddenly intervenes and tightens his grip on the warrior's hand, whom Su Yun Lan does not recognize. The warrior identifies the man as Liu Xu and demands to be released. Liu Xu throws the warrior against the wall and scolds him for acting against him in public, causing the warrior to cough up blood. Liu Xu instructed the warrior to leave and reflect on his actions. In an awkward situation, Su Yun Lan thanks Liu Xu and admires his capability as the lord of the city. Su Yun Lan takes the opportunity to excuse himself, claiming that he has lost interest in the event and needs to rest. He believes to himself that a true man would not stand beside a collapsing wall and that he needs to get away. Minister Liu Mang congratulates Su Yun Lan, while Qi Yi expresses her disdain for the warrior. Later that night in their rooms, He Yan asks Su Yun Lan if he's okay and suggests he stays by his side next time, as he was unable to win against an old man. Su Yun Lan asks He Yan to trust him. Lai Tang, in the distance, is sad as He Yan is caring for his brother-in-law. 
Su Yunlan became annoyed and shifted the conversation to business, asking about the progress of the investigation. Lai Tang instantly responds to reports of slow investigation progress and notes limited power in their position. The city owner can only send a small number of guards daily to work on land outside the city. Su Yun Lan indicates that the city has been emptied. Additionally, there have been demonic riots and rumors of bandits outside the city. Su Yun Lan murmured bandits in response. He Yen mentioned a strange group of bandits who appeared in the desert, and Su Yun Lan showed curiosity about hidden secrets in the city. During the conversation, He Yan is startled by a figure outside the room and feels a sense of suspense and fear. However, upon recognizing the figure as the demon general, he realizes there is no immediate danger. Lai Tang jumps into action and tries to protect He Yan from demon general, but He Yan grabs his shirt and reassures him that the demon general is not a threat and his brother-in-law is controlling it. Lai Tang admires his brother-in-law and wonders about He Yan's strength for being a girl unrefined. Later, Su Yun Lan, in a form of a demon general, steps outside the city to see the landscape that hides the dirt in Mount Stratus. On a solitary smoke in the desert, Su Yun Lan watched the breathtaking sunset over the long river in the western regions. But his moment was interrupted by a sudden scream of a lady. He flies swiftly towards the source of the scream. When he arrived in the area, he was greeted by the sight of thousands of abnormal monster movements that his father told him about. He thinks that it could flatten out Mount Stratus. However, all the demons in his demon general form are trembling, and his muscles are tightened in fear. It was then that he caught a glimpse of a strange silhouette forming on the cliff, wielding a deadly scythe. The figure jumps from the cliff and revealed herself to be a woman with a fierce expression on her face. The monster's movements were stopped in their tracks and Su Yun Lan could sense the danger. The strange woman attacked the abnormal demons with lightning speed she wielded her scythe. Su Yun Lan watched in awe as she is powerful causing the demon to wail and flee in terror. The strange woman then asks the ladies if someone is injured, to which they respond with gratitude and relief. While Su Yun Lan hides in the big rock, questioning why he needs to be in the place if the strange woman is already there to solve the disaster. Suddenly, the woman senses Su Yun Lan's presence and swings her scythe, causing rocks to scatter. She thought it was a rat and walks away. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan emerged from the sand. The impact of the hit injured him even in a distance, and expresses fear and frustration when he almost died. Su Yun Lan compares the murderous aura of the strange woman, realizing it to be scarier than his father. Later, as Su Yun Lan rushed to Mount Stratus by leaping from roof to roof, mentioning that he had a sleepless night, he suddenly heard a woman's voice. While passing by Xu and Kiwi's house, he thinks it's a strange sound he heard there, so he stops by a tree, and saw their silhouette engaging in an intimate activity that makes him feel excited. Xu and Kiwi asks the woman if he is mighty and decides to go another 300 rounds, but shortly after, he fell asleep and the woman commented that it is too fast, which makes Su Yun Lan burst out laughing, and he thought that the woman's voice he heard earlier was different from the one he is hearing now. He thinks that there might be a ghost there. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan feeling dizzy from the possession technique, he then quickly possessed a passing pigeon. Although unable to control it, he was surprised when it delivered a message to Xu and Kiwi's house, revealing that he had possessed Kiwi's pigeon. Curious about Kiwi's plans, Su Yun Lan overheard him instructing Lao Ju to make arrangements for the caravan on the east side of the desert, excited about the potential income it could bring for him to indulge in his pleasures with women. Lao Ju agreed to the plan. Su Yun Lan is surprised that he is talking about women again. Meanwhile, in the desert the next day, Su Yun Lan pretends to be a coachman in a carriage. Su Yun Lan hopes for news about the disguised carriage but receives none. The people around him seem unaware of any information regarding it. However, he finds it strange that he is familiar with the place and question that it is not in the east direction. Suddenly, all the people around him burst into laughter, and Lao Ju smirked and accuses him of being a Tang country consort turned coachman, demanding an explanation. Su Yun Lan glared at him and thought that he's been exposed and unable to use his demonic possession technique. He tries to brush it off, but Lao Ju mocks his attitude and orders his men to attack. However, the people stop as they feel a strange fear and tension, sensing the intense aura behind them. Su Yun Lan feels the murderous intent and recognizes it. Suddenly, the strange woman kills Lao Ju and his people with just one single strike before they can even react except Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan was stunned by the instant strikes and blood flowing over him and he realizes that it was the woman who killed the monster-like dog that day. The strange woman then approaches Su Yun Lan and demands to know who he is by putting his scythe on his neck. 
At the same time, in the hall of a demon messenger, where a bearer reports the news from He Yan that Lord Su Yun Lan has been missing for 10 days. The demon lord crushes a flute in his hand upon hearing the news and remembers Su Yun Lan as a child who was happily playing it. He expresses his bitterness and calls for the bearer. Meanwhile, the desert wind picked up abruptly and the stench of blood in the air, as he realizes that a scythe is just 0.01 centimeters away from his throat and the woman wielding the weapon in front of him is both beautiful and terrifying. Su Yun Lan then screams in terror when the woman is about to attack him. He pleads for mercy, mentioning that he has been a virgin for three lifetimes and has not had the chance to get laid yet. He also apologizes to her father for not producing an heir to continue the family bloodline. To Su Yun Lan's surprise, he realizes that he is still alive, and the strange woman speaks to him, recognizing that he is a member of the Tang royal family. Su Yun Lan's thoughts turn to survival mode, and he thinks of a way to save himself. He decides to kneel before the woman, showing his sincerity and willingness to live. Su Yun Lan then hugs the legs of the woman and calls her a superior, goddess, and mother. He even cried offering to do anything to spare his life, and offers her wife's influence and wealth as a reward. However, the woman got pissed and smacks Su Yun Lan using her foot, telling him to get his filthy hands off her, and seems to have other plans in her mind. She grants Su Yun Lan's wish to do anything, but he screams again after that. Three days later Su Yun Lan shouts out for help, saying he is about to starve to death, showing his disbelief by complaining that his treatment is worse than a dog's and wonders if anyone there is human. He was exhausted after struggling, yet no one replied to him. He acknowledges the woman's strength but doesn't know where he was and is unable to use his demonic possession and has no means to report back either. He worries about survival, wishing for his previous body's capabilities, and hoping not to be the first virgin male led starving to death. Suddenly, he smells something fragrant and sees a child holding a chicken drumstick in front of him. Su Yun Lan assures the child that he is not a bad guy and makes a funny face. He then takes the chicken drumstick from the child and tells him he has a bright future. While eating, Su Yun Lan tells the child that he likes him and to say his name, Lai Tang if he ever needs help in the future. Su Yun Lan then hears the curtain lift and a woman calls out to Xiao Ying which is the child's name. She tells Xiao Ying to hurry because her sister Yu is coming back soon. The woman brings Su Yun Lan food and warns him not to let you find out, which Su Yun Lan on the other hand accepts and calls her Miss F in return before introducing himself as Su Yun Lan. The woman was confused as to why he called her F and then introduces herself as Baor Jai. Su Yun Lan was awkwardly shocked when Xiao Ying asked why he had told Baor Jai that his name was Su Yun Lan when he had introduced himself as Lai Tang. Baor Jai and Xiao Ying hurried out of the tent as her sister was backed and would see if she brought back any medicine that can help treat Xiao Ying's strange illness. The child looked behind and said goodbye to Su Yun Lan, who asked him to bring a chicken drumstick the next time he visited. Su Yun Lan wonders about the strange illness and feels a familiar aura that Xiao Ying has the aura of a demon, and believes that Xiao Ying may have demon blood flowing through him. He got intrigued and prepares the plan to escape. As Su Yun Lan thinks of his plan, a sudden appearance of the strange woman behind him demands that he come out. Su Yun Lan asks her what she was planning to do. Su Yun Lan asks what is going on and why he needs to use them. As Su Yun Lan wears handcuffs around his arms and neck, he humorously asks her if he needs to call her a mistress, which made the woman forcefully pull him in anger. Su Yun Lan complains that he is being treated like a dog and that they have rights too. The woman asks if he has a complaint and points a scythe at his neck causing Su Yun Lan to quickly obey her and denies having a complaint. As they are going out into the tent, he notices that everyone there is a woman who looks at him with hostility and terrifying gazes. Also, he noticed the scars and condition of their injuries and concludes that it has a problem there. Suddenly, they stop, and the woman brings him to a pile of medicinal herbs, and Su Yun Lan realizes that he doesn't recognize any of them. The woman kicks him into the pile of medicinal herbs which made him unexpectedly curse and tasted the herb which he said is bitter. She suddenly strikes a scythe to his neck and demands that he tell her about the uses and effects of the herbs, or else she'll kill him. Su Yun Lan couldn't recognize any of the plants, but he remembered the heavenly scroll he had. He quickly looked up the herb's uses and found it in an instant. Later in the evening, Su Yun Lan tells the woman if he wasn't mistaken that the uses of the medicinal herb are to expel demons and he concluded that the child is indeed a demon. The woman shows a furious expression as she points the scythe to Su Yun Lan's neck and demands to know if he knows what's going on with her younger brother. Su Yun Lan asked if her brother had become bloodthirsty and tells her that it could be cured. He also stated that killing him might leave no one else to cure his brother. 
The woman realizes and puts the scythe away and asks how he will treat his brother. Su Yun Lan guesses that the brother's illness has something to do with anemia and offers to observe him closely and find more herbs to cure him. The woman gets his answer and instantly drags him away to the tent, causing Su Yun Lan to feel helpless and desperate. Inside that tent, the woman throws Su Yun Lan onto the bed. Su Yun Lan was taken aback when he asked the woman what she planned to do when he turned around. He finds her undressing causing him to get flustered. Feeling overwhelmed, he asserted himself by declaring that he was the most responsible man in his family and would not let his wife down, even if it meant dying. As the woman suddenly walks towards him and slammed up against the bed, she asked him if he wanted to sleep and commanded him not to try to escape, leaving Su Yun Lan feeling trapped and frustrated at the same time. The woman commands Su Yun Lan to sleep, but he resists and cries out in protest. The next morning, Su Yun Lan is seen awake and feels anxious as his body well tied to the chain. He was caught off guard by the woman who suddenly leaning on him. His subsequent thoughts about how close and fragrant the woman is, along with her attractive figure. But suddenly the woman caught Su Yun Lan looking at her and instantly strangled him with the iron chain, warning him not to look at her. He apologized and denied seeing anything as he felt embarrassed. However, the woman orders him to get up, which he complies with while looking at her legs, which angers her and leads her to punch him again and he denies his action once more. A moment later, Su Yun Lan complains of being in pain from being strangled by an iron chain all night. The woman threatens to harm him if he tries anything again, but Su Yun Lan responds with a promise to cure Xiao Ying and if he fails, the woman can harm him. In the village, where Su Yun Lan is picking herbs, Xiao Ying is looking at him. Xiao Ying asks Su Yun Lan if he can cure his illness and Su Yun Lan confident responds that he can't. On the other hand, he looks at his surrounding and most of the women find him scary and disgusted. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan thought about how the child has demon blood in his body and how the Nine Nether Soul technique is ineffective against him. He also thinks about why the woman in the village except Bayar seems more disgusted and fearful towards him than a demon. When Bayar suddenly pops out and asks if the medicines really make Xiao Ying better, he responds with a flustered look, assuring her that he will cure Xiao Ying. Su Yun Lan was caught off guard when Bayar embraced him, causing him to feel uncomfortably awkward due to the pressure from her breasts. All of a sudden, they hear a scream from the village and rush back so fast that upon their return, they find a demon attacking causing all the ladies in the village to feel tremble in fear. Su Yun Lan is surprised to see a demon, while the strange woman is preventing the demon from attacking anyone. He asks why she's defending instead of fighting back as she did before. Then Bayar responds that the demon is Xiao Ying. Su Yun Lan was shocked to discover that the demon was Xiao Ying. He was intrigued, having never heard of a child being able to transform into a demon. He tells Bayar to take the people to safety and leaves the task to him. He plans to use the Nine Nether Souls technique to handle the demon, despite Bayar's concerns for his safety. The strange woman was scratched by the demon's claws, causing her to drop her scythe and kneel in pain. Su Yun Lan tells her she doesn't have to hold on, so she asks him what he's doing. Su Yun Lan vows to protect Xiao Ying with determination, believing it is his responsibility as a man to protect others, rather than leave it to a woman. Su Yun Lan then uses his technique to counter Xiao Ying's incoming attack. He now enters Xiao Ying's conscious world to try to wake him up, but a demon was inside of it and grabs him from behind. So he curses as the demon devours his soul. In Xiao Ying's consciousness, Su Yun Lan began speaking about his soul being torn apart and trapped in hell. Su Yun Lan felt like he was being devoured and wondered if this was the end. As he was lost in his thoughts, he longed to hear his father's voice once more and fulfill his promise to the princess to stay with her for the rest of his life and caress her soft lips. The memories of the date with his friends at the Long Song restaurant brought tears to his eyes, and he felt unwilling and reluctant to let them go. Suddenly, a bright light filled the room, and he saw the scroll release, recognizing it as the God Book. He wondered if he had been saved by the Heavenly Book again. He realized it was showing him the periodic table and was confused because it was on an ancient scroll he had bought at an auction house. His confusion only intensified when he noticed that only the symbol for iron, Fi, was blue light, as if tempting him to touch it. As Su Yun Lan pressed the Fi, he was forcefully sucked into it, and his soul returned to his body, out of Xiao Ying's consciousness. As he opened his eyes, Su Yun Lan felt fascinated that heaven had not destroyed him. He was impressed by the toughness of the demon yet confused by the gray mist on its body. 
His attention was drawn to the dust that gradually magnified, revealing elemental iron that fascinated him. Meanwhile, Bayar approached Xiao Ying to wake him up but ended up striking her instead. Su Yunlan stopped him from attacking and took control of his body, causing Xiao Ying to growl as Su Yunlan forcefully extracted him from the demon form. They are caught Xiao Ying as he fell, bringing her relief as he recovered. Su Yunlan fainted from the ordeal, but the strange woman caught him and smiled at him, admitting that she had underestimated his abilities. The next day, all the women in the village were happy, and Su Yunlan was seen sleeping in a tent. When he woke up from his dream, he mentioned the name Xiao Ying and asked how he was doing. Yu, the strange woman, responded that Xiao Ying was fine. Su Yunlan nodded and mentioned that his body hurt. Yu told him not to move in an aggressive tone. Su Yunlan looked at the food and asked if the woman was trying to feed him porridge. She responded with a shy nod, and Su Yunlan asked her what she was waiting for. Yu then ate the porridge herself and tried to feed Su Yunlan with her mouth. This made him panic, and he avoided her, asking what she was doing. He crossed his arms and told her to stay back, questioning who taught her to feed porridge like that. Yu responded, saying that it was taught by Sister Bayar who said that Central Plains people are all fed this way when they get sick. Su Yun Lan wished that Bayar had taught her better. He told Yu that he didn't want to eat yet and wanted to take a bath first as his body was sour and smelly. Instantly, Yu carried Su Yun Lan, making him flustered and embarrassed at the same time. He told her to put him down and that it was a shame, but he secretly enjoyed the feeling of being carried. As he leaned on the woman's chest, he admitted that he really liked this kind of feeling. They arrived at Medicine Spring where Yu brought Su Yun Lan to help heal his wounds. Su Yun Lan asked her to let him down, but she carried him into the hot spring. He was shocked and got flustered when Yu's clothes got wet, making him look at her chest. Yu insisted on helping him take a bath and tried to undress him, which stunned him even more. Su Yun Lan's consciousness had conflicting opinions on the situation. The good one reminded him that he was a married man and shouldn't take advantage of Yu, while the evil consciousness was trying to influence him to accept Yu's help, resulting in his inner struggle. However, Su Yun Lan gently pushed Yu and decided to do it himself, and Yu demurely thanked him, which surprised him. Su Yun Lan was flustered by Yu's charming side and noticed an injury on her arm. He remembered that Yu allowed her berserk brother to attack her so that she wouldn't hurt Xiao Ying, which made him wonder about her past. All the ladies suddenly appeared in the hot mountain spring and recognized Su Yun Lan as the master who saved Xiao Ying. Su Yun Lan was flustered from seeing all the women in the hot spring and offering him to bathe and massage him, which made him feel embarrassed and a bit overwhelmed by the attention. Later, the ladies bathed and massaged him, which made him enjoy and thank heaven for the third lifetime. At Black Cloud City, he and questioned Su Yun Lan's whereabouts, who had been missing for 10 days. Lai Tang defended his brother-in-law, saying that he was powerful and should be fine. Huey, on the other hand, laughed hysterically at Su Yun Lan's disappearance and boasted about controlling his father's Black Rider Legion. Later, Su Yun Lan felt uncomfortable as the villagers gave him many fruits after saving Xiao Ying. Bayar told Su Yun Lan how Yu rescued them from kidnapping and brought them to the village. This made him question how there could be a village of only women in the desert. Su Yun Lan suspected that the reason the women in the village had sharp, suspicious eyes when he first met them was that they had been kidnapped. Bayar told him that many of their sisters were still in the hands of black men. Su Yun Lan was furious and vowed to rescue them. He recalled overhearing Xu and Qi before and asked Bayar if she knew anything about the east of the desert. Bayar told him there was a small oasis in the east, but she hadn't investigated it because it was too far away. Su Yun Lan believed this must be where the black men were holding the sisters and told Bayar to call Yu and Xiao Ying to the village. Su Yun Lan thought that if he was right, there must be a stronghold nearby, and he would not spare Xu and Qi Yi's life if he was connected to this. Su Yun Lan, Yu, and Xiao Ying arrived at the stronghold and confirmed that it was a disguised military camp. Yu was ready for combat, but Su Yun Lan stopped her, telling her that there were a lot of people inside. She responded by saying that they should just kill them all. Su Yun Lan found it difficult to explain that they didn't know how many people were inside the stronghold or if there were any traps. He then asked Xiao Ying for his help, but Yu objected, saying that Xiao Ying was too weak. However, Xiao Ying insisted that he had grown up and didn't want to always hold his sister back. He reminded Yu that Xiao Ying was not that weak. Su Yun Lan increased Xiao Ying's iron content, turning him into a demon general, and ordered him to distract the enemy in the stronghold. Xiao Ying rushed through the stronghold in a berserk state, scratching people with his claws. Some panicked, cursed, and were disturbed from their sleep, while others ordered to kill him. 
Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan and Yu hid behind a big rock while observing Xiao Ying's destructive rampage. Su Yun Lan concluded that this was the best way to control a demon. Su Yun Lan and Yu entered the enemy stronghold, taking advantage of the chaos caused by Xiao Ying. As they were walking inside, Su Yun Lan saw a carved name and realized that this had something to do with Mo Jiao and Xu and Qi. In the midst of the chaos, Yu spotted a covered cage and fiercely destroyed it with her scythe, revealing captive women inside. A child rushed to hug Yu, calling her sister Yu. Yu showed relief and called her Tang Tang. Inside the enemy stronghold, Su Yun Lan asked Yu if they knew each other. Tang Tang noticed Su Yun Lan and asked excitedly if he was her husband. She expressed concern that Yu might not find a husband. Su Yun Lan was shocked and awkward when Tang Tang asked him if he was her husband. He questioned his financial situation and living arrangements. He then covered her mouth to stop her from talking, causing Yu to feel embarrassed as well. As they tried to escape, they suddenly spotted an enemy soldier nearby, causing them to stop. Tang Tang expressed her happiness at seeing her sister after a long time, thanking her for saving them and complimenting Su Yun Lan. She urged Yu not to let him go. Yu, on the other hand, urged Tang Tang to refrain from engaging in chatter and to keep moving. Tang Tang pulled out a stolen key from her time in jail and suggested they use it to bypass the men and sneak through the tunnels to make their way home. Su Yun Lan confirmed that everyone had left the enemy base and they should leave quickly. Tang Tang expressed her desire to see Xiao Ying but was teased by another lady about her lover boy, which made her feel embarrassed and run. Meanwhile, the man in black revealed that they had purposely given them the key to lure them out, as he was pleased with the success of his plan, but he suddenly ordered his comrade to shoot them. Yu stopped the incoming arrows while Su Yun Lan instructed everyone to retreat to a sheltered area. Yu realized that she had been hit by a poisoned arrow and was struggling to move. Tang Tang bit Su Yun Lan's finger to escape his grip and ran towards Yu, despite Yu's attempts to stop her. Unfortunately, Tang Tang was hit by multiple arrows in her back. Yu caught Tang Tang's falling body after she was hit by an arrow, leaving Yu stunned and shocked. She let out an angry scream. Su Yun Lan expressed shock and anger at the fact that they targeted such a small child. Tang Tang coughed up blood and requested that Yu not cry. She gave something to Yu for Xiao Ying and remembered the time when she wanted to play the flute with Xiao Ying. The men in black approached and expressed dismay for using poisoned arrows on a child. They then decided to capture the only beautiful woman in wild clothing. Su Yun Lan cursed the men in black as worse than beasts. The leader ordered his men to capture Su Yun Lan as well, saying that he would be in for a beating tonight. However, Su Yun Lan laughed and declared that he would make the men in black pay for their sins. With rage in his eyes, he challenged them to come and pay their respects to the soul of the person who died in their claws. In the enemy stronghold, men laughed and made derogatory remarks about Consort Su, mocking him for hanging out with a bunch of women. Su Yun Lan confronted the head of the men in black, identifying him as a henchman of Xu and Kiwi, and threatened to report him to Father Mazun. The henchman laughed at his threat and ordered his men to attack. Surrounded by the men in black, Su Yun Lan activated his iron technique to observe the henchman's blade and determine its composition. He realized he could control the blade if he got close enough. The henchman taunted him, calling him a loser who didn't know martial arts, and prepared to attack, yelling at him to die. As the henchman abruptly lunged at Su Yun Lan with his blade, to everyone's shock and disbelief, the henchman himself appeared bewildered by the fact that his sword was pierced through his body. Su Yun Lan announced that he was the first to die and that everyone else would follow. He then slashed them one by one, calling them straw-running animals and promising to make them taste despair. After a while, one man left in the enemy stronghold pleaded for mercy, claiming that he had been tricked into attacking him and didn't want to be involved. The man trembled and peed himself in fear. Su Yun Lan offered him an escape, but mercilessly impaled him with his sword so he wouldn't let him get away. Su Yun Lan displayed anger and a sense of justice as he questioned the man's plea for mercy, implying that the man had not considered the consequences of their actions. As Su Yun Lan sensed Ying's escape, his worry grew about a larger troop's arrival. Yu's health concerned him, and he knew her injury could not be delayed any longer. He urgently tried to awaken her, wondering if the effect of the poison was to blame for her unresponsiveness. He told her that if she didn't wake up, Xiao Ying would die, and everyone there would die. 
Yu's response was emotional, telling him that Xiao Yin couldn't die and neither could he, to which Su Yun Lan responded with a grunt and ordered them to leave. As they left, they set fire to the enemy's stronghold and walked away, with Yu carrying Tang Tang's body. Su Yun Lan glanced back, pondering the hidden shadows in the depths. As the group mourned the death of Tang Tang, Xiao Ying placed his flute on his chest and gazed at the grave. Bayar approached Yu, calling out her name with concern, as the poison was affecting her and she was nearly fainting. Bayar helped Yu back to her room. Inside the tent, Yu lay on the bed, clearly in pain from the poison. Both Su Yun Lan and Bayar sat in silence. Su Yun Lan expressed confusion and wonder at Yu's unexpected strength and resilience, wondering what kind of past experiences she had been through before. Bayar let out a sigh and responded that Yu had been quietly carrying the burden of her past alone without anyone else's knowledge about it. Bayar began to recount the story of their siblings' past, starting with a reunion festival that marked the beginning of their shared journey. Back at the time of the reunion festival, when Yu was still a child, she approached the village head, thanking him for his care and presenting a gift from her father. The village head expressed gratitude and thanks. Suddenly, a person interrupted them, showing a bag with three blood skulls. The village head recognized it as a danger and ordered everyone to run away. Yu was told to take her brother and hide, and they quickly ran away as people in the village were fleeing from the incoming danger. As they hid, they witnessed demons attacking people, causing Xiao Ying to cry out in fear for their father and the village head. Yu gestured at him to be quiet, but the men in black heard them and turned towards them. The men in black caught them and ordered their men to throw Yu to the demons while taking Xiao Ying away. They forcefully separated the two, with Yu being thrown to the demons and given a scythe. The man instructed her to survive if she wanted revenge. Bayar explained that Yu lost all her family members that night and lost all human emotions as a result. It took her six years to find Xiao Ying sleeping in an ice pool at an abandoned base of the man in black. Yu apologized to Xiao Ying for being late and suggested they go home. As Su Yun Lan wonders about the blood and tears skull and the half-human, half-skeleton Ning Yu and Ju symbols, he wonders if he's seen them before. He asks Bayar for permission to take care of Yu, and Bayar agrees excitedly. As she left the tent, Bayar looked back at them. Su Yun Lan shows empathy and understanding toward Yu's sense of responsibility and guilt for those she wants to protect while also criticizing her need to rely on others. Yu shows reluctance to let Su Yun Lan go, while Su Yun Lan promises to seek justice by rooting out the organizations and making them pay with their blood. Meanwhile, in the Black Cloud Mountain, Minister Liu Mang reports to the Demon Lord that Su Yun Lan appeared in the eastern part of the desert. The Demon Lord throws a tag and orders him to save Su Yun Lan. In the secret village, Yu wakes up and steps out of her tent, where she meets Bayar. Bayar greets Yu and asks how she is feeling. Yu thanks Bayar for taking care of her, but Bayar defers the credit to Su Yun Lan, who had been taking care of Yu and keeping the village in order. Bayar shows Yu Su Yun Lan's latest invention, carts that can carry goods in the desert with ease, making life easier for everyone in the village. Yu asks Bayar to gather everyone, and she announces her gratitude to Su Yun Lan for rescuing imprisoned sisters and providing tools and knowledge for the village's survival in the desert, which everyone agrees with. She then declares Su Yun Lan the new leader of the village, which elicits cheers and declarations of support from the villagers, and he accepts the offer. He thinks about the hardships that the villagers have endured and declares his name to help fight against their enemies and lead in creating a new home for them. Su Yun Lan plans to uncover the conspiracy behind Xu and Qiu Yi and write to his wife to ask her to include these girls in her army. In the enemy stronghold, Su Yun Lan fights with his new skills, demonstrating the effectiveness of Yu's teachings as he dodges attacks. Su Yun Lan retaliates against his opponent by burning their face with a torch, causing them to scream in agony before ending their life with Yu's scythe. He demands the captives come out of the cell and proudly tells them to call him gracious. However, the ladies are intimidated by his presence and hesitate to move. Yu then pushes Su Yun Lan forward and assures the captives that they are there to save them. The ladies are overjoyed at the prospect of finally leaving the ghostly place. As they rush out of the cell, they stampede over Su Yun Lan, who is left bewildered by their excitement. As they return to Junhu village, Su Yun Lan is seen making something when Yu throws an apple to him, which he catches and thanks her. She asks him why he is having everyone transport so much yellow dung. Su Yun Lan replies with a mischievous smile, telling her it's a secret and that she will find out later. He urges everyone to get back to work, stating that he must finish a big project today. Yu asks what the project is. Later, Su Yun Lan called out for someone to bring the last few fine wood and iron blocks that he had made. 
he used his carpentry technique to build a house and exclaimed with excitement that these women wouldn't have to live in leaky tents anymore. The ladies in the village expressed their appreciation and thanked him. Su Yun Lan thought to himself that he hoped this was a good start. Bayar complimented Su Yun Lan's work and offered him coconut milk. Su Yun Lan was surprised and flustered, humorously wondering if it was a century-old brand as he looked towards her breasts. Meanwhile, in Black Cloud Mountain, Q Yi was angry that Su Yun Lan had not only survived but had also destroyed many of his strongholds. Q Yi ordered his servant to send someone to kill Su Yun Lan, but another servant came in and said that someone wanted to see him. It turned out to be the man in black from Yu's past. At the oasis, Bayar told the other ladies that she was going to pick up an herb. One of the ladies asked about the herb's sweet smell, and Bayar explained that she wasn't sure what it was. She mentioned that Su Yun Lan had talked about a drink called Coke that was brown and sweet, and she thought the herb had a similar color and taste. She planned to take it home and see if she could make Coke. The ladies praised Bayar's kindness and suggested making a delicious meal for Su Yun Lan and the others who had gone to investigate the Black Rider, and were likely tired when they returned. As it started to get darker, Bayar let out a scream that startled the other ladies. She showed them three blood skulls that she had found while gathering herbs. Back in the village, Su Yun Lan noticed everyone's distress and asked what was wrong. Liu showed him the blood skulls and explained that they were the mark left by the men in black who had slaughtered their village. Su Yun Lan recognized the symbol and thought he had seen it before in his previous life. He asked Bayar where she had found them. Bayar told him that she had found them not far to the east, and another lady mentioned that there were black riders appearing in the desert. Yu recalled the legend of the black rider of the devil, who brought a curse of death upon those who saw him. Su Yun Lan wondered if his father knew about what had happened in the desert and couldn't shake off a bad feeling. As night falls, Yu urgently instructs someone to call Xiao Ying because they need to see something immediately. Bayar questions whether they should still go, as it is late and they haven't had dinner yet. Su Yun Lan reassures Bayar to trust Yu and humorously describes Yu as someone even demons are afraid of. Then Bayar tells them to come back quickly and expresses concern for them as Su Yun Lan and Yu leave, while Bayar stays behind. Before they leave, Bayar thanks Su Yun Lan, but Su Yun Lan doesn't understand why. Bayar insists on thanking him, and Su Yun Lan says they will talk about it later. Bayar mutters about her cold coke, but she is interrupted by someone reporting a problem with the food storage. They both rush to the barn, which makes Bayar drop her coke and contemplate getting it. However, she chooses to investigate the issue first. In the barn, the lady shows Bayar a storage box containing blood skulls, which surprises her. Bayar identifies them as their food boxes and realizes that they have been contaminated with blood skulls. The men in black are seen looking at the village from afar. On the other side, Su Yun Lan, Yu, and Xiao Ying encounter something like a sandstorm. Yu confirms that it isn't a sandstorm and there is a bloody smell in the wind. Su Yun Lan, Yu, and Xiao Ying are then confronted by Yahu, the head of the Black Riders. They have been ordered to bring Su Yun Lan back to Black Cloud City by Lord Mazen, the Demon Lord. When an explosion from the village causes panic and frustration, they instantly run back to the village. However, they are blocked by the Black Riders, and Yahu insists on taking Su Yun Lan with them. Despite Su Yun Lan's insistence that they need to save lives, Yahu remains firm in his mission to take Su Yun Lan back. The situation escalates into a battle between the Black Riders and Su Yun Lan's group. Yu fights them as she strikes an attack that is instantly dodged by the Black Riders. Yahu warns that except Su Yun Lan, all who resist will be killed without mercy. Yu and Xiao Ying rush to attack the Black Riders but are immediately injured. As Su Yun Lan realizes they are outmatched by the strength of the Black Rider Legion, Yu makes a brave decision to risk her life to go back into the village. But Yahu is determined to stop her, and tensions rise. As Yahu charges with his lances towards Yu, Su Yun Lan frantically begs him to stop. Suddenly, a sword appears out of nowhere and intercepts Yahu's attack, causing him to become enraged. Su Yun Lan sees Yu and Ying's image in the distance as the sword returns to its owner. Yu and Ying jumps off the cliff and attacks General Yahu, who avoids her strikes and yells for her to stop. Yu admires her strong aura. Yu and Ying swings and points her sword at General Yahu, declaring her intention to take him down and asking who dared to stop her. Su Yun Lan thinks that the Black Cavalry wouldn't dare to harm the princess. Yahu remains silent as they walk away. Su Yun Lan calls out Yu and Ying's name, but she interrupts him and supports him, stunned. She urges everyone to save the people in the village. They return to the village and are all surprised by the damage from the explosion. Su Yun Lan commands them to rush to save the people if they can. Yu, on the other hand, calls out her sister Bayar's name, believing that she was smart enough to hide. 
Su Yun Lan searches for survivors but finds none. In a nearby area, they hear Bayara's voice suddenly call out for Master Su. They rush to her side as she is badly injured. Su Yun Lan clenches his fists, Yuan Ying feels remorseful, and Su Yun Lan cries and murmurs that they were still too late. Bayar coughs up blood, and Yu tries to heal her, but she stops her from using her powers. She then calls Su Yun Lan, gives him a tag, and tells him not to blame himself and to take care of Yu. She passes away, and everyone shouts her name in grief. Yu, on the other hand, cannot accept her death. The next day, in Black Cloud City, Yu and Ying tends to Su Yun Lan's bandage and expresses her surprise at hearing of his recent disappearance and the events that had transpired in just half a month. Su Yun Lan clenches the jade pendant and is determined to find the mastermind behind everything that had happened. Yu and Ying notices the jade pendant that belonged to her seventh brother, which leads them to wonder if he had deliberately entangled Yu and Ying in the capital. Su Yun Lan suspects that there are capital crimes involved including human trafficking, demon experimentation, and privately raising an army. He thinks that all of these are capital crimes and wonders why they eagerly want to kill them all. Suddenly, law enforcement officers from Black Cloud City arrive and accuse Su Yun Lan of being a rebel. Su Yun Lan shows disbelief at the accusation. Yuan Ying was surprised to see strangers trespassing on her husband's residence and demanded to know who they were. The law enforcement officer identified himself and stated that Su Yun Lan, the emperor's son-in-law, had colluded with desert bandits to destroy Tang's military strongholds in the desert. He asked if this was not an act of rebellion. Su Yun Lan demanded to see the evidence and thought that Xu and Kui might be trying to frame him. The law enforcement officer showed the evidence, and the person they brought in immediately pointed at Su Yun Lan and accused him of killing all his brothers. The person urged the law enforcement officer to take down Su Yun Lan and two of his partners, who were described as terrifying. The officer smirked and dragged Yu and Xiao Ying in. Su Yun Lan realized that they had controlled both Yu and Xiao Ying. He gritted his teeth as he faced the officer, who accused him of quibbling. Su Yun Lan argued that soldiers could identify him and his partners, but the officer was contemptuous of his claims. The officer then produced evidence found in the destroyed stronghold, a jade pendant that Su Yun Lan had lost during his mission. Su Yun Lan realized his mistake and admitted defeat. Yu and Ying was left speechless as the law enforcement officer took Su Yun Lan away. A moment later, Yu and Ying barged in and confronted Chu and Kyuyi, accusing him of capturing the consort and running a human trafficking business in the desert. Kui denied the accusations and claimed ignorance. He smirked and mentioned that he had heard about Su Yun Lan leading a group of stragglers in the desert, but all of them were dead. Yu and Ying thought to herself how vicious Xu and Kui was, having slaughtered an entire village without leaving any survivors. Kui proposed a solution to save Su Yun Lan, but Yu and Ying was skeptical and asked for clarification. Kui suggested that Su Yun Lan should participate in the annual death penalty pardon tournament in Black Cloud City. This competition allows prisoners sentenced to death to compete for the top spot and be pardoned for their crimes. However, Kui remarked and mocked that Su Yun Lan was useless and didn't know how to fight and that he would probably die at the hands of other prisoners. In a fit of anger, Yu and Ying hit the cup of drink that Kui was holding and warned him that if anything happened to Su Yun Lan, he would be like the broken cup. Kyuyi was left speechless. Three days passed, and they arrived at the arena, where Yuan Ying and Xu and Kyuyi had notable seats. Kyuyi had a sinister thought about Su Yun Lan, believing that he didn't have to kill him personally, as any random death row inmate would do it for him. Kyuyi then announced that the day marked the death penalty tournament, where contestants would be considered a failure if they surrendered or fell out of the ring, regardless of life or death. The final winner would have the opportunity to compete with a young master and would only qualify for pardon by surpassing him. As the tournament was about to begin, the host announced the arrival of the demon lord, Mazen, which made Chu and Kyuyi nervous about his presence. The sky formed a smoke and a light came that struck through behind their seats, and demon lord Mazen appeared. Yuan Ying and Chu and Kui knelt to greet him. Demon Lord Mazen announced that the winner of the tournament, regardless of whether they were a member of the Mazen family or not, would obtain the right to transfer the Black Cavalry. The crowd erupted with excitement and cheers at the prospect of winning the coveted prize. In the arena, where the crowds are hysterically laughing, Su Yun Lan expressed his interest. From afar, he looked to his father and mentioned that he had a 20% chance before announcing something. Feeling half dead, he declared that he would do it by himself this time. Curiously, you asked if he would really do it by himself this time. Su Yun Lan just smiled at her and replied that they should calm themselves and heal their wounds while he handles it. 
Although Yu tried to protest, Su Yun Lan explained that she had been relying on instinct and that her strength would be greatly reduced against an opponent who has practiced martial arts with rules and regulations. Additionally, Su Yun Lan noted that revealing their demonic forms in front of the public could be dangerous. He assured them that he was not weak, despite the strength of the death row inmates being generally low. Although his internal strength was only at the end of the lower grade, his iron technique could be unaffected by different internal strengths. He promised to take care of everyone and win the fight, then walked to the ring, telling them to wait for him there. As the crowd yelled and mocked Su Yun Lan, claiming that he didn't know any martial arts, they speculated that he had come there to meet his death. Others showed pity for the princess for marrying a loser like him. The crowds grew excited, realizing that his first opponent was a big boxer with a build that could easily kill Su Yun Lan. Tui grinned, thinking that Su Yun Lan's anniversary death would be next year today. Meanwhile, Lai Tang asked his sister if his brother-in-law could really win. Yu and Ying told him to trust Su Yun Lan. Determined, Su Yun Lan thought that he must bear the weight of his opponent before he could wear his crown. The big warrior approached him and teasingly called him his good boyfriend. Su Yun Lan was confused and didn't recognize him. But the warrior revealed that he had tried to take his life before and was sent to death row by his master Xu and Kiwi. Still not remembering him, Su Yun Lan shrugged it off and told him to focus on the fight. The eager crowd urged them to start and told Su Yun Lan to pick a weapon and start fighting so it would be over quickly. The warrior mocked him for his lack of martial arts skills, and the crowd called for Su Yun Lan to be killed. Finally, the referee started the game. The big warrior approached Su Yun Lan to strike a punch, cursing at him and threatening him to die while charging. However, Su Yun Lan didn't move and instead used his iron technique to grab the big warrior's necklace, causing him to choke. Surprised and struggling to breathe, the big warrior asked Su Yun Lan what he had done. Su Yun Lan laughed and mocked him, calling him a stupid maniac for fighting with a metal necklace. He then declared that the big warrior's destiny was death, and, after a second, the big warrior's head was cut off, shocking the crowd. The people in the crowd expressed their amazement and disbelief at the evil technique Su Yun Lan had used. They also discussed how they had underestimated him and how he had been called a loser for killing the top grade. Some people commented that they feared Su Yun Lan and that he was not invincible. Nevertheless, Lai Tang and Yuan Ying praised Su Yun Lan's skills, and Minister Lu Mang asked if the Lord knew what kind of mystery was behind Su Yun Lan's technique. The demon lord Mazen showed interest and encouraged them to keep watching. Finally, the referee announced that Su Yun Lan was the winner of the first match. Su Yun Lan smirked and taunted his next opponent, Xu and Kyuyi, by pointing at him and telling him that the big boxer he had just defeated was merely an appetizer. He confidently stated that it was now time to move on to the main course. At first, Su Yun Lan was shouting for Xu and Kyuyi to come down, threatening to blow his head. In response, Qiu Yu was confused by the statement and accused Su Yun Lan of taking the initiative with a young man. Suddenly, the referee interrupted and called out to Su Yun Lan, telling him to return to the contest. Reluctantly, Su Yun Lan looked to the referee and announced the new participant named Black Cloud. Flower Sun Tu was introduced. Confidently, Sun Tu made a grand entrance, taunting Su Yun Lan and warning him not to fall for his charms. Visibly irritated by Sun Tu's behavior, Su Yun Lan threw a knife at Sun Tu, but Sun Tu just easily dodged it. Feeling frustrated, Su Yun Lan threatened to kill him, but Sun Tu calmly explained that he had already analyzed his attack and its range and knew how to avoid it. Impressively, he revealed that he had noticed Su Yun Lan manipulating an iron necklace earlier in the contest and used that information to predict his attack range. Reflecting on the situation, Su Yun Lan thought about the contestants in the competition and acknowledged that they were all highly skilled. Turning to his opponent, Sun Tu then spoke to him, saying that it was his turn to shoot. Swiftly, Su Yun Lan dodged it. Unexpectedly, the dart was thrown at one of the audience members, causing a commotion. At that moment, Su Yun Lan realized that the wooden dart Sun Tu was using showcased the depth of his inner strength. With a smirk, Sun Tu then taunted Su Yun Lan, calling him a baby who is pretty quick to dodge. Angrily, Su Yun Lan responded, threatening to kill him once more. Sun Tu was furious when Su Yun Lan called him a coward. Consequently, he threw a baby dart at Su Yun Lan, who skillfully repelled the attacks. Su Yun Lan remarked that Sun Tu was courting death and wondered aloud how many daggers he had hidden on his person. Determined, Sun Tu pursued Su Yun Lan relentlessly, while Su Yun Lan ran and continued to repel his attacks. However, Su Yun Lan almost lost his balance when he repelled an attack that pushed him to the edge of the ring. Seizing the opportunity, Sun Tu attacked Su Yun Lan, who cursed as his arms were struck by the dart. 
On the sidelines, Yun Ying and Lai Tang were both worried and nervous. The tension could be felt among the crowd watching the fight, with some cheering for Sun Tzu, while others predicted the end of the battle. Injured, Su Yun Lan noticed the poor quality of the ring and thought of a plan. Boldly, he leaped to attack Sun Tzu, but Sun Tzu dodged his moves with ease and taunted him for his lack of strength. Undeterred, Su Yun Lan tried to attack him again with the sword, but Sun Tzu still managed to dodge it and mocked him. Resolute, Su Yun Lan used his iron technique to control the sword and attacked Sun Tzu once more, yet he still managed to dodge it. Sun Tzu jeered at Su Yun Lan for his weakness, and Su Yun Lan prepared to use his final move. However, as Su Yun Lan's last attack pierced the ring, Sun Tu derided him for his lack of strength and claimed that his final swords didn't stand a chance. Kyuhi smiled and questioned Su Yun Lan's final blow, while the crowds eagerly anticipated Su Yun Lan's demise. Unexpectedly, the arena's ring collapsed, causing Sun Tu to fall outside the ring. Cleverly, Su Yun Lan appealed to the referee for a decision. The referee then declared Su Yun Lan as the winner. Qiu was taken aback by the outcome, while Lai Tang praised his brother-in-law for his victory. Angry, Sun Tu accused Su Yun Lan of intentionally destroying the foundation of the platform to make him fall out of the ring and criticized his weak appearance. In response, Su Yun Lan mocked Sun Tu, saying that God had given him an ugly appearance but a sharp mind. Infuriated, Sun Tu attempted to strike Su Yun Lan. However, Demon Lord Mazen intervened from afar and stomped on Sun Tu's body with his key, stopping him in his tracks. Su Yun Lan marveled at Mazen's powerful devil key, while Mazen sternly warned that those who did not follow the rules would meet the same fate as Sun Tu. Su Yun Lan praises his father's strength, acknowledging that he is more powerful and ruthless than ever before. Consequently, as he stands in the arena, a large, formidable man named Tai Bu Shan emerges behind him, causing the entire crowd to gasp in surprise. In that moment, Su Yun Lan deduces that Tai Bu Shan is probably his final opponent before he can confront Xu and Kyuhi, the individual he plans to kill. Subsequently, the referee declares that the victor between Tai Bu Shan and Su Yun Lan will earn the opportunity to compete against Xu and Kyuhi. Tai Bu Shan then remarks that he has heard that Su Yun Lan is a Mazen young master as well, but points out that there is a significant difference between their situations. Moreover, he adds that if he kills Su Yun Lan, he will also kill Xu and Kyuhi. Realizing that he must fight with his bare hands since the weapon house is empty, Su Yun Lan braces himself. As Tai Bu Shan initiates the attack with his hands ablaze, Su Yun Lan manages to block it, but is still thrown into the corner stand, feeling an impact that makes him cough up blood. Yuan Ying, concerned for Su Yun Lan's safety, observes that he is at a disadvantage without his iron weapon and has become a low-grade warrior. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan's internal strength is depleted, and he ponders his next move. Suddenly, he spots Yuan Ying's pet in the distance and comes up with an idea. At that point, Ying Ying the squirrel scurries toward the arena ring. Tai Bu Shan assumes Su Yun Lan is losing consciousness and talking to himself, so he smashes Su Yun Lan's head into the ground. However, Su Yun Lan quickly recovers and stands up, managing to withstand Tai Bu Shan's head blow attack without feeling any impact. Unfazed, Su Yun Lan teases Tai Bu Shan for tickling him, while Tai Bu Shan taunts him back, asking if he is begging to die, but promises to ensure a slow and sorrowful death. Tai Bu Shan launches another attack, but Su Yun Lan blocks it, calling him baldy and daring him to kill him if he so desires. Nevertheless, Tai Bu Shan does not seem eager to oblige and instead hints that he has more tricks up his sleeve. In the meantime, Liu Xu asks Minister Liu Meng for approval if he chooses not to intervene. Minister Liu Meng replies that he shouldn't bother. Liu Xu believes that the second young master is a good person, but sadly, he cannot offer any assistance. Yuan Ying notices her pet in the ring, and Su Yun Lan smirks before activating his nine nether souls. Suddenly, the sky transforms, creating confusion among the spectators. Tai Bu Shan questions the change in the sky and someone in the crowd suggests it is a flock of desert eagles, which leads to further queries from others about how so many eagles could have gathered there. The eagles then assault Bu Shan, inflicting damage to his eyes. Bu Shan curses and shrieks in pain, while Su Yun Lan comments on the power of his desert eagle compared to Bu Shan's top-grade weapon. Su Yun Lan discloses that he has identified Bu Shan's weakness and delivers a kick to his family jewel, causing Bu Shan to scream and convulse in pain. The crowd is taken aback, and they cover their own family jewels in sympathy for Tai Bu Shan. 
Lai Tang notices He Yan's reaction and inquires why he is pinching his legs. As Tai Bu Shan continues to wail in agony, Su Yun Lan pushes him out of the ring. Su Yun Lan expresses his gratitude to the squirrel for helping him attract the eagles and then looks at Qi Yi in the distance, conveying his intention to take his life. The crowd, now energized, begins to cheer for Su Yun Lan, repeatedly chanting his name. The crowds are amazed and thrilled by Su Yun Lan's performance. In contrast, Qi Yi wonders how Su Yun Lan managed to defeat Tai Bu Shan, despite the latter's increased power even after 30 years of imprisonment. Qi Yi also acknowledges that he is no match for Tai Bu Shan, but Su Yun Lan had managed to defeat him nonetheless. Su Yun Lan looks at Qi Yi and teasingly asks if he is still watching the show. Feeling frustrated, Qi Yi wonders if there might be something else hidden. Meanwhile, the crowds notice Qi Yi and begin to cheer for him as the young master of the Mazen. Qi Yi shows frustration as he thinks about how he must find a way to defeat Su Yun Lan since he is no match for him. Determined, Qi Yi jumps into the arena ring to face Su Yun Lan, and some members of the crowd cheer for him to beat Su Yun Lan. Some people say that the Odano young master of the demon cult acts and plans to dispatch the Black Rider Forest after winning the competition. Enraged, Qi Yi tells the loud crowd to shut up. However, the crowd feels delighted and cheers Qi Yi on, believing that Qi Yi was thinking about how Su Yun Lan would die. Qi Yi is even more annoyed that they're making a fuss about the fight with Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan thinks that Qi Yi is a coward and obsessed with the female sex. He also believes that Qi Yi's young energy has been exhausted and he can no longer practice the strong and fierce techniques of the demon cult. Qi Yi then greets Su Yun Lan and tells him that he did not expect him to make it this far. Su Yun Lan smiles and asks Qi Yi to cut the crap and get to the point. Qi Yi fake laughs as he stops Su Yun Lan from walking towards him and tells him that his body is already scarred, and it's not honorable for him as a demon cult master to kill him as easily as his palm. Su Yun Lan remains unfazed by Qi Yi's words, and then Qi Yi suggests a match of the art of war to take advantage of Su Yun Lan's weakness to win. Su Yun Lan agrees to the match and asks Qi Yi how he wants to compare. Qi Yi calls the Khan on an elevated stand, and some people come out of the room. After an hour, Su Yun Lan thinks that the platform looks like it was from a TV drama. Qi Yi explains that they are there for an embroidery ring specially designed for the Book of War. Su Yun Lan, however, appears to have some knowledge about it and comments that the game is merely about sending someone to climb a tower, capture the hydrangea, and beat the gong. Qi Yi feels embarrassed but decides to explain the rules anyway. He then explains that each side picks four inmates on the scene to form a team. One side will compete for the bouquet of flowers on the platform, and the final dinging of the gong will determine the winner. Inmates step forward to work for Qi Yi, and he is carefree with the strong inmates he has on his side. Su Yun Lan, on the other hand, is left with unimpressive inmates to form a team. Another team on the platform mocks them by saying that all things and people are alike, and trash is worthy of trash. Undeterred, Su Yun Lan approaches and shows his charisma to the unimpressive inmates, asking them if they want to leave this ghostly place with him, and they all agree. He then tells them to follow his lead. The referee announces the start of the game, and subsequently, the team members take their positions. The gongmen, who made the starting sound, were exhausted and fell asleep beside the gong. As a result, the crowd begins laughing and mocks Su Yun Lan's strategy of daydreaming. However, Su Yun Lan remains confident and promises to show everyone what a win is later on. The two teams initiate their climb of the platform, with some inmates playfully making fun of each other's abilities. Meanwhile, one of Su Yun Lan's team members, the old cripple, swiftly rushes behind the wood elevated shelf and pokes the toes of Qi Yi's teammates, causing them to fall. Infuriated, Qi Yi orders one of his team members to beat the old cripple, while the rest continue to climb up to the top of the platform. The old cripple is spotted by Qi Yi's teammate and quickly runs away from him, while other inmates in the distance observe the scene and comment that they were acting foolishly. Amidst the chaos, the hefty inmate of Su Yun Lan farts in the face of one of Qi Yi's team members, provoking them to curse and call it a biochemical weapon. Just half an hour ago, Su Yun Lan had asked the fatty inmate what he's best at, to which fatty inmate responded with a boast about his potent flatulence. Su Yun Lan, in turn, expresses his regret at the response. Returning to the competition, fatty inmate warns Qi Yi's teammate that misfortune is coming his way. The teammate of Qi Yi is seen reaching for the other wood to climb, but fatty inmate suddenly jumps and sits on his face, causing the three of them to tumble down. Su Yun Lan praises Fatty Inmate for being a valuable asset since only one person is left on Qi's team. 
Pui questions Su Yun Lan's tactics, but Su Yun Lan reveals that it was actually a clever, middle grade move. The teammate of Qi finally manages to reach the top of the elevated shelf, only to be surprised by the dwarf inmate already there. Su Yun Lan discloses that the dwarf had been hiding under fatty inmate's clothes, which is why he had such a hard time climbing. The dwarf inmate secures the ball at the top, but it accidentally falls from the gong man's tummy where he was sleeping. The gong man awakens irritable, and in his anger he smacks the gong, signaling the end of the game. This unexpected sound leaves the crowds questioning the legitimacy of the gong. Ultimately, the referee declares Su Yun Lan the winner, and Qi -E is left contemplating how the game had been played. Qi -E appeared visibly stunned and could hardly believe what had just transpired. Consequently, he accused Su Yun Lan of cheating, asserting that it was merely a coincidence, not a true victory. In response, Su Yun Lan retorted with a biting comment, labeling Qi -E as a demon cult young master capable of twisting the truth. Moreover, he accused him of turning human trafficking and the ruthless killing of innocent girls into a valiant battle against bandits. The crowd, taken aback by this revelation, reacted with shock, as did Qi. It crossed Qi's mind that Su Yun Lan was attempting character assassination with the words he uttered in front of everyone. Feeling outraged, Qi vehemently denied everything Su Yun Lan had said. He then turned to his father Mazen, imploring him to be aware of Su Yun Lan's ludicrous claims. At this point, He Yan interjected, stating that it was not up to Qi Yi to decide whether or not to believe the accusations. This intervention left Qi Yi gasping in surprise. Suddenly, He Yan, Lai Tang, and the royal guards appeared alongside captured individuals, including a young girl whom Lai Tang held protectively. The captives cried out and begged Qi Yi to rescue them. Without delay, He Yan leaped into the ring and inquired if he was late. Su Yun Lan replied that he had arrived just in time. He Yan then presented letters discovered in Xu and Qi Yi's mansion, all of which pertained to human trafficking in the desert. He also asserted that the demon cult had identified the handwriting as Qi Yi's. Furthermore, He Yan claimed that Qi Yi had concealed the kidnapped girl within a hidden compartment in his mansion's back wall. The crowd reacted with shock and disbelief, and some prisoners even threatened Qi Yi, questioning if he had truly abused underage girls. Qi Yi asked Su Yun Lan how he had gained knowledge of his mansion. Su Yun Lan responded by suggesting that Qi Yi was actually referring to the fact that he knew someone was hidden in the mansion. Su Yun Lan also divulged that He Yan had ample time to search the mansion due to a temporary change in the tournament's rules. Subsequently, he hinted that he might have encountered Qi Yi's secret visitor in the past during a failed mission. This revelation sparked a commotion in the crowd, with some attendees wondering if the young master was impotent. Qi Yi denied the allegations and pleaded with his father to believe him, while Su Yun Lan challenged him and offered to have his father investigate the matter to prove his innocence, even swearing a vow to be struck by lightning. Growing increasingly anxious, Qi Yi realized that he might be in trouble if his father intervened. Finally, Qi Yi confessed to his misdeeds, attributing them to the coercion of deceitful men. Su Yun Lan surmised that there might be a mastermind orchestrating the entire scheme. However, Yuan Ying suddenly yelled a warning to Su Yun Lan, and in an instant, an attacker appeared and decapitated Xu and Qi Yi. Enraged, Demon Lord Mazen used his key to teleport into the ring arena, demanding to know who had the audacity to kill people at will in his presence. Later, in the Imperial capital, Su Yun Lan expressed his happiness at being home. Moreover, he then asks Old He who He Yan is and remarks on the strange looks they are receiving from the people of the capital. He Yan responds that a radiant person like him is used to that kind of attention. Meanwhile, Lai Tang thought of a romantic scene between him and He Yan, and he chimed in with a playful comment. Yu and Ying then told Su Yun Lan that she needs to take Yu and Ying to the military headquarters and instructed him to return to the house first. Agreeing to meet her there later, Su Yun Lan watches as the cart pulls away to the princess house. Simultaneously, someone is seen watching them from afar and remarks that their opportunity has arrived. In the princess's mansion, Lai Tang is helping He Yan out of the cart. Observing this, Su Yun Lan shakes his head off at the two that are getting philosophical with each other. Additionally, Su Yun Lan then remembers the jade pendant he dropped and went to search for it back in the cart. However, as he finds it, he gets a surprise, a sudden kidnapping that drags him away. The kidnapper is pleased to have caught Su Yun Lan, 
and one of the kidnappers urges them to run quickly. Attempting to negotiate, Su Yun Lan tries to reason out with the kidnapper, offering to talk about what they need if they let him go. In an unknown area, Su Yun Lan struggles to free himself from his kidnappers. When they finally release him from the sack, he yelled his own name with anger, only to be surprised once again to find many people cheering and showing their support for him. Subsequently, a person approaches him and praises his beauty, writing ability, and his invisible charm. They go on to call him the Maiden's Guardian Angel, who has saved countless girls from traffickers. Caught in an awkward situation, Su Yun Lan tries to downplay his accomplishments, telling the person not to exaggerate them. Nonetheless, the person is ecstatic to have met Su Yun Lan in person and touches his hand in excitement, declaring that he will never wash it again. Perplexed, Su Yun Lan is taken aback by the sudden attention and admiration he is receiving, realizing that he has become a national idol. Meanwhile, at the Dong house, an angry old woman taps fiercely on the table, frustrated that her family member doesn't understand the three obediences and four virtues. She demands the servant to go, and the servant quickly agrees. In an unknown location, a lady is saying goodbye to Su Yun Lan. As she bids him farewell, another woman advises him to take care. Reflecting on his past life, Su Yun Lan thought about how popular idols were and how cool they must have been. Suddenly, a group of men, hidden in the bushes, seemed to be waiting for Su Yun Lan. One of them announced that he had his bags ready. As they blocked Su Yun Lan's path, he appeared confident and amused, assuming that they were his passionate fans. However, the men exchanged a glance before effortlessly putting Su Yun Lan into a sack. Later, in the Dong Mansion, Su Yun Lan found himself in a stately home and assumed that his fans were trying to play hide and seek with him. An old woman approached and asked if he was Su Yun Lan, but he denied it. Instead, he claimed and boasted to be the patron saint of maidens and mothers-in-law. This response, however, irritated the elderly woman. To appease her, Su Yun Lan proposed offering her an autograph or a picture. Since they lacked a camera, he suggested hiring an artist to paint a portrait. Su Yun Lan then joked with the old woman, teasingly referring to her as a mum fan and inquiring if her daughter was secretly admiring him from afar. Unfortunately, the elderly woman grew increasingly annoyed with Su Yun Lan's behavior. At that moment, Yuan Ying unexpectedly appeared and knelt before the elderly woman, addressing her as her grandmother. Su Yun Lan was surprised to learn that the old woman was Yuan Ying's grandmother. The elderly woman introduced herself as Yinger's grandmother and playfully cracked her knuckles in front of Su Yun Lan. Attempting to defuse the situation with humor, Su Yun Lan told her that the previous encounter was just a talk show meant to entertain and make her happy. He also tried to impress and flatter her by complimenting her skin. However, the grandmother only gave him a sardonic smile and an irritated look before smacking his head. Subsequently, she asked Yuan Ying how good Su Yun Lan was to her, to which she demurely replied that he was exceptionally nice. The grandmother then inquired if they had consummated their marriage and when they planned to have children. Both Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying were taken aback and too embarrassed to respond. Surprised by their reaction, the grandmother asked if they hadn't consummated their marriage yet. She then scolded Su Yun Lan for not adhering to the three obedient virtues and called him a loser, questioning how such a man could enter the Dong family. Desperate to defend himself, Su Yun Lan insisted that he could do it. Turning to Yuan Ying, he reassured her of his intentions. Grandma firmly pushes Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying into the room, sternly warning them that if the bed isn't collapsed that night, they won't be allowed to leave tomorrow. Subsequently, she locks the door. Realizing the situation, Su Yun Lan suggests they should get started, and Yuan Ying brings up a recent issue involving the Ministry of the Army. She explains that there is a cistern on the west side of the capital, which was previously under the jurisdiction of her forbidden army. However, her seventh brother received an imperial decree to build an ore refinery base near there. Consequently, the wastewater and exhaust fumes from the refinery have polluted the cistern and poisoned crops outside the western gate of the capital. Due to this issue, Yuan Ying had to arrange for her subordinates to carry water from a farther reserve for the residents, causing complaints within the military. Su Yun Lan inquires if this is the plan of the Seventh Prince and suggests that he wants to force Yuan Ying to take action. Offering his help, he tells his wife he can handle the situation. Suddenly, they hear noise from outside and hastily cover themselves with a blanket. Yuan Ying grabs Su Yun Lan's shirt and positions herself on top of him. Grandma, curious about the situation, pokes the paper door to check on them both. Feeling embarrassed by her position on top of him, Yuan Ying suggests that they pretend to be doing something. But Su Yun Lan responds that they don't have to pretend. Yuan Ying looks at Su Yun Lan as if she has planned something. 
Then, unexpectedly, Yuan Ying spanks Su Yun Lan's butt, causing him to scream in pain. Amused, Grandma laughs and remarks that Yuan Ying has her style, suggesting they celebrate with drinks later. Later on, Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan continue discussing how to resolve the issue with the seventh prince and Grandma's strict tutoring. Su Yun Lan assures Yuan Ying that everything is fine and asks her to trust him. The next day at Dong House, Su Yun Lan greets his grandmother and presents her with a skin beautifying substance that he had researched at the border. He explains that if she uses it for two quarters, her skin would be white and glowing all day long. Impressed with his ability, Grandma agrees to try the substance. Su Yun Lan massages it onto her face, asking if she feels comfortable. Pleased, Grandma compliments his service and inquires if there's anything he wants from her. Su Yun Lan requests permission to go out for a walk to purchase some materials for a facial mask he wants to make for his wife. Initially, Grandma hesitates, but when she learns it's for his wife's appearance, she allows him to go and encourages him to hurry. As Su Yun Lan steps outside of Dong family's residence, he exclaims that the good show is about to begin. In this particular quarry, an old man approaches a soldier, beseeching him to cease refining operations as his crops have all perished. However, the soldier responds aggressively, insulting the old man and warning him not to bother him again. Shortly thereafter, Su Yun Lan and He Yan arrive on the scene, only to be insulted by the soldier as well. Upon recognizing Su Yun Lan as the imperial son-in-law, the soldier inquires about his presence. Meanwhile, the old man compliments He Yan's appearance and curiously asks if he has a boyfriend. He Yan clarifies that he is a man, but the old man still expresses approval, mentioning that his grandson is also attracted to men. Urging the group to keep up, the soldier reveals that the soldiers are guarding the quarry because the seventh prince is awaiting Yinger to make a statement on behalf of the people. Su Yun Lan proposes to shut down the mine and evacuate the area, but the soldier mocks him, questioning his intelligence. In response, Su Yun Lan issues a sarcastic laugh and a warning not to blame him later. Demonstrating his mastery of sword fighting, Su Yun Lan proceeds to control all the swords in the area making them fly around and attack the soldiers. Confused, the soldier questions what is happening and why the swords are flying. Su Yun Lan takes control of the swords and informs the soldiers that he wishes to test the quality of the ordinances. While controlling the swords, he reflects on how the five spirits are in harmony with each other and fall with the swords. As the swords chase them, the soldiers begin to flee crying out for help and some even call for their mothers. However, the swords impale themselves into the ground around the soldiers, trapping them in place and causing them to look terrified. Su Yun Lan decides that, since they are soldiers of Tang, he will spare their lives. Suddenly, the seventh prince makes his appearance. A soldier, gripped by fear, clings to the seventh prince and asks why there is a flying sword when they were supposed to be waiting for the princess to capture her. Annoyed, the seventh prince smacks him, thinking that he almost ruined his plan. He then confronts Su Yun Lan, accusing him of disobeying the emperor's orders and disrupting the order at the mine. Defending himself, Su Yun Lan claims that he acted independently and warns the seventh prince that he, too, can go to the emperor and accuse him of slandering the royal family. The seventh prince orders Su Yun Lan to be taken down, but Su Yun Lan invokes his status as a royal family member and requests to be judged in the court of ancestral law. However, the seventh prince remains determined to punish Su Yun Lan and commands his soldiers to take him to the ancestral law firm cell. In the ancestral law office, Su Yun Lan observes that the place maintains strict discipline and is reputedly overseen by a trio of administrators. The seventh prince makes an appearance, cautioning Su Yun Lan that not even his father's intervention would save him should he enter the ancestral law institute. Despite this warning, Su Yun Lan remains confident that everything is under control and patiently awaits the next step. Reflecting on his time in the Hall of Demon Cult, Su Yun Lan recalls the day when the Demon Lord summoned him. As the Demon Lord picked a peach from his table, Su Yun Lan courteously offered to peel the fruit for his father. Interestingly, Su Yun Lan muses that no one would have guessed that the world's most powerful man not only loves peaches but also despises peeling them. After preparing the peaches, Su Yun Lan presents the fruit to the Demon Lord who momentarily mistakes him for Qiu Lan due to the childlike expression on Su Yun Lan's face. Curious, Su Yun Lan inquires why his father has called him there. The Demon Lord praises Su Yun Lan for his outstanding performance as a son-in-law, noting that most issues on the boards were connected to the royal family. He then advises Su Yun Lan not to dwell on Xu and Qiu's death, as life and death are matters of fate. 
the demon lord instructs Su Yun Lan to take a token from the table, the highly sought after black coins. Excitedly, Su Yun Lan flips the token over, only for his excitement to fade into confusion when the demon lord reveals that he cannot relinquish the token due to Su Yun Lan's inadequate strength. Instead, Su Yun Lan is urged to enhance his abilities swiftly and harness the power of the Eight Clans, a faction renowned for their skill in uncovering weaknesses and secrets. Upon asking about the Eight Clans, the Demon Lord explains that they are the least popular of all clans, because their expertise in exposing secrets often leads to the revelation of scandals and sensitive information, such as the Demon Lord's frequent restroom visits due to a fruit allergy. The clan was established on a whim by Xu and Q Lan, the son of the demon lord, and Su Yun Lan is encouraged to make good use of it. Grateful, he thanks his father, even though he realizes he has been assigned a challenging task. Meanwhile, back in the ancestral law office where Su Yun Lan is being held captive, a letter containing useless information about the demon lord's bathroom habits is smuggled in via an insect while the guards slumber. Subsequently, Mouse delivers another letter, which appears to be the information Su Yun Lan has been anticipating. Hewan judicial barges into the room threatening Su Yun Lan with a conviction for defying the Emperor's orders and demolishing the refinery without authorization. Frustrated and disillusioned by the ancestral law's hypocrisy, Su Yun Lan recites a cryptic poem to Huan Judicial, who fails to grasp its underlying meaning. With a smirk, Su Yun Lan challenges Huan Judicial to guess who arrived in the Yihong Yuan capital the previous night, donning a red bellaband, calling for a girl, and using a leather whip to flagellate himself. In response, Hugh and Judicial kneels and addresses Su Yun Lan as Prince Consort. Amused, Su Yun Lan sarcastically questions why Hugh and Judicial would kneel when he should be sentencing him. Hugh and Judicial laughs uneasily, his expression pleading, and assures Su Yun Lan that they will not convict him. Smiling, Su Yun Lan recognizes that he has successfully turned the tables. The soldier approaches the seventh prince and, to his surprise, assures him that Huang Shan, who may seem selfless and fair to the outside world, is actually quite greedy. He then reveals that he sent two of his men to secretly place 1,000 tails of gold in Huang Shan's room. Furthermore, he confidently states that Su Yun Lan will surely meet his end that very day. Feeling assured, the seventh prince seems confident in their plan and proudly boasts about having prepared a dog head chopper. Meanwhile, Huan Judicial silences the court and reminds them of the official process of the trial. He explains that if the suspect is found guilty in the first instance, he shall be sentenced on the spot. However, if he is not found guilty, the case will move to the second instance, where the judge will decide on an appropriate punishment. A prison person pleads for his brother's innocence, but Huan Judicial silences him, citing the official investigation. He then proceeds to announce the verdict for Su Yun Lan for allegedly destroying the Seventh Prince's ore refinery, causing a cough in the process. Growing impatient with the proceedings, the Seventh Prince urges the soldiers to bring up the dog head chopper. He realizes that Su Yun Lan's demise would also affect his sister's military backing and ultimately benefit him. However, Huan Judicial declares Su Yun Lan not guilty, shocking the Seventh Prince, who accuses him of destroying the ore refinery and questions his audacity in declaring Su Yun Lan not guilty. Huan Judicial defends the court's decision, citing the Imperial Emperor's orders. The Seventh Prince questions the court's credibility, but Huan Judicial reveals that the flying swords actually came from the Seventh Prince's own facility, not from Su Yun Lan, and that technically, he never even touched them. Huan Judicial also highlights that Su Yun Lan's martial abilities are ordinary compared to peak martial experts. Subsequently, Yuan Ying appears and announces that Su Yun Lan can return home and await their second and final trial. Grateful, Su Yun Lan thanks Huan Judicial and invites him for a drink. He then smirks while bidding farewell to the seventh prince, who is left seething. Yuan Ying compliments Su Yun Lan for his ability to find solutions to legal problems. Su Yun Lan expresses doubt about winning the next day's trial and reveals that one of the seventh prince's concubines is actually the illegitimate child of Judge Chen Gang, as reported by the Eighth Clan. That night, in the Dong family home, Su Yun Lan appears visibly shaken as he greets his grandmother. His grandmother scolds him for causing trouble by going to an ore refinery and staying overnight. She reminds him that as a man from the Dong family, he should understand and adhere to the three obediences and four virtues. Su Yun Lan apologizes for his mistake and tries to explain that he was wrongly accused and was only trying to help. 
Yunying supports his claim that he was acting for the greater good. Surprised, their grandmother exclaims that a man from the Dong family did a good deed but was wrongly accused. She then threatens to chop the seventh prince into pieces if she ever sees him, regardless of his father's status. The next day, in court, Su Yun Lan is found guilty of unlawful actions for allegedly interfering with the guards at the ore refinery and provoking them. The judge accuses him of disregarding military power and suggests that he should be punished. The judge and seventh prince share eye contact and smile at each other. Su Yun Lan calls the accusation a farce and sarcastically comments on how helping old people is now considered interfering with the military. The seventh prince wonders how Su Yun Lan will escape punishment now that it's one-on-one -on -one and the patriarchal clan system is inherently biased. Su Yun Lan insults the seventh prince, causing him to become angry and curse him, while two soldiers restrain the enraged prince. Su Yun Lan feels confident, with his grandmother and wife supporting him. During the night, the seventh prince encountered an unknown man. The seventh prince expressed his concern about their failure to defeat Su Yun Lan in a trial. However, the unknown man reassured him and presented a gift to assist them, handing him a letter. Upon receiving the paper from the unknown man, the seventh prince found its contents amusing as he read the letter. Consequently, he expressed confidence in their success, even over his sister. Intriguingly, the letter revealed information about the minister at the border and the princess. Meanwhile, at the seventh prince's mansion, a member of the eighth clan observed the strictness of the guards. Despite the tight security, the eighth clan member managed to sneak past them as easily as a fly and disappeared into the night. At the princess's mansion, the 8th clan man reported to Su Yun Lan that they had tracked the carriage to Yi Chun Yuan but did not find the 7th prince. Furthermore, the mansion's security was tight, so much so that even random pests such as mice could not get in, except for flies. Feeling frustrated, Su Yun Lan stated that it was complicated to even get out, and that it was a hassle. He thought that the person he was seeing tonight must be extraordinary, and he was eager to see it for himself. Su Yun Lan asked if the 8th clan man had specially trained flies in his team. Delighted, the clan member showed Su Yun Lan a small box with three flies, each possessing a unique feature. Curious, Su Yun Lan asked about the ordinary-looking fly. The clan member revealed that it had been caught by their youngest member when he went to the toilet, making Su Yun Lan cover his nose in disgust. Outside of Dong Mansion, Su Yun Lan used his nine shared souls technique to possess the fly. Subsequently, Su Yun Lan flew into the seventh prince's mansion. He remarked that the mansion was luxurious but corrupt. Pondering how he could find the seventh prince in such a large mansion, he found himself in the kitchen, where he landed in a pot but was spotted and chased by a servant cook. Managing to escape into the kitchen, he then found himself in the bathroom, where all the women took a bath. Astonished, he muttered heaven. In the midst of this, Su Yun Lan landed on the head of the seventh prince. The servant maid noticed the fly and informed the seventh prince, who panicked and asked the maid to remove the fly immediately. Su Yun Lan was surprised that the prince was afraid of flies. As the servant maid tried to remove him, he flew back to the prince's head, causing the servant maid to slap the prince several times. After a minute, Su Yun Lan flew away. The seventh prince asked the servant maid if the fly had left, and she confirmed that it had. Grateful, the seventh prince promised her future prosperity, and the servant maid thanked him. Su Yun Lan was shocked when he recognized the maidservant as Yinger's maid and realized that the letter had fallen into the seventh prince's hands, worrying that this was not good. As the next day dawned in Dong's mansion, Yuan Ying expressed her disbelief and upset that Kei Yun would betray her. She wondered why her housekeeper had never returned since she left the previous day. At that moment, the door burst open and Grandma entered the room, her face a mask of fury. Clearly outraged by the news of betrayal, Grandma's tone was one of righteous anger. Grandma was concerned about the violation of their family's basic ideals and, as a result, pledged to take care of the matter. Subsequently, Grandma praised Su Yun Lan, saying that it's rare to have someone like him in their family and that she couldn't let him be betrayed in this way. In response, Su Yun Lan told his grandmother that she was the only one he could rely on. The following day on the court, Su Yun Lan confronted the seventh prince with his bruised face. Suspiciously, the seventh prince doubted Su Yun Lan did something last night. At that moment, Judge Liang Ruohai silenced the court and ordered the guard to arrest Su Yun Lan and Princess Tang Ying. Confused, Su Yun Lan wondered why his wife was being brought to the court as well and questioned why his grandmother hadn't shown up yet. Judge Liang Ruohai then explained that Princess Tang Ying was suspected of treason for plotting with the border officers, forming parties for her personal gain, and attempting to gain control over the border military power. 
Moreover, he presented a letter found at the princess's house as evidence. However, some civilians expressed disbelief, stating that the princess had always been good to the people. Skeptical of the letter, Su Yun Lan accused the judge of writing it himself. Suddenly, the seventh prince spoke up, stating that he could prove the accusations with the help of the princess's maid, Kayun. At that moment, Grand Madong arrived at the court, and both the seventh prince and Judge Liang Ruohai welcomed her with respect. Intrigued, Su Yun Lan noticed the respectful behavior of Liang Ruohai and the seventh prince toward Mrs. Dong. Yuan Ying then revealed that Mrs. Dong was the founding general and the first general of the Tang Empire. Impressed, Su Yun Lan was in awe of her patron's family's power and influence. In court, Grand Madong reminded the judge that the Dong family was not at his mercy, and the Dong family head was correct. Additionally, Su Yun Lan spoke up, telling his grandmother that he had caught the maid leaving the seventh prince's mansion. Proudly, his grandmother praised him and called for Kei Yun, the maid. Guilty, Kei Yun admitted her mistake and begged for forgiveness. However, Grandma Dong was unforgiving and executed her with a sword. Shocked, Su Yun Lan thought that Grandma was worthy of being the founding general. Defending Su Yun Lan in court, Grandma Dong reminded them that the dynasty was neglecting the common people. She declared that Su Yun Lan's act of disrupting the iron refinery was actually for the people. Furthermore, she warned anyone who dared to harm Su Yun Lan that she was still skilled in sword fighting and wouldn't hesitate to use it. The civilians were impressed with the Dong family's commitment to fighting for the people, and Judge Liang Ruohai announced that Su Yun Lan was not guilty of disrupting the refinery. Grateful, Su Yun Lan praised his grandmother for her amazing leadership. At the seaside, Grandma Dong questioned Su Yun Lan about the present he had given. Su Yun Lan invited Grandma Dong to join him and Yuan Ying on their family beach, but Yuan Ying seemed hesitant about Su Yun Lan's swimwear. Nevertheless, Grandma Dong seemed unfazed and encouraged Yuan Ying that their family had nothing to be afraid of. Su Yun Lan told his wife not to be afraid since they were the only three there. Presenting a volcanic rock mask to Grand Madong, Su Yun Lan claimed that it had cleansing properties and could help her look more beautiful. He also offered a homemade smoothie that tasted like orange, which he recommended for the summer season. While Su Yun Lan was putting sunscreen on Yuan Ying's back, he received a coded message from He Yan. He informed Grandma that he needed to step away for a moment. Su Yun Lan then headed to the Demon Clan Hall, where He Yan informed him about the Demon Lord's key deviation during cultivation and that he needed immediate treatment to survive. Surprised, Su Yun Lan requested He Yan to arrange a meeting with his father. However, He Yan informed him that Fu Lanqi had taken the Holy Fire token of the Demon King and was not allowing anyone near the ice cellar where the Demon King had retreated. Determined, Su Yun Lan stated that no one could stop him, as he was the Demon King's son. Inside the Demon King's mansion, Su Yun Lan confronted Fu Lanqi, demanding to see his father. Fu Lanqi explained that, by the Demon King's orders, no one was allowed to disturb his cultivation during this critical time. A member of the cult joined in, questioning Su Yun Lan's intentions and warning him not to harm the Demon King. Su Yun Lan wondered if the only person he could trust was himself, as the Demon Cult was in chaos, and he had to find out the truth. At the Black Rider training ground, Yuan Ying questioned Su Yun Lan's desire to meet Yahoo. Su Yun Lan responded that he needed to hear from someone as loyal as Yahoo to understand what was going on. When they confronted Yahoo, he remained silent and continued training soldiers. Frustrated with Yahoo's lack of cooperation, Yuan Ying drew her sword, ready to force Yahoo to talk. However, Yahoo effortlessly blocked her attacks with his trident. Unyielding, Yahoo told them that he only answered to the Holy Fire Spirit, and if they wanted answers, they would need to use the Holy Fire token. Yuan Ying then threatened to beat Yahoo until he gave them the information they needed. Brandishing her sword, Su Yun Lan tried to stop his wife. After a stick of incense, Su Yun Lan realized that Yahoo, despite his deadly moves, was holding back and refusing to answer their questions directly. He also questioned Yahoo's loyalty, as he was training soldiers instead of guarding his father's seclusion and his claim of recognizing the Holy Fire Order was considered a joke. As Su Yun Lan sensed something amiss, he halted his wife and expressed his doubts. He informed her that Uncle Yahu was unwilling to speak, proposing that they should return and plan their next move. On Demon Cult Mountain, He Yan proudly presented the freshly baked blind box of gossip to the masked clan members, emphatically remarking that it couldn't be sold for a mere 80 cents. One member commented on the surprisingly cheap price, while others eagerly asked to see it. Upon confirming its contents, they laughed heartily, 
and shared gossip, ranging from scandalous rumors about the head of Black Cloud City's homosexuality to embarrassing bathroom incidents. They even joked about Commander Yahoo's peculiar love for eating sweet potatoes while farting. One member enthusiastically shared gossip about the new left ambassador being buried in research due to heartbreak. As the members bickered and playfully accused each other of various crimes related to gossip, including one about Jang San wiping his feces on Lai Si's shirt, he Yan marveled at the undeniable power of gossip. Eventually, Fu Lanky interrupted the lively bickering of the clan and called them bastards. He Yan smirked with satisfaction as the plan succeeded. At that precise moment, Su Yun Lan stealthily sneaked into Demon Cult Mountain to see his father. When he was about to open the back door, he suddenly got chills and was surprised by his uncle Chu Ki. Su Yun Lan looked back and stumbled over his words, mentioning the name of Chu Ki. He then earnestly requested to see his father, but Chu Ki informed him that his father had asked him to leave a letter for him instead. In the letter, Su Yun Lan's father reassuringly conveyed that he was fine and simply needed to seclude himself and train for the future. Chu Qi smiled warmly and warned Su Yun Lan not to get caught again in the future but agreed to keep his secret this time. Grateful, Su Yun Lan thanked him and left. Later, the back door opened, revealing the seventh prince. The seventh prince expressed his admiration for the mysterious mister's brilliant plan and firmly believed that with his help, he could become the lord of the Tang dynasty. Chu Qi responded modestly, stating that he was flattered. Unexpectedly, Su Yun Lan reappeared in the form of a squirrel, quietly spectating them from a distance. It was then that he discovered his uncle Chu Qi had betrayed his father. At the demon cult mountain, He Yan accuses Fu Lanky of stealing the Holy Fire Order to conceal the demon lord Ma Zun's whereabouts. He then inquires of the group who else is on their side. Unexpectedly, one of the eight clan men responds by saying that, in the past, everyone would have revealed the secrets of the paper. Meanwhile, Fu Lanky mockingly derides the eight clan group and their department, which was personally established by the young master, stating that it was far-sighted. Concurrently, a member wearing a mask notices something in the sky and points it out, revealing that it's a kite adorned with the face of Fu Lanky wearing makeup. Upon seeing this, both He Yan and an eight clan member react by vomiting and He Yan questions if Fu Lanky is attempting to make them sick. Fu Lanky responds with a sinister laugh, proclaiming that they will understand later. He then snaps his fingers, causing the kite to explode. Suddenly, some masked members exclaim that they smell something fragrant and pleasant, which others seem to enjoy. He Yan, surprised, asks if they have never smelled deodorant before. However, the situation takes a turn for the worse as a member of the demon clan transforms into a cursed demon, losing control and attacking the eight clan member and He Yan. The eight clan men urgently yell at He Yan to flee, explaining that it's as if the demon masks have transformed into cursed demons themselves. In response, He Yan quickly becomes serious and assaults the cursed demon with his palm, while the eight clan man elaborates that they have been cursed and have lost their spiritual consciousness. He suggests that they should sprint to the top of the hill, where the terrain is more complex, in hopes of evading the cursed demon. Later on, He Yan and the other eight clan members find themselves in a cave, possibly after escaping danger. However, one of his members morphs into a demon and prepares to attack He Yan. Just then, Su Yun Lan appears out of nowhere and employs his technique on the cursed member for a brief moment before returning to his body. He Yan feels relieved that Su Yun Lan has arrived in time and inquires if Su Yun Lan was able to locate Ma Zun. Unfortunately, Su Yun Lan discloses that he didn't find him but instead uncovered a shocking secret. Amidst the chaos, Fu Lanky commands that they be searched. Recognizing the danger, Su Yun Lan cautions that it's not safe to remain in this location for an extended period and proposes finding a secure place first. Puzzled, He Yan asks where they should go. In response, Su Yun Lan proudly smiles and tells him that he is merely a little boy who has been spoiled by his grandmother. In the palace hall, the seventh prince entered and respectfully paid homage to the royal majesty. The royal majesty inquired as to why the seventh prince had visited the demon sect, which had been in turmoil recently. The seventh prince proceeded to explain that the Piao Fu Wang incident was instigated by Su Yun Lan, who had sent his subordinate. He Yan, to provoke the children of the demon cult and slander the new left envoy Fu Lanky. Furthermore, he mentioned that Su Yun Lan interfered with the demon retreat, but the children had fortunately arrived in time to avert any difficulties. Continuing on, the seventh prince detailed how Su Yun Lan had destroyed the iron smelting factory, which had been licensed by the emperor, and subsequently disrupted the demon sect. He concluded that Su Yun Lan was a curse and should be apprehended. Agreeing with this assessment, the royal majesty ordered the seventh prince to capture Su Yun Lan himself. 
The seventh prince smirked and agreed as he took his leave from the palace hall. Meanwhile, at the princess's mansion, a soldier reported to the seventh prince that they had been unable to locate Su Yun Lan within the premises. Surprised, the seventh prince sought clarification, only to learn that they couldn't find the princess or the youngest prince either. Alarmed, the seventh prince deduced that they must be hiding at the Dong mansion. He instructed the soldier to accompany him, indicating his intention to investigate the Dong mansion as well. Upon arriving at the Dong Mansion, the seventh prince introduced himself and explained that he was acting under orders from the emperor to apprehend Su Yun Lan, requesting their cooperation. However, Grandma Dong responded insolently, and the seventh prince's horse was suddenly startled, causing him to fall. As the seventh prince rose to his feet and cursed his horse, Mrs. Dong brandished the founding sword, asserting that even the emperor must kneel before it. Instantly, the seventh prince and his soldiers knelt. However, Mrs. Dong quickly changed the subject, chastising the prince for repeatedly embarrassing her family's boy. The prince attempted to defend himself, stating that he was merely following orders to arrest Su Yun Lan. Unmoved, Grandma lashed out at him with her sword, narrowly missing him, and suggested they go to the princess mansion instead. Still, the prince insisted that Su Yun Lan might be hiding at the Dong mansion. Growing angrier, Mrs. Dong forcefully pushed him, causing him to fly back a short distance and sustain injuries from the impact. The prince realized that she remained powerful even after all these years. Mrs. Dong fixed an intense gaze upon him and ordered him to leave, swinging her sword in an attempt to slice the prince. Stunned, the seventh prince acknowledged that Mrs. Dong was as formidable as ever. Grandma Dong commanded everyone to depart and never return, a command the soldiers obeyed. Subsequently, within the Dong mansion, Su Yun Lan expressed his admiration for Grandma Dong's unwavering faith in him. Dismissing his praise, she claimed she could easily see through him, adding that Yuan Ying also trusted him. Following their conversation, Yuan Ying chimed in, pointing out that hiding was not a viable solution, and that they needed to determine the nature of the incense powder they had discovered in the demon sect. Su Yun Lan concurred, asserting that he must also find his father's whereabouts. Suddenly, a member of the eight clans entered the room, informing Su Yun Lan that they had at last uncovered the reason behind Lao Ba's loss of control. Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan found themselves in a heated argument about the investigation. Yuan Ying firmly informed Su Yun Lan that he was not permitted to investigate. Nevertheless, Su Yun Lan disagreed, asserting that since the matter involved the demon cult, and as the young master of the demon cult, he was obliged to go. In response, Yuan Ying countered that the fragrance powder, which had impacted the children of the demon cult, had originated from Yi Chun Yuan. Consequently, Su Yun Lan could not go. Instead, she volunteered to go on his behalf, emphasizing the danger posed by the officers and soldiers outside. However, Su Yun Lan remained unconvinced and argued that he was not a man who would merely hide behind his wife. Additionally, he underscored the danger of Yi Chun Yuan, a place notorious for its fireworks. Eventually, Su Yun Lan relented and agreed to heed Yuan Ying's advice. He pledged not to interfere and asked the eight clans to investigate in his place. Yuan Ying smiled, relieved that he had finally agreed to the arrangement. On the night of Yi Hong Yuan, Yuan Ying, disguised as a man, was greeted by a woman. This woman showered compliments on Yuan Ying's appearance and inquired if it was her first time at the establishment. The woman then boasted about the girls at the venue, which piqued Yuan Ying's interest. Expressing her curiosity in the young girls, Yuan Ying asked the woman to take her there. The woman suggested that it was the perfect time for Yuan Ying to visit Yi Chun Academy, as they had a new dancer who was sure to impress her. She then invited Yuan Ying into a private room. Shortly after, the woman informed her that the new girl would arrive soon. While waiting for the dancer, Yuan Ying began investigating the room for any clues or evidence. She ceased her search when she heard a knock on the door. As the new dancer entered, Yuan Ying concealed her face with a fan. The dancer greeted her and complimented her appearance. Yuan Ying inquired if she was the new dancer and requested a dance. In response, the new dancer showcased her dancing skills. However, during the performance, she devised a plan to put Yuan Ying to sleep. On the other hand, Yuan Ying, disappointed with the dancer's performance, also concocted a plan to take advantage of the dancer's proximity and knock her out. As they simultaneously struck each other, they snatched the coverings from their faces, revealing their true identities and expressing surprise. In the following moments, Yuan Ying, clearly annoyed, questioned Su Yun Lan, whom she had mistaken for one of the eight clans meant to investigate the area. 
It turned out that Su Yun Lan had also disguised himself, this time as a dancer. Liu Yin grabbed his dress, accusing him of acting for personal gain and calling him a girl. Su Yun Lan defended himself, denying the accusations and explaining that he had merely dressed up as a woman. Infuriated, Liu Yin held a pair of scissors, asking if he wanted to become the second he Yan as she threatened to cut him. Yuan Ying and Su Yun Lan are searching for clues related to the demon cult in Yi Chun Yuan. After rummaging through a room, they find nothing. Su Yun Lan suggests continuing the search. As they walk through the corridor, they encounter two men who stare at them. Su Yun Lan pulls out his scissors while grinding, teasing at what they are seeing, and the men run away in fear. In the first room, they find two people doing something, whom they knock down. However, Yuan Ying recognizes one of them as a minister of the state of Tang who has a wife. She is angry at his immoral behavior, but Su Yun Lan reminds her of their main goal. They realize that they won't find any clues in that room and decide to move on to the next one. In the second room, they find another couple playing a game, and in the third room, they find two men doing something inappropriate. Yuan Ying is too angry and expresses her frustration, declaring her intention to lead the soldiers and take down the place. Su Yun Lan tries to calm her down and tells her not to be angry. As they talk in the hallway, a woman passes them, and Su Yun Lan catches a whiff of her fragrance. He is intrigued by the scent and asks Yuan Ying if she smells the fragrance too. Su Yun Lan approaches the woman and compliments her on her good skin and pleasant aroma. The woman teases him, suggesting that she only wants the powder for herself. However, the woman decides to give him directions and tells him to ask Zhao Mumu, who should be in the utility room at that time. Su Yun Lan thanks the woman for her help. In the utility room, they meet a man who offers them the powder they are looking for. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan pulls out a knife and puts it to the man's neck, asking him if he is the one responsible for making the powder. The man confirms that he is, and Su Yun Lan asks him about the seventh prince. The man reveals that he was forced to make the powder because his sister was taken hostage by the seventh prince. He also reveals that the Happy Spring Courtyard is a place for the children of the demon sect, and the seventh prince had instructed him to add something strange to the powder. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan gives his special golden sore medicine to heal the man's wounds and offers him some medicine for his wounds. The man apologizes again, but Su Yun Lan responds that he should not be worried and promises to protect him. The man offers to do anything Su Yun Lan asks of him and informs them that the powder is being sent to the palace. Yuan Ying is surprised and mentions that in a few days it will be the king's birthday, and it turns out that the seventh prince is planning to rebel. Meanwhile, in an unknown place, Yahoo informs demon lord Mazen that Su Yun Lan is now wanted by the royal family, and the demon sect is in disarray. Yehu appears anxious and worried about the situation, but Mazen tries to calm him down and tells Yehu not to be so anxious and explains that this is what Su Yun Lan needs to experience. Su Yun Lan, disguised as a woman, walks with Yuan Ying and the valets to the royal palace. Yuan Ying admires Su Yun Lan's appearance, but Su expresses concern about being seen. However, the valets, with their unimpressive looks, comment that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yuan Ying explains that they are there to celebrate her father's birthday and warns Su Yun Lan to be careful not to reveal his identity. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan feels a chill, and a person announces the arrival of the second prince with his wife. Su Yun Lan asks about the second prince, and the valet explains that the second prince is known for being infatuated with his wife and never leaving her side but that his wife has recently died. Su Yun Lan is shocked by the news. At that moment, the second prince approaches Yuan Ying and informs her that their sister feels unwell in her inner body, so he has brought a gift on her behalf. Yuan Ying questions whether it is appropriate to bring the gift on the birthday of the emperor, as their father may not be happy with it. As the second prince glances in Su Yun Lan's direction, Su Yun Lan's thought interrupts, and he asks if his women's clothing is so talented that it can even captivate the most infatuated man in the world. The second prince comments to Yuan Ying that the girl by her side makes the emperor unhappy. Yuan Ying is taken aback and asks the second prince to clarify what he meant. The second prince decides to leave and says he hopes the emperor will be welcoming after all. Su Yun Lan remarks on how each of the dragon's nine sons is different, comparing the second prince to a python lurking in the dark. Yuan Ying agrees that he is hard to read but assures Su Yun Lan that his identity should not be revealed in the palace due to the second prince's character. Meanwhile, inside the palace, the royal majesty is enjoying a dance performance when Chu Qi approaches and presents him with a gift, an immortality pill from overseas. The emperor is thrilled and praises Chu Qi's thoughtfulness. Su Yun Lan senses something is off, and the seventh prince suddenly steps forward and announces that he wants to add to his father's happiness. The father wonders if the seventh prince is prepared to surprise him. The seventh prince then points to Su Yun Lan and accuses him of being a dignified man of Tang, dressing up as a woman and attending the celebration with a hidden agenda. Su Yun Lan is caught off guard by the sudden accusation. 
Su Yunlan explained that he had come to serve the kingdom and that the rebellion of the demon cult had been caused by his carelessness, but fortunately, it had been harmless. He bowed down to his knees and revealed that he had been studying in the western region for the emperor's upcoming birthday to present him with a gift. The emperor was intrigued and asked to see the gift. Su Yunlan then performed his show on a bicycle, juggling fortune cookies, and the audience was amazed. The fortune cookies popped, and a moth flew out of each of them. Su Yunlan whistled, and the moths turned into golden dragons. He then wished the emperor a long life. The emperor was impressed and expressed his enjoyment of the performance, even wanting to keep the moths in the palace. Su Yun recalled the time when he had received a box of 100 moths from the eight men, who claimed to have collected them from the garbage dump. Returning to the present situation, the royal majesty remarked on the distinct yet unfamiliar scent of the moths, and Su Yunlan was relieved that the king found it pleasing. The emperor then invited Su Yunlan to sit beside him and forget about the demon sect incidents for the day, praising his filial piety. Su Yunlan thanked him. At that moment, Grandma Mrs. Dong was listening to everything from the roof and was happy to see Su Yunlan's success. The seventh prince interrupted the celebration, claiming to have a final gift for the emperor. He ordered his soldier to bring a beautiful woman named Xiang, who then danced gracefully and captivated the royal majesty with her fragrance. The seventh prince claimed that she was a unique woman who deserved to belong only to the great emperor himself. Su Yunlan noticed that she had a plum blossom birthmark on her neck and then recalled the time when he had asked the man in the utility room how to identify his sister. The man had told him that his sister had a plum blossom birthmark on the back of her neck and shared a secret passcode. Su Yunlan then suspected that Zhang might be his missing sister. The royal majesty called out to a beautiful dancer, asking her to come to him. Dancer Zhang approached and offered him a drink, to which the royal majesty complimented her beauty and the way she made him feel. He confessed that he had never felt this way about a woman before and expressed his desire for her to accept him despite his age. Dancer Zhang cried, remembering her brother who was enslaved by the seventh prince. She then agreed to become the royal majesty's special concubine. The majesty was pleased with her response and decided to have a day of peace, inviting everyone to join. However, the seventh prince interrupted, stating that Su Yun Lan, who was not a convicted criminal, could not be simply let go. He proposed that Su Yun Lan undergo a month of recultivation of his morality to prove himself worthy of being welcomed into the seventh prince's family. The royal majesty asked Yun Lan what he thought, but Yuan Ying disagreed with it. However, Su Yun Lan interrupted his wife and agreed to the proposal, expressing his gratitude to the seventh prince for giving him the chance to change. Su Yun Lan thought that staying by the seventh prince's side was a brilliant opportunity to learn about each other. The seventh prince told him that if he was interested, then he could come with him, which Su Yun Lan agreed to. The seventh prince wondered about the virtuous and generous man he was and what the future of the kingdom held. Su Yun Lan had an evil plan mentioning catching a new batch of cockroaches as a gift for the seventh prince. The seventh prince felt something itchy and was disgusted when he saw a cockroach on his shoulder. He pleaded with Su Yun Lan to help him kill it. Su Yun Lan instantly smacked the seventh prince on the head. It became chaotic as Su Yun Lan tried to catch the cockroach and eventually beat the seventh prince with his boot. After a while, the seventh prince fainted from the repeated smacking by Su Yun Lan. He wondered why these kinds of things only happened to him. The crowd around them started laughing at the situation. The seventh prince then decided to leave and invited Su Yun Lan to come with him to his mansion to show him how to improve. Su Yun Lan then looked to Yuan Ying and told him to relax and wait for his news. Meanwhile, after the party, a noblewoman and her maidservant discussed the special concubine that had caught the emperor's attention. The noblewoman was curious about the fragrance that the concubine was wearing and demanded to know more about it. The maidservant revealed that the concubine was wearing a particular face powder, which had become a hot commodity within the palace. The noblewoman was angry and demanded that the maidservant buy some for her immediately. The maidservant hurried off to get the face powder. Meanwhile, the seventh prince was pleased with the effectiveness of his plan and believed it would aid his plans. However, he quickly shifted his attention to Su Yun Lan, seeing it as a chance to have him under his control, and decided to play with him. Su Yun Lan was summoned by the seventh prince and he thought that the prince might be trying to play some trick on him. The seventh prince reminded Su Yun Lan, as one of his sons-in-law, that they had not yet passed the tests of ritual, music, shooting, writing, poetry, and mathematics. He implied that this was the reason for his domineering character. Then, he told him that he was a servant but should also be up to standard, and from that day onwards, he would test him. The seventh prince thought about how he could make Su Yun Lan pay the price, as he had to pay a grand tutor to barely pass the six arts in the past. 
The seventh prince began to explain to Su Yun Lan that music encompasses both music and dance. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan interrupted and started to pose and dance. The seventh prince was startled and asked Su Yun Lan about his costume. Su Yun Lan just didn't mind and started to sing and dance in freestyle and even did some breakdancing. He sang about drawing a dragon on the left and a rainbow on the right. Su Yun Lan thought about how he was a diehard fan of hip hop. The seventh prince was amazed by Su Yun Lan's performance. The seventh prince acknowledged Su Yun Lan's dance and music skills, but advised him not to mention dragons so casually, as they were considered the noblest beings in the world. After that moment, the seventh prince announced that the shooting test was about to begin, and they must hit a man made of grass 100 meters away with a bow, an arrow to pass the test. Su Yun Lan expressed his desire to shoot birds flying in the sky instead of men made of grass. The seventh prince was surprised and wondered if he was hiding his true abilities. Su Yun Lan then proceeded to aim and shoot at a bird, hitting it successfully. The seventh prince was astonished, and Su Yun Lan confidently said, Next. On the next test, Su Yun Lan rode on a horse. He thought that riding was the god of autumn mountain riding. Shifting to the next test, Su Yun Lan then recited some poetry, talking about apes and birds while melancholy thoughts filled his mind. He also mentioned bitter hatred in a cup before concluding that a famous poet's work was not perfect. A group of old men were stunned to hear such an old poem from Su Yun Lan and wondered how the emperor's son-in-law could be so knowledgeable. After that moment, the seventh prince posed a math problem to Su Yun Lan, which he solved effortlessly. The prince was impressed and invited him to follow him. A lady urged the prince to wash his hands, and some ladies threw lotus petals as they chanted. Su Yun Lan was puzzled by this and wondered what it meant. As they continued their journey, they were greeted by twin ladies, which made Su Yun Lan question the seventh prince's actions. The prince replied that knowing when to give up and showing dignity were important in life. He left Su Yun Lan behind and went off. The twin ladies around him cheered and sang songs about waves and rivers. Su Yun Lan stifled laughter, realizing that the seventh prince just came there to poop and thought that the lives of the rich were always exciting and never dull. After that, the seventh prince ordered Su Yun Lan to clean the toilet as a form of appreciation for his skills. Su Yun Lan was shocked by the request and asked if he had to clean the toilet. Su Yun Lan reluctantly accepted the task but was confused about where to flush the contents of the toilet. He found the whole situation strange. Su Yun Lan is thrilled that his mission is accomplished after cleaning. He sees a beautiful dancer and questions if she is Xiang Fei. After that moment, Su Yun Lan disguises himself, covering his face with a hood. He exclaims that this is a once-in-a-lifetime chance, then jumps from the roof and is quickly discovered by the soldiers guarding the area. In a swift move, Su Yun Lan smacks one of the guards, sending him flying into the wall with such force that it crumbles upon impact. The other guard is shocked by Su Yun Lan's attack but calls out to his comrade, Lao Ling, who has been thrown by the wall. Su Yun Lan assures the guards that they are disposable, then grabs the head of the other guard and smacks it to the ground. He then proceeds to walk toward the room where Xiang Fei is. Upon entering the room, Su Yun Lan addresses Xiang Fei, commenting on the nervousness he senses in her movements. Xiang Fei is surprised and questions his identity and warns him that trespassing in the area is punishable by death. Su Yun Lan reveals his identity and responds that it is not a crime for him to be there and informs her that he knows about her and the seventh prince's plot. Zhang Fei is surprised to see that it is the prince's consort, Su, and she quickly denies his accusations, but Su Yun Lan persists and questions her involvement with the incense that was used to harm others. He accuses her of being a monster and having no heart. Zhang Fei retorts that her heart fled a long time ago. Su Yun Lan then shows the bracelet to her and says that it can help her to find her heart again. Xiang Fei says that it was a token of love from her brother Meng, which makes Su Yun Lan gasp as he thinks it sounds like incest. Xiang Fei demands to know more about her brother's whereabouts. Su Yun Lan reassures her that her brother is not dead and asks for information about the seventh prince's plot. Meanwhile, in the village, as the villagers gather, the spies of Su Yun Lan rumor about the amazing new girl in the palace who has a unique fragrance that has enthralled the emperor. One of the spies mentions that his cousin who works as a maid there said everyone is rushing to buy the fragrance she uses. Yu and Ying and Mrs. Dong are riding on a horse, rushing as they pass by the villagers. They pour a fragrance scent that makes everyone stop and take notice. The villagers are amazed by the fragrance and feel sudden improvements in their physical abilities. Some even claim to have regained their sight. As everyone marvels at the fragrance, Fragrance, a person then tells everyone to look at the dead tree, and mentions that it could bring the dead back to life. 
The villagers are fascinated and desperate to buy it, and the eight men sneak into the crowd and mention that the prince's consort sold it at a factory. At that moment, Yu and Ying and Mrs. Dong stop their horses, and their spies report to them that the young master's plan of targeted advertisement was a success. Yu and Ying is skeptical of the perfume's supposed healing powers and wonders how Su Yunlan managed to create such a demand for it. Su Yunlan explains that it was all part of their plan and that if they succeed in their performance, they can make the perfume the most popular in the kingdom. Meanwhile, the seventh prince realizes that he needs to speed up the progress of his plan and requests the sedan chair as he will go to the palace. Two young twins were talking about Nai and Hua Palace. The first twin mentioned that a maid who had worked there for over ten years went mad and attacked concubine Hua with scissors. The second twin expressed shock and mentioned that it seemed like the favored concubine Zhang was a bad omen. Meanwhile, at the prince's seventh residence, he and the seventh prince were discussing the powder that was used to disfigure concubine Hua. The seventh prince revealed that the powder was part of a plan that was proceeding smoothly, and suggested they bring some of it to He. He promised to make him a chief eunuch if he could distribute the powder to the whole palace. He expressed gratitude and said he would go to the Saw family first since they had already bought so much of the powder. After he left the seventh prince's residence, he removed his mask and revealed himself to be He Yan. Su Yunlan complimented He Yan on his acting. He Yan informed Su Yunlan that the perfume made with the powder had become popular, and the seventh prince was becoming anxious. They planned to swap the powder with the perfume and give it to concubine Zhang who would secretly help them out. They also remained vigilant about the seventh prince's next moves. On the next day, in the palace, the seventh prince greeted his father, the royal majesty, and was invited to sit next to him. The seventh prince became frightened when he saw his father playing with his moths. He then asked about his father's relationship with concubine Zhang and was relieved to hear that she had won his father's heart. He also mentioned the problem that had occurred in the hall of concubine Hua, and offered to help his father with any worries he might have. The royal majesty expressed his concern about the incident but said he was too busy to look into it himself. He also mentioned his intention to make Zhang the head concubine and let her help manage the harem. The seventh prince was impressed by his father's decision and offered to help him out. The royal majesty agreed and asked the seventh prince to find concubine Zhang and bring her to him. In return, his father promised to make him the commander of the imperial army after the ceremony to promote Zhang. The seventh prince agreed and thanked his father, thinking that the old man had finally made it happen. The next day, the canonization ceremony took place. The minister announced that since Xiang had entered the palace, she had followed all the rules, got along with the rest of the harem, and assisted the queen in managing the harem. As a result, he declared that Xiang would be granted the title of head concubine. The royal majesty expressed that he had finally met a girl whom he couldn't take his eyes off. Xiang Fei was given the title of head concubine. However, Zhang Fei thought about the emperor, calling him a creep. The seventh prince laughs, and the royal majesty becomes enraged and asks why the prince is standing on a high platform. The soldiers then rush into the room, and the royal majesty is confused and asks what is happening. Suddenly, the seventh prince kicks the royal majesty, causing him to vomit blood. The minister catches the royal majesty from falling and accuses the seventh prince of being an unfilial son and possibly wanting to rebel. The seventh prince laughs and confirms that he is rebelling today. The majesty shows frustration and continues to taunt the seventh prince and threaten him that the royal guards are there now, but the prince is undeterred and responds with laughter. The imperial guards arrive, and the royal majesty boasts that the prince won't be able to act so arrogantly in front of them. The seventh prince challenges this notion and orders his soldier to kill a few ministers as a reminder to the old man. A group of janissaries suddenly attacks the minister, and the majesty is surprised by this. The seventh prince reveals that the janissaries are under his control and asks him how long he will be able to endure. Chu Qi is surprised by the quick mobilization of the seventh prince. Suddenly, the second prince shows up with Yu and Ying, tries to calm the situation, and offers to ask their father to give the seventh prince a lighter punishment. But the seventh prince laughs it off, saying that both he and the second prince want the throne. He insults the majesty, calling him weak and addicted to women, making him unfit to lead the country. Yu Ying speaks up and warns the seventh prince not to act rashly. The seventh prince acknowledges her strength but orders his men to bring up Su. The seventh prince offers to trade Su's life for an unfilial son and then asks if anyone else is not convinced. Amidst the chaos, Grandma Mrs. Dong appears and urges her soldiers to attack and take down all the guards, and they respond with enthusiasm. The Dong soldiers then proceed to kill all the seventh prince's guards on the spot, leaving the seventh prince himself surprised at their strength. Mrs. Dong explains that her family's children were sent to the front lines to fight for three years when they became adults, while the seventh prince's guards remained in the imperial capital and were thus weak in comparison. The seventh prince was not deterred, however, and revealed a surprise attack involving kites with powder that he claimed would turn everyone into his walking dead. 
After the kites exploded, they only released pepper dust, which made everyone sneeze, and the guards expressed their confusion about not feeling anything. Despite expecting to become walking dead, the seventh prince enters and asks why they haven't been affected. Su Yunlan smirks and reveals that everyone has moved on to fragrance water. The seventh prince is surprised and asks how Su Yunlan knows about his plan and Su Yunlan reveals that he knew all along and even had a backup plan. Suddenly, Xiao Fi appears and reveals that he was the one who found out about the plan and saved Brother Meng from being blackmailed. Su Yunlan taunts, saying he has no more cards to play, and the prince becomes angry, threatening to kill him. As he goes to attack Su Yunlan with his sword, someone stops him by merely placing their finger on the blade. Su Yunlan looks up and recognizes the person as someone he knows, expressing his surprise. Hu Qi is the one who stops the blade and uses his technique to blow off the head of the seventh prince. He then speaks to the people, urging them not to panic, and claims to have killed the rebels. He explains that Chu's false surrender was only a ploy to weed out those disloyal to the Tang dynasty. Chu Qi asserts that the demon soldiers and horses were intended only to fight back against the seventh prince's imperial guards at a crucial moment. He reminds the majesty of a past event when he gifted an elixir with a secret compartment containing Chu's plan to prove his innocence, and the majesty knew about it early on. The royal majesty expresses surprise and wonders what Chu is saying. However, the majesty shrugs and admits that he knew about the plan all along but had only just cooperated with Chu. Back when the royal highness had opened the box gifted by Chu, inside, there was a letter that said the seventh prince had rebelled against Chu and let the snake out. Dong's soldiers comment on Chu's extraordinary skills, and Yuan Ying asks Su Yunlan if he has any problems. Su Yunlan replies that he has no problems. After the commotion, Su Yunlan remarks that Chu Qi's trick was clever and had made him a hero to the audience. He then asks if anyone else noticed the similarity between the seventh prince's death and someone else's. At the back of them, where the second prince is mysteriously smirking and saying that the show is about to start. Later on, Su Yunlan tells He Yan to go back to the demon sect and keep an eye on Chu Qi. He Yan agrees and thinks about how sharp Su Yunlan's mind is and how much he resembles his young master. On the other hand, Su Yunlan then offers to take Xiang Fei to see her brother, Meng. Xiang Fei is excited at the prospect of seeing her brother and mentions wanting to touch his thin and soft cheeks and feel his hardships during his lonely days. Su Yunlan finds her comments strange and asks her not to be weird. After a while, Meng and Xiang Fei see each other. Xiang Fei expresses her guilt over causing her brother's injuries, but Meng reassures her that being with her is worth any hardship he has faced. Su Yunlan then enters with his poker face looking at both of them with a strange expression, and at that moment, Meng Fei thanks him for his help in reuniting them. Su Yunlan states that he should be the one thanking them. Xiang Fei asks Yunlan to inform the majesty that she will leave as a butterfly flew away from her cocoon. Yunlan agrees and asks them what their plan is. Meng reveals that they used to sell sesame seed cakes in the western region but moved to the Tang imperial capital for a better life. However, they now feel there is no place for them there and plan to return to their second brother, who is a famous knight in the western regions. Su Yunlan asks Meng about his second younger brother, and Meng proudly replies that his brother is a famous knight in the western region who once defeated a bear with his bare hands to save people. His brother later joined a five-man team and became a disciple of a monk. Upon his return, he inherited Tongfu Cavern, where they now sell wares. Su Yunlan finds this information familiar and agrees to send them off to the western regions the next day. Meng and Xiang Fei express their gratitude to Su Yunlan. After that moment, in Dong House, Su Yunlan asks He Yan how it went. He Yan responds, telling him that Chu Qi is as expected and that there is something wrong with him. He then drops a bombshell, revealing that he saw the masked man who had escaped from the hands of the demon king previously. This causes Su Yunlan to be shocked, asking He Yan if Chu Qi is related to the bloody skull. Su Yunlan then wonders what happened and expresses feeling chills running up his back. Masked man and Chu Qi were having a conversation about someone who was sent to spy on them. Chu Qi said that it was not a problem and that he wanted the person to know that he would inherit the demon sect now that the demon king was away. He then bowed and spoke to the majesty about his sister, saying that she had done a good job helping others and the military and was worthy of taking the Lai Chu examination. Meanwhile, in the princess's residence, Yuan Ying spoke to Yun Lan and thanked him for saving her father while cleaning his face. She thought that Yun Lan, once a small name within the demon sect, had now become a household hero. Su Yunlan replied by saying that they were family, so there was no need for Yuan Ying to be polite. Suddenly, Su Yunlan grabbed Yuan Ying's wrist and got closer to her face, but someone knocked on the door and interrupted the moment, and they awkwardly avoided each other's faces. Yuan Ying asked Yunlan to go and deal with it first. Su Yunlan's frustration was evident as a member of the Eight Clan ruined the good moment. He just awkwardly laughed it off and thanked Yuan Ying for her help. He then asked the ape man what had happened, and the ape man responded that there was a problem with the demon sect. 
two factions led by the envoy of He Yan were facing off. Yun Lan was shocked and said that he would be there immediately. At Demon's Mountain, Fu Lank and He Yan were arguing about who should inherit the leadership of the sect. Chu Qi expressed his desire to show people how he runs the sect and criticized the infighting among the children of the demon sect. Su Yun Lan suggested that Chu Qi take over the position with a sly smile, suspecting Chu Qi's desire for power. Chu Qi denied it, praised Su Yun Lan, and acknowledged his suitability. However, he thought that the situation was amusing and saw love for everyone in the sect. He proposed to Su Yun Lan that if he could do one thing, the position of the demon king would naturally become his. Su Yun Lan asked what he meant, and suddenly, Chu Qi demonstrated his power, causing the sky to darken and thunder to strike the ground. Chu Qi revealed his great mountain defense formation, the five elements, and seven rainbows, which had protected the demon sect for over a hundred years. However, it urgently required the five legendary elements, gold, earth, water, fire, and wood. He and protested, warning that obtaining these elements would be extremely dangerous, but Fu Lank taunted him. Su Yunlan declared that he was willing to risk his life for the sake of the demon sect, whether or not he would become the demon king. Chu Qi agreed to give them 10 days to retrieve the elements before the great masters of the demon sect made their decision. In Princess Mansion, Yu and Ying expressed her concern and surprise about the dangerous quest that Su Yun Lan had agreed to. Su Yun Lan explained that he must firmly hold the position of the demon king to prevent falling under someone's command before he could find his father. Lai Tang intervened, asking Su Yun Lan to clarify his statement about the legendary golden element and recalled seeing something similar before. Lai Tang and Su Yun Lan arrived at a gambling house where they had first met. Lai Tang explained that he had not loved gambling before, but since he had become highly ranked, the gambling house had been very polite to him and had even shown him one of the town's great treasures, a golden toad. Lai Tang revealed that the golden toad was the reason why the gambling house continued to operate in the city, despite the actions of the seventh prince. He and expressed disapproval of gambling, but Lai Tang begged for forgiveness and promised to change his ways. Su Yun Lan, in thought, questioned their flirtatious behavior. He then asked who would take over the gambling house after the seventh prince's death. Lai Tang explained that the government was going to seize it but they had discovered an amazing water source behind it, so it had become official. Su Yun Lan realized that he would have to play it by ear, implying that he would need to adapt to the changing circumstances. As Lai Tang, Su Yun Lan, and Yi Yan entered the gambling house, people began to stare at them in their foreign suits. The other patrons commented on their strange attire and called them weirdos. The manager of the gambling house, Liu, approached them and asked if they were foreign officials. Su Yun Lan introduced themselves as visitors from a land far away called Las Vegas and explained that they had come to explore and see the famous gambling house. Liu was intrigued and offered to take them to the VIP room. In his thoughts, Su Yun Lan used his nine nether souls. He then possessed himself in the form of an ant and explained that, according to ancient texts, the golden toad is attracted to yin energy and sweet things, which ants share the same characteristics. He hoped that by possessing an ant and searching for sweet things, he would be able to find clues about the golden toad. After a while, the dice mistress arrived, and Su Yun Lan challenged her to a game. Su Yun Lan quickly rolled the dice and announced that it was a double, which caused the other people to laugh and question the claim since there were only three dice on the table. However, the dice mistress confirmed that there was indeed a double. She asked for Su Yun Lan's name and was intrigued by the group's identities as Gao Tui, Zhen Jianzi, and Liu Gui's Yang. She then asked Su Yun Lan how they wanted to play and what the ante would be. Su Yun Lan revealed a rainbow diamond and explained its value, and they agreed to roll the dice and compare the results. Su Yun Lan wanted the rainbow diamond in exchange for the precious golden toad as their offer in return. Su Yun Lan suggests playing dice with Liu to determine the winner of a rainbow diamond in exchange for the golden toad from Liu's casino. Liu is surprised that Su Yun Lan knows about the golden toad. But Su Yun Lan explains that he knows a lot about it and that his rainbow diamond is unique in the world. The dice mistress joins, telling the manager that only dice can beat her. Liu agrees but reminds her that the golden toad is a high requirement for the environment and cannot be easily moved out. Su Yun Lan suggests they play a game where they would try to guess each other's dice, and if someone failed to do so, they would win. As the dice mistress shook the dice, she began to suspect that Su Yun Lan was deliberately trying to lose. Liu, on the other hand, couldn't understand why Su Yun Lan would risk losing money by doing so. Su Yun Lan then confidently guessed 123, and the dice mistress revealed her own guess, 456. In the midst of the game, both Su Yun Lan and the dice mistress set open at the same time, revealing their dice to be the same number. Li was confused and couldn't believe it, but Su Yun Lan explained that even though the dice mistress had guessed correctly, she had still lost because of their earlier agreement. The dice mistress was surprised and confused, wondering how Su Yun Lan had managed to guess her answer correctly but wrong at the same time. 
Liu praised Su Yunlan's skills but then revealed that the Golden Toad was located far away, so he couldn't give it to them immediately. However, Su Yunlan called out to Giant Zai, who was to be Lai Tang's alias, and he kicked the wall, revealing the Golden Toad hidden behind it. Li was surprised. Ian explained that it was just a formality to ensure that Liu wouldn't be dishonest. After winning the game, Lai Tang compliments Su Yun Lan on his impressive skills in fooling the dice goddess. Su Yun Lan credits the 8th group, which apparently uses various creatures like snakes, mice, insects, and ants to assist them in their schemes. Lai Tang then asks Su Yun Lan about a technique he used to make Ian's chest appear a certain way, but Su Yun Lan scolds him for being inappropriate. Ian is confused and doesn't understand what they are talking about. Eight men reported to Su Yun Lan that, based on surveys, a wood-based product called Kai Bao was known as the Oriental Pearl. They claimed that it was commonly worn by regular people and could help maintain youthfulness for at least 10 years. Upon hearing this, Su Yun Lan was intrigued and asked where he could find it. The eight men informed him that they had found it, but they had heard that all the oriental pearls in the world were controlled by one person. Su Yun Lan was curious and asked who this person was, to which they responded that it was the second prince. At the second prince's residence, He Yan tells Su Yun Lan that the second prince went to the old forest to seek the oriental pearl to save his wife's body after she died in his early years. Su Yun Lan thinks the second prince is a decent person. But He Yan asks him if the second prince will help them. Su Yun Lan just smiled and shrugged, telling him that he wasn't sure since his wife was busy finding the water elemental treasure, and thinks that he will help them. Suddenly, a beautiful maiden greeted and asked Su Yun Lan and He Yan to sit inside as the second prince wanted to see them. Su Yun Lan and He Yan were surprised that the second prince knew they were there. As they strolled down the corridor, Su Yun Lan asked about the white curtains all over the area. The maiden shared that the second prince and his wife often walked that way and that his wife had a unique skin condition requiring sunlight exposure, but not direct sun contact, and these curtains gave her the perfect wind and sun shield. After a while, they saw the second prince where he was waiting and greeted Su Yun Lan, saying he had long wanted to get acquainted with him. Su Yun Lan apologized for intruding, but the second prince insisted that he was not intruding and had been waiting to meet him for a long time. Su Yun Lan thought that the second prince's power and charm had put him at ease, despite being on guard around most people, and also thought that he was weird. He then asked the second prince how he knew they were there, and the second prince explained that it was his wife's personal maid, Bai Zhu, who had had extraordinary six senses since childhood. Bai Zhu also said that she could hear Su Yun Lan's heartbeat. The second prince asked Bai Zhu to bring his box, to which Bai Zhu agreed. He expressed his desire to make friends with Su Yun Lan and wanted to give him a gift. He was uncertain about what to offer but decided to spare three or four oriental pearls. The second prince laughed and admired Su Yun Lan's wording. He assured him that he had enough beads for his wife and handed over the box to Bai Zhu. Bai Zhu brought the box to Su Yun Lan, and the second prince explained that the box must remain sealed as the beads were covered in dirt when they were produced. The aura of the beads dissipated quickly once the dirt was washed away, making it difficult to open the box. Su Yun Lan was grateful and offered to help the second prince if he ever needed anything that didn't go against his principles. After they got out of the second prince's residence, Su Yun Lan suddenly felt a python watching him from the shadows and was sweating. The eight clan man appeared and told him that the princess had found the water elemental treasure. Meanwhile, at the second prince's residence, Bai Zhu informed the second prince that the oriental pearls were tampered with, according to the orders of the demon sex Chu Qi. The second prince seemed unsurprised by the news and asked for more information. He also instructed Bai Zhu to clean up the pond since he hated the color red and to kill all the carp sent by the ministers. Yun Ying and Su Yun Lan are standing by a lake, and Yun Ying is telling Su Yun Lan about a fish that was spotted in the lake with a crystal lake jade bracelet and two yub wings. According to Yun Ying, it was the Kai Bao cold dragon fish of the water system. Su Yun Lan is surprised and asks if it's here in this lake. He tells her to let the fish matter aside and asks Yun Ying if she remembers the first time they met. He then grabs Yuan Ying and jumps into the lake, which makes Yuan Ying surprised and annoyed at Su Yun Lan. Suddenly, Yuan Ying loses her balance in the water and almost falls, but Su Yun Lan quickly helps her, and Yuan Ying gets embarrassed as they get close to each other. Su Yun Lan thinks that taking a bath with his wife is like heaven. He then softly scolds his wife for being so clumsy. Yuan Ying asks him why he's holding her so tight. Su Yun Lan thinks about how beautiful his wife is and then reveals that he is actually Xu and Qiu Lan. Yuan Ying is surprised and confused and tells him that Xu and Qiu Lan is the dead son of his foster father. Suddenly, a fish jumps between them, and Yuan Ying recognizes it as the cold dragon fish. Su Yun Lan asks her to go ashore and uses his nine nether souls to levitate the fish. 
he catches it easily, and Yuan Ying warns him not to let it return to the water or it will disappear without a trace. However, the cold dragon fish releases a power, and Su Yunlan's father, Demon Lord Mazan, suddenly appears. Su Yunlan remembers the day when he was young and his father promised to buy him candied haws. Returning to the current situation, Su Yunlan calls out to his father, asking if he knows about something. Mazan appears and questions Su Yunlan about his long absence, expressing his disappointment at Su Yunlan's decision to keep hiding from him. Mazan hands over a candied haw to Su Yunlan, warning him not to lose it. Su Yunlan suddenly hugs his father Mazan and apologizes. Mazan calls out his name Q Yunlan and he hugs him back. Later in the moment, Su Yunlan and Mazan are fishing, and Yuan Ying is just standing behind Su Yunlan. Su Yunlan asks his father why he hasn't shown up earlier, and Mazan just replies that he was waiting for the bait. Su Yunlan gazed at his acquired elements and was taken aback to see Yuan Ying with his long lost companions, Xiao Ying and Yu. Yuan Ying explained that Yu had visited her special assassin camp the Rose Camp, to express gratitude towards Su Yun Lan. When you learned of Su Yun Lan's quest for the five elemental treasures, she offered her help and even knew the whereabouts of the fire elemental treasure. Su Yun Lan was thrilled and asked to be taken there quickly. Upon arriving at the Flaming Mountain, Su Yun Lan asked you if this was the right place, and she inquired if he had been there before, to which he confirmed knowing the owner, knew. Suddenly, a silhouette of a woman flying toward them appeared and demanded to know their business. Xiao Ying identified her as Niu and greeted her, and Niu soon recognized him and Yu and greeted them both with excitement. She hugged both of them, and Su Yun Lan was surprised by the unexpected reunion. After that moment, Niu noticed Su Yun Lan and asked Yu why she came with him, noting his handsomeness. Yu explained that Su Yun Lan once saved their lives and is the prince consort to the Tang Dynasty's princess, just like Niu. Niu expressed admiration for Su Yun Lan's reputation as the prince consort of the Tang Dynasty. Su Yun Lan awkwardly responded and asked for Niu's surname. Niu introduced herself as Niu Ruan, the ruler of the Flaming Mountain, and asked Su Yun Lan to call her by her first name. Niu asked Yu why they had come to see her, and Su Yun Lan explained that he was from the demon sect and needed the Zhu Ning Jai heavenly treasure, which he heard Niu possessed. Niu understood the significance of the treasure and assumed that Su Yun Lan was in great need of it to have come to her personally. She informed Su Yun Lan that the treasure they sought was not a physical object but rather an organ of a unique creature found in the Flaming Mountain. The majority of these creatures were Zhu Han cows, which had a unique diet of flames that affected their blood and produced the Zhu Ning Jai. Su Yun Lan asked how they could get the treasure, to which Niu replied that they must kill the cows. Su Yun Lan expressed surprise and hesitation, but Niu assured him that it was better for the cows to die than to live a life plagued by illness and madness. Later, Su Yun Lan expressed his gratitude to Niu for her help. Su Yun Lan and Yu then jumped into the fray to collect the treasure, and Yu expressed annoyance as one of the cows ran toward her. Yu skillfully sliced off the cow's head, causing blood to spill onto the ground. Xiao Yin, in the form of a demon, began to slash at the cows with his claws. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan used his five spirits to conquer the key and tame the iron, gaining control over the iron swords that flew toward the cows and pierced their bodies. After the fight had subsided, Su Yun Lan thanked Niu for allowing him to complete his mission, and prepared to leave. Su Yun Lan was curious about Niu's mask and asked Yu about its origins, learning that Niu had been badly injured and disfigured by a man, causing her to wear the mask to cover her face. Yu also revealed that the man responsible for Niu's disfigurement was imprisoned in the depths of the Flaming Mountain. As Su Yun Lan pondered the possibility of the imprisoned man being someone he knew, Niu was seen in a new light, determined to seek revenge on her tormentor. At the princess's mansion, Su Yun Lan returned and was greeted by Lai Tang who informed him that his mother-in-law was outside with his sister-in-law, Yinger. Later, Su Yun Lan was surprised to see his grandmother, Mrs. Dong, who had brought him the flowing bricks, the earth elemental treasure he had been searching for. Su Yun Lan was amazed at his grandmother's knowledge and thanked her for bringing the bricks. Yu and Ying urged Su Yun Lan to hurry back to the demon sect and restore everything back to normal with the help of the elemental treasures. Upon their return to the demon sect, Su Yun Lan presented all five elements and asked them to quickly set to repairing the mountain's formation. Chu Ki praised Su Yun Lan's success in finding all of the elemental treasures in such a short amount of time and hinted at the possibility of Su Yun Lan becoming the next demon king. However, he Yan warned Su Yun Lan to be on his guard as Chu Qi's behavior seemed suspicious. On a mountain in the demon sect, a ritual was taking place to repair the formation. The elemental treasures had been placed on a statue. Fu Lank explained that the ritual required the participation of five martial arts masters, including himself, Chu Qi, and He Yan. However, they were still lacking two more participants. Su Yun Lan offered to join in as the young master of the demon sect. Just then, Yahu shouted from the cliff of the mountain, announcing his arrival. Chu Qi was pleased that General Yahu had come in person, 
and they began the ritual with the five elements. Fu Lang commanded the formation to begin, and while the transformation began, Su Yun Lan wondered about the second prince's pearl, causing him to get thrown into the formation. He Yan called out to Yun Lan, while Chu Qi advised him not to get distracted. Eight Man asked Su Yun Lan if he was okay. Su Yun Lan was relieved that he had noticed something before things got worse. He Yan looked towards where Su Yun Lan had been thrown, and Eight Man expressed concern for the young master. Yahoo asked everyone to leave it to him, and Fu Lank realized he had almost killed He Yan as well. Chu Qi thought that Su Yun Lan's death would make him the Demon King. Yahoo asked about Su Yun Lan's condition, and Fu Lank assumed that Su Yun Lan had sacrificed his life due to the impurity in the wood elemental treasure. He Yan was irritated by Fu Lank's words. Fu Lank then announced to the masked children and accused Su Yun Lan of trying to cheat his way to the position of the Demon King. The masked children praised Chu Qi's power, and Fu Lank suggested that Chu Qi would be the only suitable candidate for the position of the Demon King. The masked children agreed, and suddenly Demon Lord Mazen appeared from the top of the statue. Chu Qi was surprised, and Mazen commanded everyone to stand. Su Yun Lan remarked about his father's amazing appearance, and Chu Qi asked why Mazen had not been in seclusion to cultivate. Mazen responded by asking if Chu Qi thought he was dead. Su Yun Lan expressed his admiration for his father, and Mazen declared that the whole situation had been a test for the demon sect. He warned that anyone who tried to damage the demon sect would be killed. The Black Knights arrived, and the masked children begged for mercy while calling on Chu Qi to save them. Mazen asked Chu Qi how many people he should kill and who he should kill. Chu Qi responded by shouting, Die. The masked children were slashed and murdered in front of Su Yun Lan. He was surprised and tried to help, but Mazen stopped him from going towards them. Mazen told Su Yun Lan that times had changed and that such people were no longer welcome in this place, so the betrayal would never happen again. He then gave Su Yun Lan a jade token, signifying that it was time for him to become the supreme leader of the demon sect. Yahoo handed over the position of master of the demon sect to Su Yun Lan by destroying the holy fire token in his hand. Demon Lord Mazen confirmed that the entire demon sect would now only follow Su Yun Lan and the jade token. Yehu said that Su Yun Lan was now officially the master of the demon sect. Mazen tells Su Yun Lan that he has been secretly investigating the real reason behind the murders that have occurred over the years. He reveals that the Yangwei sect, behind Ning Yur whom Su Yun Lan remembers, is one of the best medicine refining sects in the world and that they were once suppressed by other martial arts sects. Besides the incident involving their father and son, they also kept two treasures hidden, the Time Mirror and the Sun and Moon Shuttle. Su Yun Lan expresses surprise upon hearing about the treasures and states that they sound super dangerous, but Yahoo reveals that they are just normal treasures. He goes on to say that the Black Knights have been tracking down the origins of these treasures and finally found a clue in a strange place. Yahoo then narrates his story of visiting a small village surrounded by peach blossoms where he found people wearing ancient clothes who seemed happy and entirely self-sufficient. They recognized the time mirror and the sun and moon shuttle, which surprised Yahoo. They also told him that the treasures were like a lock and key, and each sun and moon shuttle could open the time mirror, where anything could be stored and preserved forever. Mazen suggests that the thing hidden in their time mirror may be what those people want to fight for, and that Su Yun Lan must help Yinger win the upcoming reserve assignment so they can enter the treasury of the Emperor of the Tang Dynasty, where the time mirror is likely kept. Su Yun Lan agrees to help and also warns Mazen to be careful about Chu Qi who had connections with the ghost-faced man and fought with him in Haiyun City before escaping. Mazen investigates the conspiracy behind Chu Qi and requests to borrow Su Yun Lan's friends Yu and Ying to investigate the link between the monster and the bloody skulls. Su Yun Lan also mentions the second prince and reveals that during the ritual to restore the formation, it was only the second prince's wood elemental treasure that caused a problem. He expresses doubt about the second prince's true character. Meanwhile, the second prince expresses his surprise about the demon king being alive, and Chu Qi assures him that their plans are not completely ruined, but only delayed. The second prince asks about the progress of the elixir manufacturing, to which Chu Qi responds that they are performing live experiments on the first batch and offers to show it to him. Chu Qi calls for his men with Fu Lang to be brought in. Fu Lang appears to have been transformed into a baby. The second prince is astonished to see Fu Lang in this form, and Chu Qi explains that they need to perform live testing before they can properly produce the elixir. He also expresses concern about the reorganization of the demon sect as he does not have much power there. At the royal palace, the royal majesty expressed his desire to choose a successor to manage the dynasty for the next hundred years. His second son expressed concern for his father's aging 
but the royal majesty laughed in response. Minister De N read out the announcement that the people of Xi Cheng had long been independent and self-sufficient, and the majesty wished to add Xi Cheng to their territory without resorting to force. Therefore, all the princes and princesses would compete to sway Xi Cheng using their abilities, and the one who could gain the most territory would be chosen as the heir. Yun Ying, Lai Tang, and the second prince all agreed with the announcement and the competition for succession began. In the Xicheng territory, villagers were discussing the upcoming selection process for the next ruler of the Tang dynasty. Some were skeptical about the empress ruling the dynasty while others saw it as a disaster. Lai Tang became enraged at their comments, but Yuan Ying remained calm and focused on understanding the people's problems. Lai Tang looked behind and thought that he hated the Xicheng people. Meanwhile, the second prince visited a village and offered to help the people defend against beasts. The villagers were grateful and expressed their will willingness to support him in the selection process for the next ruler of the Tang dynasty. The second prince thought that he had managed to sway four territories in one day. After that moment, the second prince's messenger interrupted him while he was with a lady and startled her. The second prince scolded his messenger for his lack of discretion and asked if Baizu was alright, to which Baizu responded that she was fine. He then asked the messenger what had happened and learned that there was news of a man going north from a caravan. The second prince didn't see it as a big deal but emphasized the importance of urging the caravan to remain stable. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan and the eight man discussed the recent successes of the second prince in swaying four territories in one day. The eight man explained that the prince knew Zicheng very well and had brought a lot of supplies with him. Initially, they were unsure what the supplies would be used for, but it turned out that the prince had brought tools and officials to help with water management in the first territory. In the second territory, which had recently experienced an earthquake, the prince brought a group of masons to help with building repairs. The third and fourth territories were often attacked by wild animals, so the prince brought them hunting tools and a team of hunters to assist. Su Yunlan acknowledged that bringing supplies to the towns was an obvious strategy to win them over but noted that the second prince seemed to know everything about these territories and had prepared countermeasures for all of their problems. He suggested that there were only two ways the prince could have achieved this level of preparation. Either he had an insider within Zicheng who was passing him details about all of the territories or he somehow had something to do with these recent events. The eight man argued that their research indicated that these incidents had occurred recently. Su Yunlan then suggested the second possibility, that the second prince may have had something to do with these recent events. As Su Yunlan's group traveled to the northern town of Volcano, they were met with harsh and cold weather. Su Yunlan commented on the weather and expressed concern about how people could survive in such a place. He Yan questioned if it was a ghost town, but Su Yunlan insisted that there must be someone there. He then assigned He Yan and Lai Tang to investigate while he and the princess set up camp. Yuan Ying expressed his worry about what might happen if Lai Tang found out the truth, to which Su Yunlan replied to just go with the flow. Later, an eight man explained to Su Yunlan that the town relies on volcanic rocks to keep warm. However, the ore is nearly depleted, and the mayor recently went searching for a new digging location, but disappeared. The second prince arrived and gave the villagers wool and animal products and brought lambs to teach them farming and shepherding to free them from their dependency on the rocks. He also accused the mayor of selling the location of the volcanic rock and fleeing, causing the town to follow him. Su Yunlan expressed doubts about the effectiveness of shepherding in this area and suspected that the mayor's disappearance was too coincidental. While they were talking, Yuan Ying spotted people outside. She saw commotion that a kid was being harassed by angry people who blamed him for his father's disappearance. The kid then kicked one of the men, causing the man to get angry and threatened to kill him. Su Yunlan intervened, and Yuan Ying spoke, telling them that the resident was known for assistance and love and didn't expect such a terrible scene. The men then recognized the princess from the Tang dynasty. Despite their initial hostility, Su Yunlan offered to help, asking if the kid was okay and where his home was. In the midst of the chaos, He Yan asked Lai Tang to stop what he was doing. Lai Tang responded that he simply wanted to be with He Yan. He Yan asked Lai Tang what he meant by that, and Lai Tang replied that He Yan already knew the answer. He Yan then reminded Lai Tang of the significant difference between them, he was a prince and he was from the demon sect. He believed that their differences were too great and they could not be together. Lai Tang disagreed, citing his sister and her husband as an example of two people from different backgrounds who are happily together. He Yan objected again, this time pointing out that he was a man. Lai Tang responded by urging He Yan to dress appropriately and not catch a cold before confessing that he always knew He Yan was a man. He added that from the moment he first saw He Yan, he was struck by his beauty. Lai Tang then declared that love should have no restrictions and that he had everything figured out and only wanted He Yan. A kid arrived at their house. He was knocking on the door while announcing his arrival to his mom, letting her know that he had brought some guests with him. His mom opened the door, and upon seeing him, she hugged him right away, 
and was worried that he had been bullied again because of the way he looked. Quanner responded that his dad always told him to be brave and not even cry. He told his mom that worrying about him was useless. As he was explaining to his mom, Quanner introduced Ying and Su Yun Lan as the people who had also helped him that day. His mom's attention suddenly shifted to Ying and Su Yun Lan. She asked the two if they were with the second prince and warned them to go away as she would not listen to whatever they had to say. Su Yun Lan understood the mother's reaction and reassured her that the two of them were not with the second prince. Quanner's mom stammered as she couldn't believe she was standing in front of the princess herself. She quickly apologized for her act as she had not recognized her right away. Su Yun Lan intervened to cut the tension, telling Quanner's mom to drop the honorifics as the two of them were also younger than her. He then proceeded to ask for her name. Quanner's mother introduced herself as Yu, the wife of Chen Shuang, who was also the mayor of the town. She also properly introduced her children, Chen Quan, and his younger sibling who was still learning to speak, Chen Quan. Su Yunlan was surprised by what he had just heard as he could not believe that they had actually met the wife of the missing mayor. Mrs. Yu explained that Quanner had only gone out to beg for food. But because of everything that had happened, he had been treated poorly. Ying then proceeded to ask Yu if she had any idea why Mr. Chen was missing. Mrs. Yu then admitted that she was searching for him too. She claimed that they had been together for 10 years and that he had always been good and respectful to his family, and they were very happy. She then cried as she continued to explain that Mr. Zhen had heard something about a merchant who was selling blueprints for mining volcanic rocks. He told her that he would meet with him, and that was the last time she had talked to him as he had never come back. People had spread the word about Mr. Zhen selling the rocks and fleeing away, but Yu was never convinced as she knew her husband was never corrupt. She firmly believed that Mr. Zhen would never hurt his family for such an act. Su Yunlan agreed with the idea that even if he was willing to betray the whole town as mayor, he would never leave his family behind. He suspected that there was something fishy going on. Ying agreed, and they decided to let Mrs. Yu rest for a while, as she missed her husband so much that they could not afford to bother her further at this time. As they were about to leave, Su Yunlan noticed something sneaking on his back. He then successfully caught the boy. Ying noticed something that was tossed from the boy Su Yunlan had captured. She realized that it was Quanner's Chen family amulet. Ying also found a map of the volcanic rock mining area. Su Yunlan was surprised when he heard it. He then also confirmed that the cloth that was used was the same as the one Mrs. Yu was wearing. Su Yunlan recalled what Mrs. Yu had said about their family. The family consisted of four members, and he also saw that this kid not only had an amulet but also a map that belonged to Mr. Chen. Su Yunlan was wondering if the kid was an illegitimate child of Mr. Zhen. More questions were popping into Su Yunlan's mind as he started to think thoroughly about what had just happened. He could not believe Mr. Zhen could do something like this to his family, a family that was close to each other. On the other hand, the second prince was in front of a small crowd. He told the people to relax and to eat and dress warmly because today he would teach them the ways of shepherding. The people responded positively, and some even called him their savior from heaven. Out of nowhere, Su Yun Lan cut through the crowd and announced to the people that he had found the map to the volcanic rock mine. He told them that they could beat the harsh winter by mining the rocks. The second prince could not believe what he had just witnessed and thought Su Yun Lan was going to cause trouble. The second prince remained composed in front and warned the crowd that winter was almost here already, meaning that even with the map and the process of mining, it would take them two or three days, by which everything would be frozen by the time they got back. Su Yun Lan told the crowd not to worry about getting the job done late, and how everything will freeze once they get back. He reassured everyone that if they could not dig enough volcanic rocks in three days, he himself would help them out. The second prince remembered the spies reporting to him that he would only take three people with him. He was confident that three people in three days would not even reach the rock. The second prince then proceeded to ask Su Yun Lan if he would break his promise. He threatened him, saying that he was risking the entire town for his dishonesty. If he did not keep his promise, then he would surely launch the entire region into chaos. Su Yun Lan confidently responded that they would see it in three days' time. He Yan was showing doubts because the people they were bringing did not even number 10. He was wondering how they would be able to complete the mining within three days. He Yan continued that even with a map, the manpower they needed to move the equipment, survey the area, and everything else that was involved was insufficient. Su Yun Lan did not even shake his confidence and only responded that times had changed. He then proceeded to show the volcanic rock in his palm, which he got from Mrs. Zhen. Su Yun Lan had already spent some time studying the rock. He claimed that it contained iron, which meant his iron control ability could detect them, and they could survey the area in no time. He then proceeded to show the blueprint they would follow, which contained the mining method. 
He finished by saying that the elite soldiers could build the mining equipment and dig the tracks. Yu and Ying then shared that the manpower they had could focus on building these things, but she wondered who would do the deep mining. Su Yunlan answered if they remembered the town where the second prince won, and where the people were being attacked by beasts, apparently he took a trip there and found something that could help them. Su Yunlan cast the nine nether soul spells. He then checked the area and exclaimed how great the place was and how it was enough for them to use for decades. He then called all the moles to gather as they would start to work all over and have it done soon. All the creatures that were under Su Yunlan's command were working hard together as they mined all the volcanic rocks they could find. From afar, somebody was stalking them and wondering what the prince consort was doing. He was surprised by the loud roar when a lion charged at him, making him run for his life as the lion stopped chasing after successfully scaring him. At break time, Su Yun Lan gathered everyone as they were about to have their meal. Yu and Ying was wondering where he got all this meat from. With a bright face, Su Yun Lan told her that he got it from the second prince's flock of sheep. Three days passed, and the people were surprised to see a mountain of sparkling volcanic rocks in front of them. Some could not believe what they witnessed, claiming they had even mined enough volcanic rocks to sustain them for half of their lives. Some were even in disbelief that this was the work of the prince's consort. Su Yunlan told them that he had only done his part of the work, and a lot had already been done by their leader, Zhen. The man was shocked as it was rumored that Zhen was greedy and that he even abandoned his wife and kids. Su Yunlan corrected him, saying that he had found Zhen and used his assistance and maps to find the mining site. He was giving credit to Zhen who made all of it possible. The people were in disbelief. Su Yunlan continued that volcanic rock mining was such a difficult task that even with the blueprints, he would not have been able to mine everything before winter came. Zhen learned from a passing merchant that there was a mining expert nearby, so he personally gave him a visit. The said expert was then moved by the mayor's sincerity, and he decided to teach them how to mine and use the equipment. Su Yunlan concluded his story that a trade was made. To pay the expert for everything, the mayor must take care of him until he passed away. The people were so grateful and got emotional when they heard the truth. Most of them cried, and some felt terrible for bullying Jen's kid. A man saw the mayor's wife and announced her presence to everyone, as they all asked for her forgiveness. People apologized as they regretfully spread such false rumors and realized that they were actually the villains of the story. Su Yunlan hoped that this little white lie could help Mrs. Jen and her family get through this trouble. As he walked away, he crossed paths with the second prince. The second prince was talking to himself and expressed his admiration towards the mayor, as he never knew that Jen was such a kind character. He also claimed that since he gave the map to Su Yun Lan, it seemed that he was a trustworthy person after all. The second prince then announced that he had no reason to take it back from him, so Su Yun Lan could keep the sheep left over, and for the ownership of the volcano town, he assumed that he was supposed to hand it over to the princess, represented by Su Yun Lan. The people cheered in agreement. They commended the humility the second prince showed, and it made them feel like the future would be great. With such greatness in his mind and talent, the second prince was a hero for some. Su Yunlan thought that the second prince conceding managed to sway the minds of a few people in this town. He exclaimed that the second prince was not simple after all. At Mayor Zhen's house, Su Yunlan and Mrs. Zhen are having a private conversation. Mrs. Zhen tells Su Yun Lan that she did not actually find her husband opposed to what he announced to the people earlier. She concludes that those tools and maps were probably just made by Su Yun Lan, but is generous enough to give credit to the mayor. Mrs. Zhen expresses her gratitude as she feels grateful for Su Yun Lan's gesture. Su Yun Lan insists that there is no need for her to be like that. But Mrs. Jen continues to speak and points out Su Yun Lan's curiosity. She knew from the start that he was not telling the truth because she knows her husband better than anyone else. She adds that if her husband really met the expert like Su Yun Lan said, he would have at least sent her a letter back. But instead she has not received anything from him all this time. Su Yun Lan has already prepared a forged letter for this scenario, but he is thinking twice about whether he will give it to her or just leave it. Su Yun Lan assures Mrs. Jen that he will find her husband and tells her not to worry so much. He tells her to stay strong and not do anything dangerous. Su Yun Lan has already averted the danger of winter in this town, so he just asks Mrs. Jen for her patience. Mrs. Jen feels thankful for Su Yun Lan's words. Meanwhile, at the princess camp, Su Yun Lan is still having deep thoughts about where that kid got the map and the amulet from. From a distance, the second prince calls out to Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan welcomes the second prince and asks why he was calling him all the way here and follows up by asking why he is not with his wife. The second prince responds that the temperature in the mountains is just too cold for her frail body, and it is not suitable for her to be there. Su Yun Lan then asks what brings the second prince here. The second prince replies that on such a cold day, Su Yun Lan hasn't invited him to have tea. Su Yun Lan then asks if it was really cold there and mockingly brags that he forgot he has a volcanic rock with him. 
He then tells the second prince to come closer so he can give him some pieces. Both have thoughts running as they were having the conversation. Su Yunlan is wondering what the second prince is up to, as he really has no business here. The second prince is also cursing Su Yunlan in his thoughts, as he failed to win over the town because of that volcanic rock. The second prince smiles as he thanks Su Yunlan for the piece of volcanic rock. He then asks Su Yunlan where he found the mayor. Su Yunlan sticks to the story he shared at the square and tells the second prince that he was at the old expert's house. He adds that the man does not want to be disturbed and asks for the second prince's understanding, for he cannot share the exact location. The second prince still has doubts about Su Yunlan's story. He wonders if Su Yunlan was able to recover from his original form and was picked up by that expert. The second prince also suspects that Su Yunlan might already know what happened and is just pretending to act confused. The second prince expresses his disappointment after Su Yunlan declines his invitation to have tea with him. He thought he could bring Su Yunlan to return with them to the Tang territory. He starts to boast about the oriental jade bamboo forest he has there and adds that it could have been a lovely place for him to spend his late years. Su Yunlan then tells the second prince where he got the message that the mayor was greedy and left the town. The second prince replies that it was all his own speculation and admits that he was wrong. He expresses his regret and wants to apologize personally to the mayor, reasoning why he wanted to know the expert's exact location. He even adds that he will go alone so he will not disturb him too much. But in his mind, the second prince's true agenda is to find the mayor so he can erase all the traces that will lead back to him. In Su Yunlan's thoughts too, he is aware that the second prince has no plans to apologize and only wants to find the mayor for his own agenda. On the other hand, a father is seen playing chase with his son. The kid then runs to He Yan, and as the kid gets closer, the second prince suddenly snaps out of it and realizes that he was playing with Su Yunlan. Su Yunlan then cuts him off by asking him why he will be leaving suddenly when he was just inviting him for some tea. Su Yunlan sees the kid and thinks to himself if that kid does have something to do with the mayor. His trip to the western region is really full of secrets. Yu and Ying approaches Su Yunlan that they are having a problem, and at the second prince's camp, he asks Bai Zhu for an update. Bai Zhu then explains that everything is happening according to plan and that the people who have integrated into the volcanic town are spreading rumors. She continues that the princess of the Tang dynasty is useless as she is only relying on her prince consort. She concludes that if the princess takes the throne, she will just be a puppet for him. The second prince shows his interest in Bai Zhu's report. The second prince asked Bai Zhu if she knew how the people in Volcano Town reacted. Bai Zhu then told the second prince that the people were able to survive the winter, for now, thanks to Su Yun Lan. With that, the people showed support to the princess, but behind all those, stories about the incompetent princess were still spreading. The people believed that there had never been a female empress since ancient times, so the idea of having the princess as the right to become the next leader of the dynasty upset them. The second prince commended her for the news and told her that they must keep spreading it until all of the western territories believed them. Baizu agreed but was concerned that the western territories were large and most of their communities were very independent. Spreading the rumors all over might be a challenge. The second prince assured her that there were still some princes in western regions that were enemies of Su Yun Lan. Keeping following the second prince's orders will keep them all right. On the other hand, Su Yun Lan slammed his fist. He mentioned that it was a good move to He Yan, who was talking about the events that happened in Volcano Town. He informed him that the second prince suddenly gave up the ownership of all the territories he already won over. The territories almost covered a third of the entire western region. The result of this made people suddenly break out in an uproar because he did not leave any reason, and went right away into hiding. Lai Tang then entered the discussion and added that the people did not agree with women being their leader. He added that his sister did not have anything to do with the events in Volcano Town. The people seemed to credit only his brother-in-law. He Yan then said that the situation was exploding this time and the people were protesting and boycotting the princess rule. He Yan also added that the other princes saw that the princess suddenly took a third of the territory and so have naturally sent the people to help. A message was spread throughout the whole western territory, the messages were all about the country being such a pity being led by weak women to have its master. Ying Yuan then claimed that her second brother had destroyed his own gains in order to hurt them. She described it as sacrificing 800 of his men to kill a thousand of theirs. Su Yunlan told them that the second prince was not so stupid after all. The way he does things, he rallied the people on his side and made the population hate them. He recognized the second prince's plan was to make them the target of public criticism. 
then the second prince could use the support of the people to kick them out of the western territories. Even if they go back to the Tang dynasty, the reputation they have will surely plummet. Su Yunlan concludes that it is not the right time now to go back to the Tang dynasty. He Yan then realizes that the rumors are putting them in a tough spot. Then Su Yunlan came up with an idea. The idea was that even though the people of the western regions believe that women could not be leaders, the basis for that was that there has never been one. The way their cultural arts do not portray women in such a way. Though they can't change the past, Su Yun Lan's idea was just all about changing its future, which left Yuan Ying in disbelief. The idea was a bit ridiculous to them. Lai Tang walked towards a man announcing his free goods. They seemed to be just ordinary books, so Lai Tang was curious and asked what those books make them special. The man then hooked his arm to Lai Tang, telling him that if he didn't get what it's all about, he suggests opening it and he will find out. The book contains the founding member of the Tang dynasty, Dong Gui who was a woman. The people then swarmed the man when they heard the book was all about the founding member being a woman. The man then offered everyone who gathered complimentary hot tea since the cold might annoy them and make them tired. The people who read were in awe and surprised at how great General Dong was. They were astonished to read the story about her fight against the Liao Kingdom and how she managed to kill its leader. Some found interest in General Dong's skills, commending the way she took 12 widows and managed to take down all the enemies to save the second prince, who was very young during that time. Lai Tang also found out about how the second prince almost died in another country, but was saved by General Dong. They continued to discuss the greatness of General Dong. Some even talked about the time the Jin Kingdom attacked the Hulao Pass in the Tang Dynasty when all the generals were away at war. General Dong happened to be recuperating nearby, so she went out alone and fought against Jiang Sanying, the famous general of the Jin Dynasty. The people continued to talk about how awesome General Dong was. They were even in awe when they learned she was also good at Kung Fu. The man who gave the books then asked for everyone's attention and talked about how General Dong singled out Sanying. The fight lasted for 300 rounds, and he told everyone if they could have seen it, they would never have regrets. A reader responded to him to stop talking nonsense as they could see it in this book. The man then told them to look at him for a second. He warned everyone not even to blink as they might miss it. The man then started to open the book, which looked like he cast a spell on it and made the portraits move, like a little cinema. The people were in awe of what they had just witnessed, a scene of General Dong in action. A group of men was engaged in a conversation about General Dong praising her exceptional abilities. One man commented on how most women are weak, but General Dong is an exception. Suddenly, a man came rushing towards them, seeking their help. He informed them that beasts were attacking the mining site, and the villagers were trapped. The other men urged their companions to go and save them immediately. Later, they arrived at the scene where Yuan Ying was surrounded by the beasts, and she was trying to fend them off. She told the beasts to leave and never come back. To everyone's surprise, the beasts just stopped and retreated after hearing her command. Yuan Ying announced that she was there to protect them, and the group of men noticed something familiar about her. One man recognized her as General Dong, while another man corrected him, saying that she was the princess. The other men laughed and commented on how she would fit perfectly with the Dong bloodline. Some praised her for her powerful skills in driving off the beasts. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan was busy casting spells to dismiss the Nine Nether Souls, and after successfully doing so, he let out a sigh of relief. After the incident, news of the Tang Dynasty's victory over the beasts spread quickly throughout the western region. Meanwhile, the second prince was furious and could not believe that people were fooled so easily. He realized that if things continued this way, his sister might become the next empress, which he did not want to happen. In deep thought, the second prince decided that he had to do something about the situation. He went back to the northern town of Volcano, where Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying were taking a hot bath together. Yun Lan was mesmerized by the situation. Yuan Ying expressed concern about not having done anything over the last few days, to which Yun Lan reassured her that it was important to relax after being stressed. Suddenly, there was a noise outside, where a mother called out the name Little Zhen to stop running around. This startled both Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying. Yuan Ying stood up and moved to the lounge chair. Su Yun Lan then gave her a lotion to massage her back and explained that news travels slowly in the western region because of its large size and independence. According to the Eighth Clan, Yuan Ying's grandmother's story had only spread to a few neighboring villages. Just then, there was a knock on the door, and someone called out to Su Yun Lan, informing him that two people were waiting outside to meet him. After that moment, Zhang Fei greeted him, and Su Yun Lan expressed surprise at seeing them so soon. Meng chimed in, saying that it had been a few months and that the prince consort and princess were looking just as well as when he last saw them. Su Yun Lan warmly greeted Zhang Fei and Meng, thanking them for their visit and telling them there was no need to be so formal. 
He then asked about Meng's feet and whether they were getting better. Zhang Fei replied that thanks to the medicine Su Yan Lan had given him, his feet were feeling much better. She explained that she and Meng had come to check on Su Yan Lan and Princess after hearing about the events in the volcano town. Su Yan Lan remarked that information traveled slowly in the western region but expressed his happiness to see that Zhang Fei and Meng were doing well. Zhang Fei then presented Su Yan Lan with a special perfume that she and Meng had developed, which had a unique ability. She suggested that Su Yan Lan try it out with the princess sometime. Su Yan Lan received the perfume and opened it, remarking on how good it smelled. He asked Zhang Fei what it was called. Zhang Fei explained that it was named Zhang Nair and that it had become very popular. Meng added that they were thinking of expanding their tavern, which had become more successful since they started using the perfume. Su Yunlan chuckled at the unconventional name and expressed his support for the expansion. He also suggested that they include a performance stage in the tavern to attract more customers. At the opening of the new branch of Longman Tavern, the host announced a 50% discount on all dishes and free books. Inside the room, the men discussed General Dong and her heroic deeds. One of them complimented the prince consort Su Yun Lan for the princess feat of fighting off beasts. The host of the tavern declared Su Yun Lan as his brother, and the prince agreed. However, Su Yun Lan thought the host's friendliness was overkill. Meanwhile, a bandit with injuries in one eye was approached by a mysterious man who offered to help him deal with someone in exchange for a reward. The mysterious man informed him that the western region would be owned by the Tang dynasty in the future and asked him to take care of three people in a portrait. In exchange, the mysterious man promised to give the bandit a larger territory and freedom from a life of stealing and murdering. The bandit initially hesitated but was convinced after seeing the royal token given by the mysterious man. After a while, the assistant of the mysterious man approached him and commended him on his handling of the bandits. However, the assistant expressed concern about the possibility of the bandits betraying them. The mysterious man responded with a cryptic laugh, implying that he had a plan in place and the bandits would not be able to turn against them. Meanwhile, Bai Zhu informed the second prince about the two familiar faces. He then dismissed Bai Zhu shortly after and walked towards a man, instructing him to restore the two kids to their original appearance. At the Longman Tavern branch, Xiang Fei, Meng, and his brother were counting some money. His brother expressed his desire to rank Prince Consort Su as his third best friend after his brother and sister-in-law. Meng criticized his brother for being obsessed with money and not using the journey to gather knowledge and discuss scripture. However, his brother did not care and said that the luxuries he could have now were worth it. He pointed out that he used to be starving every day and had to rely on charity and support from his friends. Suddenly, a rock was thrown at his brother's head, which made him furious and demand to know who did it. The person outside the room revealed themselves to be a friend who had just come from the one-eyed dragon. Later at that moment, Su Yun Lan, together with the group, walked outside their room and were surrounded by bandits. Su Yun Lan demanded to know who the bandits were and why they were threatening the princess. The one-eyed bandit replied that someone wanted them gone and that they knew about their reputation, so they didn't plan to fight them head on. A kunai was then thrown at the group, striking all four of them and causing them to faint. The one-eyed bandit declared that it was easy and ordered his men to tie them up and bring them back with them. At the cliff of the mountain, the assistant of the mysterious man praised him for being worthy of being the emperor and for taking down the princess so easily. The mysterious man replied that with the princess and her group coming to the western territories, a danger was rising and he had expected them to take fewer than five people to the appointment that day. The assistant was impressed by his strategies but was also confused about how he knew about the Empress's plans. The mysterious man stated that he still had more to learn and suggested they go investigate the captives. Later, the mysterious man praised the bandit and asked where his people were hiding, to which the one-eyed bandit responded with silence. Suddenly, his men surrounded the mysterious man and the assistant. The assistant showed worry on his face and said that the bandits had turned them over. Su Yun Lan clapped as his plan had successfully uncovered the mysterious man's plan and foiled it. The mysterious man was surprised and accused Su Yun Lan of colluding with the bandits, but Su Yun Lan retorted that the real traitor was the mysterious man. Su Yun Lan revealed that the bandits had put on a show to lure the mysterious man in and that they had received a message from the head of the bandits. The plan had worked, and the mysterious man and his assistant were surrounded and captured by the bandits. Su Yun Lan didn't want to harm the mysterious man or his assistant but he wanted them to stay in captivity for a few months. The bandits promised to take care of them and ensure that they were not harmed. The mysterious man shouted for his father to save him. Meanwhile, the second prince was looking for Su Yun Lan. Su Yun Lan realizes that Miss Zhang, who is now a concubine of the Tang Dynasty, is considered a traitor for committing several crimes during the schemes of the seventh prince, 
but was never officially pardoned. Yu Ying warns Su Yun Lan that if he is taken down by the second prince, he will not let him go and urges him to leave while she stalls him. However, Su Yun Lan is hesitant as they are in a critical stage. The second prince and his guards arrive and chase after them. The second prince accuses Yu Ying of harboring the fugitive girl and protecting criminals. Yu Ying smirks and defends herself, stating that she acted in self-defense when she heard them coming and that she was working with Mr. Meng, not Miss Yang. He Yan realizes that Princess Yuan Ying is one of the smartest and most talented people of her generation. At the princess's camp, Eight Man reports that the people Su was with have successfully escaped, but they found scraps of the young master's blood and clothing along the way. Princess Yuan Ying hopes that Su Yun Lan makes it there safely. Lai Tang suggests sending someone to save him, but Yuan Ying is hesitant, stating that the second prince will have many guards around, making it difficult to get inside without being spotted. She instructs the 8th clan to continue using insect communication to avoid being tracked and to use only the most secret methods of communication. Yuan Ying is concerned that if Su was captured by the second prince, he might learn the whereabouts of concubines Yang, whose escape from the western regions was handled by Su himself. She wonders what the second prince is up to after handing over all his cities to her and picking up matters with his other brothers. Ian reports that according to the 8th clan, the second prince's maid was occasionally seen taking his wife out for walks. Yuan Ying is surprised by the news and asks Ian to spread rumors the next day that there are traces of Yun Lan in Volcano Town. Meanwhile, the second prince, pleased with himself, tells his entourage that the plan worked, and that Su Yun Lan has been hit by an arrow and will attempt to sneak back. They arrive in a town where people have gathered, and the second prince asks who spotted the bloody piece of clothing. An old man named Kao Min steps forward and explains that he found it while fetching water in the morning. The second prince then asks at what time he saw it and Kao Min replies that it was around 6 am. The second prince investigates the area and turns his back to Kao Min. He wonders why the blood hasn't frozen yet in such cold weather and realizes that the piece of clothing has no blood stains. He then realizes that the piece of clothing didn't come from an injury and curses the situation. The winter snowfall was swarming the second prince's camp. Yuan Ying swiftly sneaked her way inside. As she got close to one of the camp's tents, a sharp blade zoomed past her. Luckily, it only hit her cape. Apparently, Bai Zhu caught Yuan Ying, and her attack almost killed her. However, Bai Zhu couldn't recognize Yuan Ying's face, thanks to her disguise that covered her face. She warned Yuan Ying that she should not be here since this is the second prince's camp. Yuan Ying realized the risky situation she was in and quickly charged at Bai Zhu. Bai Zhu told Yuan Ying that she was overestimating herself as she drew her sword for defense. With Yuan Ying's charged fist heading toward her blade, she struck Bai Zhu and was surprised by the power of the attack. The force Yuan Ying showed should have taken at least 30 to 50 years of training. Bai Zhu was wondering how such a young person could gain such power and was curious about Yuan Ying's identity. Yuan Ying also recognized Bai Zhu's exceptional power and now understood why the second prince guessed that she was alone. As Bai Zhu was preparing to attack and charge at Yuan Ying, the second prince suddenly showed up. The second prince straight away asked her if she was okay as he saw her yielding the broken sword. Bai Zhu politely answered him back with a question, wondering why the second prince was out here. She explained that a thief was trying to break in, and she was taken aback. Yuan Ying was able to escape the fight before she was caught by the second prince. As she got back, Lai Tang asked her how her mission was. Yuan Ying told Lai Tang that it was fine but was annoyed by the second prince's servant. Bai Zhu. She claimed that Bai Zhu was stronger than she had expected. Fortunately, her abilities were able to overcome Bai Zhu. He Yan then talked about how the mission did not end the way they expected, but at least they got some information. At the time when Bai Zhu and Yuan Ying were fighting, the eight group was present during the clash and was able to copy down the details unguarded. Lai Tang was delighted upon hearing that and commended her sister's work. The second prince's camp thought that Yuan Ying's plan was to get in by force, but in hindsight, they were sneakier than what they thought. As Yuan Ying was about to open the scroll, she was surprised by what she saw, which also made Lai Tang ask what it was all about. Yuan Ying was in disbelief about what she saw. Apparently, the second prince's wife had gotten younger. Back at the second prince's camp, the second prince told Bai Zhu that he was going to the mountain and asked her to stay put. Bai Zhu politely agreed to the second prince's order. The second prince apparently saw her sister's attack against Bai Zhu yesterday. He was impressed with the actions she showed, but it left him confused about why Yuan Ying was too focused on attacking his maid. The second prince was waiting for her to attack again and had now laid a trap for her to fall into. Back at the volcano town, the people were gathering and saying that Mayor Zhen had come back. 
A man was surprised by the news and acknowledged the seriousness of the matter as the second prince had rushed to the mountain to tell Baizu. Baizu was taken aback by the sudden news about the appearance of the mayor, and she thought that the camp was empty and would come back when the princess took the bait. As she continued her journey, she heard noise and turned around to see that it was Su Yun Lan, with the general demon. Su Yun Lan was standing and greeted her. Baizu was surprised to see Su Yun Lan's presence and questioned how he got there. She also wondered about the rumors that Su Yun Lan could control demons. While they were talking, Baizu's guard held a knife and Su Yun Lan attacked him with his general demon, smashing him to the ground. Baizu looked at Su Yun Lan in surprise as he walked towards her, wondering why he was here. Her thoughts raced as she tried to figure out if it was a trap but she quickly dismissed the idea. If Su Yun Lan had returned to Volcano Town, he wouldn't have known about the recent events. Su Yun Lan questioned the second prince's motives for letting them go and giving up the territories he had gained. Bai Zhu said that the second prince's goals were beyond Su Yun Lan's understanding. Suddenly, she attacked Su Yun Lan with a sword, but he managed to block it with the general demon. Su Yun Lan quickly explained that the demon general, Nu Bai, had tough skin, and that if he were in Bai Zhu's position, he would be in serious pain. The general demon retaliated by attacking Bai Zhu with great force, injuring her arms. Bai Zhu cursed in frustration, while Su Yun Lan noticed that the color of Bai Zhu's blood was violet, and he was surprised and wondered what had happened to cause this. Bai Zhu swung a strike again and threatened to kill him. Su Yun Lan realized he wasn't paying attention and was too careless and got out of balance. As Bai Zhu slowly walked towards him, he then shouted the Nine Days Phoenix Dance summoning a phoenix that appeared alongside the swords of Yuan Ying with great impact after it crashed to the ground. His demon general rushed and attacked Bai Zhu, staining the demon hand with her blood, learning that Bai Zhu was a poisoned person. Bai Zhu laughed in a creepy way and threatened to kill him, but Su Yun Lan quickly turned the tables, asking Bai Zhu if she could see where his dagger was. Her swords controlled by Su Yun Lan were behind Bai Zhu, ready to pierce her. Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying were standing near Bai Zhu, who was visibly struggling due to the poison in her body. Su Yun Lan started the conversation by complimenting Bai Zhu's talents and asked her to reveal the second prince's secret. However, Bai Zhu refused to do so. Bai Zhu's condition worsened, and she struggled to speak. She addressed the young master, hoping to meet him in the afterlife. Yuan Ying became concerned about Su Yun Lan's well-being and asked if he was alright. Su Yun Lan confirmed that he was fine but informed Yuan Ying that Bai Zhu had passed away due to the poison. Although Bai Zhu's death was beneficial for them, Su Yun Lan acknowledged that they still didn't know the second prince's plan. At the mountain cave, the second prince apologized to his lady, telling her that everything would be better if she took the trip. The coachman interjected, asking if they should go to the residence first, but the second prince ordered them to go straight to the experiment base. A brother of Meng commented that the second prince was expected, and even the natives would find it impossible to track the carriage. The one-eyed man expressed concern about Su Yun Lan returning to Volcano Town alone, but brother of Meng reassured him, stating that the demon accompanying him could handle anything. The one-eyed man then thought about the task given to him by Su Yun Lan, which was to help transport a mysterious object to Volcano Town. He never expected it to be a demon like the one he saw. He also recalled how lucky they were that Su Yun Lan arrived just in time to prevent the destruction of the entire village. Despite this, the one-eyed man felt that their task was done and that they might get into trouble if they continued. Therefore, he suggested they go and report their findings to Su Yun Lan. Meanwhile, at the experiment base, the second prince showed a tube filled with blood medicine to an aide, who was impressed to see the blood of a top master. The second prince explained that time was running out, and he had given the medicine to someone as instructed by the aide. The aide mentioned that they were almost out of experimental subjects for the next step of Solution Zero development, but the second prince assured him that he would provide the living subjects required. When asked where he would get so many people, the second prince revealed that he had been bringing cattle from the Tang region during his trip, hiding Solution Zero in them to use everyone in the western regions as his test subject. Meanwhile, Xiao Ying, Yu, and Mazen are in the desert. Mazen interrogated a person, but the person claimed to know nothing. Mazen then used his technique to control the person with the sound of the demon soul. Under his control, the person revealed that the purpose of the experiments was to find the secret to human immortality within the blood of the demon. In the princess's base, Su Yun Lan stated that the secret to human immortality lay within the blood of the demon. He then continued, saying that they had also discovered that the disappearance of the mayor was caused by the second prince. Yu and Ying responded, acknowledging Su Yun Lan's bravery in bringing along the beast. Bai Zhu, who was also mysterious and could have been dangerous. Su Yun Lan explained that after the incident with the one-eyed man, 
he realized their manpower was insufficient and that their movements were being monitored by the second prince. That's why he decided to bring the demon general with him to protect himself from any potential dangers. Later, Su Yun Lan questioned if there was another cave in the area, wondering if that's where the second prince's team was camping. He expressed his confusion as to why they would be hiding out in such dangerous weather. He Yen then interrupted to tell Su Yun Lan that he had a message from the demon king and handed him the letter, which Su Yun Lan read. The letter revealed that the Demon King had been destroying experimental camps in the desert, and had discovered that the key to human immortality was the blood of a demon, which must be extracted in an extreme environment. Su Yunlan was surprised by this information and made the connection that the Second Prince's secret camp was located in the middle of a blizzard. Yuan Ying told Su Yunlan that the Second Prince's wife suddenly looked much younger. Su Yunlan was surprised and wondered if it could be related to the discovery of eternal life from the Demon King's letter. He found the idea terrifying. Su Yunlan then suggested they go to the Second Prince's home to explore since he and his wife were out camping. He Yan was hesitant and questioned if it was a good idea, but Su Yunlan reassured him, saying they would be fine since they had each other. After the conversation, He Yan disguised himself as Bai Zhu and appeared nervous about the possibility of being caught. Su Yunlan reassured him that their plan would be successful. At the Second Prince's mansion, a guard greeted them and welcomed Bai Zhu's return, to which He Yan respectfully responded. However, the guard questioned her voice, and He Yan coughed claiming to have caught a cold and telling him that he had matters to attend to and she must enter. The guard allowed them to enter, and he Yan felt relieved to have made it inside undetected. However, he was still aware that they were in a dangerous situation. Su Yun Lan and Yi Yan searched through the second prince's books and belongings, looking for something important. Su Yun Lan remarked that the second prince seemed like a normal prince based on his interests in books and art but also noted that he was very careful and unlikely to misplace anything important. Eventually, He Yan found what they were looking for, and Su Yun Lan found a tube containing the blood and the fake oriental pearl that the second prince had given him. Su Yun Lan connected the dots and realized that the second prince was collaborating with Chu Qi. As they were investigating, a guard knocked on the door with a letter from the second prince. In the letter, which Su Yun Lan read, the second prince instructed Bai Zhu to take two vials of their work and hide them in a secret storage in his room while he went away for a few days. He Yan and Su Yun Lan are confused about some work that was mentioned in the letter. Su Yun Lan responds by saying that when they killed Bai Zhu, her blood had a strange purple color, and from what they saw today, he thinks that those tubes were filled with Bai Zhu's blood, and her body was being used for experimentation. Yi Yan is shocked and calls the second prince disgusting. Su Yun Lan thinks to himself that there might be another experiment happening on blood and wonders if it is related to the bloody skull. He then suggests they go back, as the second prince hasn't been able to track them for the past few days, which is a good opportunity. He Yan then tells the guard that the second prince gave them a letter warning that the enemy might be moving in the next few days and might even pretend to be the prince himself. If someone claims to be the second prince, they need to make sure it's the real prince, and if they can't prove it, they may kill them. The guard then asks what the secret signal is, and He Yan explains it to him. The guard then wonders if he will be promoted and thinks that Bai Zhu might have fallen in love with him. After they leave the prince's mansion, He Yan expresses relief that their plan is complete, and the second prince will have a surprise waiting for him when he returns home. Su Yun Lan wishes they could have caused the second prince even more trouble. Later, a man announces that the second prince has sent more beef and mutton, and everyone should come quickly. The other man comments that while the princess is great, the second prince isn't bad either. Another man then adds that the voting is about to start, and it's going to be difficult to choose. At the princess's base, Yuan Ying greets Su Yun Lan upon his return and asks if they found anything. Su Yun Lan replies that the second prince's plans are still unclear, even though he gave them control of the regions he had earned. Lei Tang also welcomes Su Yun Lan back. He Yan, on the other hand, blocks the child running towards them, but suddenly has a tantrum and bites He Yan's hand. The general demon starts to move and jumps, but Su Yun Lan controls it and says that the demon was tamed long ago and has no desire for human blood. He then suspects that there may be some hidden secrets in the beef they received and decides to investigate since the kid's reaction was weird. After that, Yuan Ying is confused and questions Su Yun Lan, to which Su Yun Lan responds that the leopards were doing evil in the forest and brought them with the help of a gorilla for his experiment. Su Yun Lan then gives the leopard a piece of meat to eat, but they don't find anything unusual and begin to wonder as he didn't find anything wrong using the Nine Nether Souls technique. He questions what's going on. 
An eighth man then appears and reports that they followed the young master's instructions to secretly observe some villagers who ate the beef. After three hours, nothing interesting happened. Su Yunlan is surprised and questions if he only imagined it. Meanwhile, at an experimental camp, the second prince is just looking at the captives. A guy states that they are the refugees they captured four days ago. The second prince comments on their strength and questions if they are really refugees. The guy responds, stating that just yesterday, the group was very thin and weak, like dogs. However, overnight, they suddenly became incredibly strong. Eighth Man reported that they had conducted a survey of local taverns in the western region. As per the orders of the young master, apart from those around Volcano Town, most people in the western region were leaning towards the second prince. Lai Tang expressed his concern about this news. Su Yunlan pointed out that the survey only conveyed their weakness to the people of the west, and they needed to walk the path a bit longer to break their ingrained beliefs against women. He suggested that if they wanted their support, they needed to provide them with some real benefits. Yuan Ying interjected, saying that everyone in the western region knew that the second prince's resources were not inexhaustible, and that the current situation was nothing more than temporary. Su Yunlan responded by saying that the western region's tendency towards independence was both their biggest characteristic and their worst aspect. Yuan Ying asked if Su Yunlan meant to say that the people of the western region didn't communicate much among themselves. Su Yunlan replied that the cultural pattern of the Silk Road had already been established with regard to so-called economic development. He suggested sending out invitations to a massive fair they would hold at Volcano Town, inviting all the big traveling merchants of the western region. A group of men are discussing the clothing worn by the people who arrive in the western region, with one man remarking on how little they wear despite the cold. The woman is thinking that it's freezing, as it is her first time experiencing such weather. The man then explains to the woman that the crushed volcano rocks from the cliff can be used to stay warm. He gives her some of the rocks, which she finds to be effective in keeping her warm. Another man asks if the rocks are the town's most special product, and someone confirms that they use it to warm themselves, cook their food, and boil water. The man is impressed and wants to buy all the rocks. The person explains that the rocks aren't worth anything and that everyone in the town has some, going back to the time of Princess Hesu. The second man is intrigued and asks if this is the famous princess of the Tang Dynasty who was rumored to have driven away all the beasts by herself. He thinks that his trip to Volcano Town might not be in vain. Yuan Ying is addressing a group of individuals who have gathered. She thanks him for being present, acknowledging that some have traveled from faraway places. One of the men speaks up, addressing her as esteemed princess and expressing his curiosity about her rumored wisdom. The other man, who introduces himself as a humble merchant, then asks whether she has any plans to elevate the status of merchants, who are traditionally seen as occupying the lowest social rank. Yuan Ying responds by asking the men to consider the important role that merchants play. She notes that in the past, merchants were often viewed as opportunistic and focused only on profit, but she points out that they are responsible for bringing goods and information from far-off places. She poses a question to the men, asking if they would have ever known about the heat-emitting rock of Volcano Town if they had not traveled there themselves. One of the men admits that he had not known about it before, and Yuan Ying remarks that the experience has broadened his horizons. Yuan Ying responds to the man's comment, agreeing that the rock of Volcano Town is currently undervalued and can be bought low and sold outside for a higher price. She explains that she brought the group together to spread the word about the rock and start a company that can improve the living conditions of the people and help all merchants make money. However, some of the men are unfamiliar with the concept of a company and express their confusion. Yuan Ying explains that the company will establish teams of merchants to travel and gather information about special products, local demands, and habits, which will then be organized and shared with other merchants for a price. The men begin to see the potential benefits of this idea, as it would allow them to better understand where the rock is needed and cut back on unnecessary journeys. However, one man suggests that the company does not necessarily need a princess to operate. The man is deep in thought, pondering how easy it would be for his company to profit greatly from the secret information that this other company has access to. Yuan Ying told him that integrity and resources are the two most important aspects for a person in charge of a company. As Princess Tang Ying emphasizes her honesty and integrity, she goes on to say that her tavern chain can provide the necessary resources for his company. The chain is expanding and will soon spread throughout the western region providing services for all kinds of people. The men express their surprise at the idea of receiving a permanent 50% discount on drinks in the tavern, and recognize that this would significantly cut costs for their company. 
they acknowledge that Princess Tang Ying is the most sensible choice for the person in charge of the company. The merchant raises a valid concern, questioning how Princess Tang Ying benefits from offering a permanent 50% discount on drinks in her tavern chain in exchange for just a bit of information. In response, the princess reveals that her motive is to gain an advantage in the ongoing succession battle for the Tang Dynasty throne. She then lays out three conditions for being a part of the company. The first condition is that all transactions must be done under the name of the Ying Yun Company. The second condition is that all transactions must be fair and beneficial to both sides, ensuring a good reputation for the company. The third condition is to regularly fulfill the obligations of the company, including paying membership fees and providing important information. The merchant reflects on the conditions, realizing that the first condition carries significant weight as it would make the Ying Yun Company the only known company in the West. Western region. However, he also acknowledges that the second condition is crucial in building a good reputation for the company, which would make the first condition less of a concern. The third condition is seen as the foundation for the company's profits, as enough merchants joining and paying membership fees would sustain the company's operations. The man concludes that the princess's tavern chain has become the starting point for this promising company, which could ultimately benefit Princess Tang Ying in her succession battle. Yuan Ying recalls a conversation she had with Su Yunlan regarding the importance of information in the western regions. Su Yunlan emphasized that the company is not just about profits and prestige but also about gathering information on the people and transitions in the region. Yuan Ying remembers how Su Yunlan had envisioned the whole region being in their grasp once they have enough merchants in the company. Returning to the current situation, the merchant expresses his understanding and requests a few days to consider before giving their answer. Princess Tang Ying grants their request and informs them that registration Registration will take place in two days. She also reveals a bonus incentive for signing up on that day, which is VIP status and exemption from membership fees for the first two years. Two days later, they find themselves at the square, where a group of men is waiting patiently for their turn. The eighth man tells them not to rush and to wait their turn. Amidst it, in another place, Su Yun Lan stands on the cliff of a mountain and confidently states that whether Yinger becomes the empress or not, the western regions will belong to her and Tang Ying, not just the Tang dynasty. Meanwhile, in the evening, a group of men is gambling, eagerly waiting for the outcome of the game. One man complains that his desired outcome hasn't come out yet, while another laughs and boasts about his chances of winning. A merchant approaches and is invited to join them. The man introduces a new game, a board game invented by Prince Consort Su. He orders two bottles of wine and invites the merchant to join in, asking for his name. The merchant introduces himself as Jia Yu Ting, and the man reveals his name as Guo Ai, a small shop owner. Jia thinks that they seem familiar to him. The waiter, Zaior, recognizes Jia as a member of the Ying Yun Company and informs him that he gets a discount on his drinks. After Zhao Er leaves, Guo Ai asks Jia if he is a member of the Ying Yun Company. Jia confirms it, and Guo Ai expresses excitement about the company, saying that the tavern had previously informed him that the Ying Yun Company would bring great things. Suddenly, some men overhear their conversation and are surprised and excited, realizing that the long-awaited Ying Yun Company has finally arrived. Jia was standing amidst a group of people rushing towards him. Jia thought that the company was worth it as he looked at the pile of gold. He stated how the influence of the Ying Yun company was spreading quickly like a virus. The merchants of the western region were scrambling to join the company, not wanting to miss their golden opportunity, especially as the company had unexpectedly stopped accepting applications. In fact, there was a saying circulating among the traveling merchants which went like this, if you want to become rich, join the Ying Yun company. Meanwhile, in the Valley of the Wind, Yu and Mazen were in a battle against the Skull Demon soldiers. The Blood Skull appeared before them and engaged in a fight with Mazen. The Blood Skull acknowledged that Mazen had become stronger, but Mazen didn't seem to care, considering the Blood Skull an incompetent rat. The Blood Skull then attempted to attack Mazen using his claws, but Mazen easily dodged the attack. As they fought, a big tornado suddenly appeared. You warned Mazen about the deadly tornado, and the Blood Skull suggested that they retreat since the situation seemed impossible. However, before leaving, the Blood Skull snatched Zio Ying. Yu's younger brother and flew away. Mazen stopped Yu from running after them and told her to stay calm. Yu responded that the mysterious man used his inner strength to create the tornado and worried about how they could save Zio Ying. Mazen thought that this world could make him serious, but he didn't expect God to be somewhat tricky to deal with. He then released a power saying that they should lend light through the wind. Suddenly, Mazen used his skills to cast the thunder of heavenly envy. You then remembered a conversation in a book from the princess's library where a man asked the monk how powerful the most powerful human could be, to which the monk replied that perhaps enough so that even gods will be jealous. Back to reality, where thunder sticks in every direction, 
Mazen said that they should wait for God to come, and suddenly a loud bang struck. Mazen expresses regret for not having been more powerful in the past. He believes that if he had been, his son would not have had to suffer for three lifetimes. Suddenly, a loud explosion occurs, and it appears as if Mazen has been struck by lightning, causing the blood skull to turn in their direction. Later, Mazen and you are in the desert. You addresses Mazen, calling him my lord and asking if he is okay. Mazen responds that God has taken away half of his power, but this has only made him stronger. He suggests that they go and save Yin. At this point, the Blood Skull had hoped to achieve parity with Mazen using the power of the demon god, but he realizes that he overestimated himself. He plans to take Mazen's blood to make it easier for Solution Zero to achieve its goals. At the second prince's residence, a guard welcomes the prince back. The guard informs the prince that Baizu has gone out to catch Su Yun Lan personally, but the prince denies giving such an order. The guard then asks for a secret code that Baizu left for the prince, but the prince dismisses it as nonsense and demands to be let in. However, the guard becomes alarmed and thinks it is Su Yun Lan. One of his soldiers beside him says that the door is a little weird. Suddenly, the prince's guards rush in the front door and surround him. The guards then perform the heavenly formation that prevents him from entering his own house, leading to a confrontation with the general and his guards. The general states that Baizu told them that anyone who can't answer the secret code is Su Yun Lan, trying to steal classified information, and he accuses the second prince of pretending to be Su Yun Lan and demands that he surrenders. The second prince is surprised at the accusation and wonders what the secret code is. He tells them that he is the second prince and then orders them to put down their weapons. The general still does not believe him and orders one of the guards to attack the second prince, which surprises him as he almost gets killed by his guard. Suddenly, the wife of the second prince appears and defends him. She then splits her hands and attacks each of the guards, causing them to shiver and be terrified. The guard who previously spoke is overconfident about his promotion, but is suddenly killed as the door opens. Later, a man is talking to the prince's wife, who has finally come back after taking the latest solution zero. He mentions the need for powerful blood to develop the solution further. The second prince reassures his wife and promises to bring her back. Su Yunlan expressed surprise at the ruthless formation left for him by the second prince and his amazement that he survived it without Bai Zhu. Yun Ying, having personally witnessed the destructive power of the great heavenly formation during cultivation, claimed that she was powerless against it. Su Yunlan acknowledged that the second prince would not have survived if he were not capable and inquired about Emperor Tang's presence. The eighth man confirmed that the emperor had arrived and emissaries were traveling from various towns in the western region. Su Yunlan speculated that the emperor had come to bring the test in the western region to a close. Recalling the day when Su Yunlan requested One-Eye's help in killing two people in the snowfields, the one-eyed man agreed. He also instructed the other men at the Longman Tavern to begin collecting rations and volcanic rocks, reminding them not to let anyone notice. Su Yunlan then asked Yuan Ying to prepare to welcome their father, as he had a feeling that he would come to their place directly. After a while, the minister announced the arrival of Emperor Tang. Yuan Ying greeted her father with wishes for a long life. The royal majesty smiled and asked everyone to rise, commenting that his children, Yinger and Lear seemed to have lost weight. Su Yunlan still knelt and begged for his father's forgiveness, and the majesty asked what the matter was. He suggested they talk comfortably inside as it was very cold outside. Later, inside the tent, the majesty was mesmerized by the volcanic stone and praised the western region for its abundance of treasures. Yuan Ying informed him that she had arranged for the shipment of large quantities of volcanic rocks to the imperial capital. The Majesty commended his daughter's efforts and said that he had heard good news about their company on his way there, and it seemed that Yuan Ying had won the heart of the Western region. Yuan Ying responded that it was also a gift from her father to the people of the Western region. The Majesty then asked Su Yun Lan what he was begging forgiveness for. Su Yun Lan thought that the Majesty was a treacherous old guy, only eyeing the Ying Yun company up front and purposely leaving him hanging for so long. He then explained that his negligence had allowed concubine Zhang to escape and that he had planned to catch her during this trip to the western region but had never expected that the two would jump off a cliff while escaping. One Eye then appeared with a sack containing Zhang Fei and Meng, who had apparently been dead. The Majesty was surprised by the sudden appearance of One Eye with Zhang Fei and Meng's bodies in the sack. Yun Ying and Lai Tang were disbelieving of what they saw. The Majesty thought about Su Yun Lan's ruthlessness but also made sure that the others wouldn't have the opportunity to condemn him. He also thought that Su Yun Lan purposely let him know that he could no longer investigate. 
He then decided to let it slide and praise Su Yunlan for protecting him back then. The death of concubine Zhang could be considered offsetting his contributions to the western region. The Majesty believed that the Ying Yun Company was Su Yunlan's idea and asked him to explain how it operates. Su Yunlan thanked him, and the Majesty mentioned that he would be designating an heir to the throne in three days based on the people's votes from each town in the western region. He then questioned why he hadn't heard any news from his other children. Su Yunlan made a face and thought that the Majesty had forgotten about his children, telling him that they were busy with political affairs. In another place, the Majesty's brother appeared from the bushes while enjoying the fresh air, and his trip to the thousand-year-old tomb had not been in vain. He then decided to return to the mansion. However, he remembered that he needed to find his cheap old brother first. Chu Qi and his group were walking in the mountains. Chu Qi was skeptical, remarking that the group didn't look particularly special. The old man among the group chuckled in response, saying that although they may not be great fighters, their adventuring ability should not disappoint. He then called on his men to train hard and prove themselves to Master Chu. He ordered his men to be quick and show their worth to Chu Qi, to which the men agreed. The old man then invited Chu Qi to take a seat and wait while his men went to retrieve a map of the area. Suddenly, a flame phoenix appeared, startling the old men. The old man ordered his men to take it down, but before they could act, Chu Qi sprang into action, using his skills to defeat the fire phoenix. The old man was impressed by Chu Qi's abilities and praised him, telling his men to retrieve the defeated phoenix. Meanwhile, Mazen led Yu through the desolate valley, searching for her younger brother Xiao Ying. When they finally found him, he was crucified to a rock with a fire burning below him. Yu shouted for her brother and vowed to save him, but Mazen stopped her, cautioning her to wait. Out of nowhere, an arrow was fired at Yu from behind, and she attempted to avoid it, but she lost her balance after stumbling on a rock and still caught the arrow on her shoulder. Mazen jumped and saved her just in time. Blood Skull watched them from a distance, taunting Mazen and noting his change doubting that he would be the enemy of Heavenly Thunder. Mazen sensed the Blood Skull and declared his strength, threatening to kill him. The Blood Skull responded with a snide remark about Mazen's arrogance. He challenged Mazen, stating three possible outcomes, either Mazen would beat him first, Blood Skull would kill Mazen first, or the child present would burn to death first. In that moment, he snapped his fingers, making Xiao Ying begin to feel the burn on his legs, prompting Yu to call his name in concern. Blood Skull asked Mazen if he knew why he chose to fight him in that place. However, Mazen responded with confidence, suggesting that Blood Skull's plan had flaws. A fight ensued, with Blood Skull attacking Mazen with his claws, but Mazen was able to block it with his hands, and a sudden strike from the sky crashed to the ground. Blood Skull laughed at Mazen's inability to defeat him but then stabbed his hands into Xiao Ying's chest, causing him to scream out in pain. The Blood Skull then revealed his true intentions, laughing maniacally and stabbing his hands into Xiao Ying's chest, causing him to cry out in pain. Mazen recognized Blood Skull's technique as the Blood Prison, a prison built using the blood of disciples as a guide, and the Seven Mountains as a foundation. He realized that Blood Skull was behind the framing of King Qiu Lan by several martial arts sects, who surrounded them during their escape. Blood Skull expressed surprise at Mazen's knowledge, but Mazen responded with irritation and attacked him, causing him to be thrown away. Mazen then mentioned that if it weren't for Yunlan's return, Blood Skull would be dead. He then acquired Xiao Ying's body and made them both dissipate into thin air. Later on, while carrying Xiao Ying in his arms, Yu told Xiao Ying to wake up, trying to keep him from falling asleep. Mazen requested that Yu take care of Xiao Ying while he transferred the last trace of blood to him to help, to which Yu agreed. As Mazen was in the middle of doing the transfer, they were interrupted by a sudden noise behind him. Mazen realized that the blood prison had been activated and instructed Yu to destroy the blood pillar. Destroying it would prevent them from being trapped inside. He warned that being trapped inside the blood prison meant death, and it could only be broken from the outside by someone strong. After a while, Xiao Ying woke up from his sleep and smirked before suddenly transforming into a demon. It was revealed that Blood Skull had taken over Xiao Ying's body. He commented on the blood replacement method used to possess Xiao Ying's body, saying it was easy to use but slow to adapt. He instantly jumped fast and told Mazen that he would be trapped if he stayed there. In a later moment, he didn't expect the result of the experiment and felt even more powerful than before. He reveled in the pleasant surprise. He realized that he had gotten the blood of the strongest human in the world and that Mazen was now trapped for life. He then sent a message to Chu Qi and also felt something leaving his body. Meanwhile, Master Zhu spoke to Chu Qi, saying that the leader had referred to Chu Qi as a living king and that everything was in the hands of Master Chu, except for Chu Qi himself. Chu Qi responded to Master Zhu and said that the rest was up to him. 
He then added that his disciples were at work. Suddenly, a message from Blood Skull arrived, and Chu Qi read it immediately. The message stated that Mazen's blood had been recovered and that the purest number zero was just around the corner. Chu Qi seemed to understand the message. Master Zhu got freaked out about the lotus, and out of nowhere, Chu Qi noticed the appearance of the bird. Master Zhu quickly ordered his men, and they then caught the lotus. Master Zhu expressed excitement and joy, exclaiming that he had finally obtained the longevity lotus fruit after 13 years. Master Zhu discusses the acquisition of the everlasting lotus and the need to wait for Master's solution zero. He also mentions that they need to obtain the resentful crystal Mengpo from the thousand-year-old tomb, which is currently in the possession of another master. Master Zhu laughs and expresses confidence that combining the three items is just around the corner. Chu Qi responds with a dark smile and comments on how long Master Zhu has been out at sea for 13 years. Chu Qi sarcastically makes a dark comment about Master Zhu having a strong affection for the sea, suggesting to him that he may want to return for a short while. Late at night, at the princess's camp, Lai Tang questions Su Yunlan about whether he killed concubine Xiang. Su Yunlan denies the accusation, and Lai Tang expresses concern about Su Yunlan losing his humanity due to his thirst for power. Su Yunlan responds with a laugh, saying that if he were to become such a person, Lai Tang's sister would be the first to kill him. He Yan then chimes in, saying that he would be the first to castrate Su Yunlan. Yu Ning speaks up and asks about the whereabouts of concubine Xiang. In the mountain cave, Zhang Fei questions Meng about how he can eat a cute rabbit. Meng notices Zhang Fei's tears and teases her about it. Zhang Fei denies that she's crying and asks when they can eat the roasted rabbit. Meng thinks that women are scary. The wind starts to whistle. Suddenly, they see the shadow figure of a human in the trees and hear a voice calling out to Su Yun Lan, as the one-eyed man reveals himself. The one-eyed man tells Su Yun Lan that he has escorted someone, pointing to a general demon body. Su Yun Lan apologizes and tells him that he is familiar with the terrain and can easily sneak in. Su Yun Lan then asks Meng and Xiang Fei about their plan for the future and advises them that running away isn't the best solution, as the western region will fall into the hands of the Tang dynasty. Xiang Fei takes responsibility for the situation and blames herself. Meng responds with reassurance and expresses a commitment to their relationship. Xiang Fei responds by acknowledging the possibility of a worst-case scenario. Su Yunlan thinks that these two seem to have a penchant for risking their lives in the name of love. He then gives a letter to Xiang Fei and tells her to find a commander named Yahu, who will help them. Su Yunlan assures them that he will come to pick them up once he has won the western region and that he will keep them safe. Xiang Fei thanks Su Yunlan, calling him a second parent. Su Yunlan insists that they are friends. He asks if they have finished eating and suggests they get to work. In the evening, a group of guards discusses Su Yunlan's whereabouts. They express frustration over not being able to find any trace of him, despite shooting him with arrows. Suddenly, one of the guards spots a shadow in the forest and calls out, only to be swiftly killed by the general demon who is behind them. Xiang Fei comments on the demon's power. Later, Su Yunlan instructs Xiang Fei and Meng to ride a boat to the demon sect and deliver a package to Yahoo. As they leave, the demon general appears behind Su Yunlan, who tells the general demon that it's time to fight back. Back at the camp, Lai Tang is delighted and asks about the two corpses. Su Yunlan explains that he had the one-eyed man find some villains in the western region and change their appearance to match the corpses, ensuring that the authorities wouldn't connect them to him. However, Yuan Ying brings up another problem that still needs to be urgently addressed, to which Su Yun Lan responds that it needs to be done as soon as possible. At One-Eyed Guy's mountain stronghold, guards were playing outside. One-Eyed Guy apologized to Su Yun Lan for the guards' behavior and promised to discipline them properly once their game was over. However, Su Yun Lan told him it was not necessary and that he had given some thought to their situation. He proposed that instead of joining the army, they wait for the Ying Yun Company to become more prosperous. Those who were familiar with the dangerous roads in the western region would serve as guards and guides for the merchants. One-eyed guy expressed surprise at this proposal, stating that they used to specialize in robbing merchants, and he never expected that they would serve as their guards in the future. Inside the tent, two people were having a chicken fight. One person was cheering on Cherry, encouraging the chicken to take down the opponent on the other side. The other person laughed, claiming that his black bull was the king of chickens for three consecutive terms and that it was the best and one of a kind. As the fight between the chickens continued, the people around them cheered loudly. Eventually, the fight ended and it was revealed that Cherry had won. The person who had been cheering for Cherry was overjoyed and exclaimed that Cherry was the best and unbeatable. However, the other person was disappointed and thanked their black bull for its hard work, even though it was no longer the king of chickens. They acknowledged that being the king for three consecutive terms was proof of their worth, but they also seemed to be crying as they said it. Su Yunlan asked if they were the princes, to which Yuan Ying confirmed. 
One of the princes greeted Su Yun Lan and asked why he was interested in seeing them. Yu Ning explained that the result of the trial in Volcano Town would be announced by their father in two days. This news surprised the princes, who realized that the competition in the western region was coming to an end. The other prince lamented that happy times were always so short. The other prince brought up the fact that the Chicken King tournament had only been held six times so far. Then, one of the princes mentioned a newly organized tournament called Frog Hide and Seek. Su Yun Lang questioned them about the tournament, and the prince explained to him that each of the nine princes in the dungeon would send a frog to participate, and the goal was to catch each other's frogs with oil lamps. Some princes expressed excitement and confidence in their own animals, while others mocked them. Su Yun Lang thought that he didn't expect the mountain stronghold to become a reform house for the princes. Su Yun Lang then asked if they would be free to participate in the result announcement of the trial in the western region after two days, to which the princes confirmed. The princes then revealed that they understood he came to the stronghold to keep their imprisonment a secret, and that they had no intention of blackmailing him. He explained that they didn't want to fight for the throne until death like other members of their family and had been enjoying their time in the stronghold. He proposed a deal with Su Yun Lan, if he helped them stay in the western region after he took control of it, they would give up their claim to the stronghold. Su Yun Lan agreed but warned them that they might not be able to stay there for a long time. The prince accepted his offer. In a forest where guards are searching for something, they call out to the second prince and show him something they have found. The second prince is surprised and thinks that something has happened to Baizu. The guards explain that the residents have reported seeing Baizu with an entourage at the mansion. The second prince is surprised to hear this, as Baizu usually works alone. He suspects that Su Yun Lan might be behind this, but wonders how they were able to defeat Bai Zhu, who is known for her exceptional martial arts skills. The guards then inform the second prince that they have caught all the people who were scattered around the western region to send cattle and sheep. The second prince is pleased to hear this and asks if they have taken care of them. The guard confirms that they have all been taken care of, and the beasts in the forest will be able to feast on them that day. The guard then informs the second prince that they have caught someone else and brings the person up. The person pleads with the second prince to let him go and offers to negotiate and give him anything he wants. The second prince is intrigued and asks if he can really give him everything he wants. The guards then remove the sacks covering the person's face and reveal Jia. The second prince recognizes him as a member of the company, who are well informed and well connected. The second prince decides to take action and punches Jia in the stomach, causing him to open his mouth in pain. The second prince then throws a stone into Jia's mouth and orders the guards to take him back. He informs them that in three days, his father will announce the trial result of the western region, and it will be impossible for Su Yun Lan to escape. In Volcano Town Square, the royal majesty asks why the second prince hasn't arrived yet. The other prince responds that something must have delayed him. Su Yun Lan urges them to start, and the majesty addresses the people of the western region. The majesty declares that he is the emperor and master of the Tang dynasty and that since its establishment, the dynasty has always cared for its people and aimed to save the world as a whole. He acknowledges that the Tang Dynasty is now the strongest in the world, despite the undermining efforts of some ministers. Su Yun Lan wonders whether the people of the Western region will truly become happier under the Tang Dynasty's rule. The Majesty then announces that the Tang Dynasty plans to establish a ferry crossing point between the Western region and the Central Plain, aiming for better communication and a better life in a troubled land. He reveals the results of a trial where their children experienced life in the western region and choose the best child to become the leader of the western region. The minister then takes over and announces the trial result, mentioning the feedback from the people of each town and the reports submitted by the Imperial Guard. This prompts Su Yun Lan to think that they didn't know the Imperial Guard was present the whole time. The minister announces that the winner and the most supported challenger of the trial in the western region is Princess Tang Ying. However, in the middle of the announcement, a person chokes and collapses. Su Yun Lan notices that many people are collapsing. Meanwhile, the Majesty demands to know what's happening and orders his people to wake them up. The minister follows the order and tries to wake up one of the people by slapping their faces, but he is shocked to see blood on the person's cheeks. Suddenly, the second prince appears and accuses Su Yun Lan of harming the people of the western region by taking advantage of the trial and claims that her conspiracy has been exposed. He demands that Su Yun Lan give himself up and confess to what he has done. The Majesty expressed disbelief. The second prince then entered, apologizing for being late, and explained that he was looking for evidence. The Majesty demanded an explanation, and the second prince ordered a guard to bring someone named Jia Yuiting up to them. 
The second prince initially thought that his sister and prince consort Su had set up the Ying Yun Company to bring a better life to the people in the western region. But he discovered that the merchants from the Ying Yun Company were smuggling poisons. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan looked at Yu and Ying, and they exchanged thoughts. Yun Lan said that it seemed like the second prince had some tricks up his sleeve and it was likely that something had gone wrong. Yu and Ying, on the other hand, thought that no matter how it turned out later, they should run. The second prince presented more evidence to support his claims. He explained that people in other towns were losing consciousness one after the other, coinciding with the establishment of the Ying Yun Company. He further revealed that after his investigation, it was indeed the Ying Yun Company that was responsible for the poison. Jia supported the second prince's claims and accused Princess Tang Ying and Prince Consort Su Yun Lan of poisoning their food on the pretext of providing it at a low cost. He also mentioned that they were all heavily poisoned and forced to help poison the people, or else they would not receive the antidote regularly. The royal majesty ordered the minister to give the antidote to the fainted emissary. The minister confirmed that the antidote worked. The majesty then asked if anyone had dealt with the merchants from the Ying Yun Company. The person responded that he was in charge of the investigation and stayed at the Longman Tavern, and bought volcanic rock from the company's merchants. The second prince confronted Su Yun Lan, accusing him of being responsible for the poison. He said that the emissary was poisoned after having close contact with their company and tavern and warned that the other towns in the western region must also be affected. He demanded that Su Yun Lan hand over the antidote, or the consequences would be disastrous. The majesty addressed Yu and Ying and Yun Lan, asking them what they had to say. Yu and Ying responded by denying any wrongdoing and arguing that it was unreasonable to ask an innocent person to prove their innocence. The second prince then accused Yun Lan of being an insidious villain, and the majesty ordered for Su Yun Lan to be arrested and an investigation to be launched to protect the poisoned and unconscious people. Yu and Ying objected to her father's decision, insisting that Yun Lan was innocent and offered offering to be arrested along with him. The Majesty became angry with his daughter's defiance and accused her of trying to revolt. Yu and Ying apologized and promised to investigate the matter further, then left with Su Yun Lan. However, they were stopped by a mysterious person who captured them using spells. Yu and Ying was surprised by the person's abilities and commented on his skill in manipulating inner force. She then attacked the person, but her attack was deflected, causing a loud explosion. The second prince appeared, protecting the mysterious person from a knife attack, causing the knife to be in the direction of the majesty. Someone alerted the majesty to watch out. Bai Yun breaks the knife, calls majesty his brother, and asks how he will survive without him. The majesty is surprised and feels relieved at Bai Yun's return after a long absence. The second prince offers to personally lead a chase, but majesty tells him there's no need for that, as Bai Yun has returned and will handle it. Bai Yun greets Majesty as a good leader, and the second prince thinks about the sudden appearance of so many uncles after a long time. He also notices a crystal that Majesty is holding. Majesty then orders the remaining Imperial Guards to catch Ying Er's men, and the second prince acknowledges his father's command. In the princess's camp, the second prince orders the Imperial Guard to search the camp. The Imperial Guard reports that the people in the camp have already left. The second prince is disappointed and criticizes the Imperial Guards for not being able to find a few people. He senses a murderous aura around them and realizes he cannot offend the Imperial Guards since they are under the control of his uncle and father and have the right to act first, and report later. The second prince asks the Imperial Guards to search the area carefully for any clues, and the guards continue their search. Suddenly, a snake attacks the Imperial Guards, and one of the guards suggests burning the snake. The head Imperial Guard notices that something isn't right as he can smell fuel oil. He tries to warn them to stop, but it's too late as the area suddenly explodes due to the fuel oil, burning everything in the princess's camp. The Imperial Guard realizes that whoever attacked the camp anticipated their move to use fire, and poured fuel oil on the area to destroy any evidence. As a result, there are no traces left for them to search. In a carriage where Yu and Ying is seen puking blood due to a recent fight she had encountered, Su Yun Lan asks if she is alright, and Yu and Ying replies that she's feeling much better. Yu and Ying informs Su Yun Lan that the person she fought was the second prince's wife. She tells him that she saw her face when her sword energy cut a small opening in her black cloth. Su Yun Lan is surprised to hear this news and thinks that things are getting more complicated. He then asks Yi Yan about the other members of the 8th group, and Yi Yan assures him that he has already arranged everything and left no traces. Su Yun Lan is pleased with how Yi Yan gets things done and hopes to meet up with him near the dock soon. In the distance, Bai Yun watches the carriage fleeing away. He then attacks the carriage, causing it to lose balance and fall. Bai Yun demands that Yu Ying surrender herself, but when he destroys the carriage, he finds no one inside it. He realizes that it was a diversion tactic and laughs at himself for not being able to tell the trick apart. Bai Yun demands to know where Su Yun Lan is and promises to spare their lives if they tell him. 
However, the eighth man refuses to divulge any information and sacrifices themselves by cutting their neck, showing their loyalty to Su Yun Lan. The man thinks about his past, remembering how he was not skilled in martial arts or devising schemes, and therefore was not treated well in his sect, leading to feelings of humiliation. Su Yun Lan then speaks, asking the man if he would like to be his subordinate. He tells him that he likes him very much and that he doesn't have to practice martial arts, just continue to display their brilliant ideas. He assures him that as long as he has eight groups, he can get any information he needs. Back in reality, the two eighth men think about how it's an honor to meet Su Yun Lan and smile after they die. Bai Yun calls the two men brave little fellows but questions if they really think he can't do anything about it. He tells them that it's just a matter of time before he catches up to them. In that moment, Bai Yun catches up with them and claims that although he's been underground for years, he has been getting better at finding directions. He then calls out to Yuan Ying, calling him uncle, and comments on how it's been a while. Bai Yun then remarks that he met Ying Er once when he first entered the capital and never expected him to become the top prince consort in the Tang Dynasty in such a short time and cause so much trouble. Su Yun Lan responds by telling Bai Yun not to make him laugh and that he would never do something he'd be ashamed of and denies any knowledge of sudden accidents in the western regions. Bai Yun tells Su Yun Lan that it's no use explaining himself to him and that he should persuade his brother instead. Bai Yun remarks that since Su Yun Lan can train such good subordinates that are willing to sacrifice their lives for him, he won't fight him. Su Yun Lan is surprised to hear Bai Yun mention subordinates willing to sacrifice their lives for him. Bai Yun then tells Su Yun Lan to be a good boy and turns back. Su Yun Lan turns to He Yan and asks Bai Yun what happened to his subordinates, and Bai Yun reveals that they are dead. Upon hearing this, Su Yun Lan suddenly attacks Bai Yun. He Yan intervenes, telling Yun Lan to stop. Bai Yun comments that Su Yun Lan's impulsiveness will never make him a capable man. He then blocks Su Yun's attack with his martial arts technique and remarks that Yun Lan's power is too weak. Bai Yun looks towards the upcoming swords and dodges them. Suddenly, a demon general appears on his back and attacks him. But Bai Yun blocks the attack. He is surprised that it was a demon general attacking him, thinking it was an ambush. He Yen expresses concern about Su Yun Lan's current state, saying that he is blinded by anger and is no match for Tang Bai Yun. However, Yuan Ying interrupts and tells everyone to get on the carriage and head to the dock immediately. She tells He Yan that, according to what Su Yun Lan said earlier, he purposely allowed the demon general to take him away to create the impression that the demon general appeared out of nowhere. Yuan Ying explains that if Su Yun Lan didn't get rid of the demon, it would cause trouble for humans, and her uncle is confident in his own ability to find them, even if they have a head start. Suddenly, someone appears and asks where Su Yun Lan is. He Yan responds that he went into the woods. Yuan Ying suggests they rendezvous with the troops, and Yun Lan will be okay. A loud blast is heard in the forest. Bai Yun is shocked and wonders how there could be such a vicious demon general in the western region. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan, who is in the body of a demon, realizes that he's in trouble and needs to think of something else to avoid getting caught. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan stops and throws his human body at Bai Yun, who is surprised by the unexpected move. Then, the general demon punches Bai Yun in the face, creating another loud bang. Su Yun Lan is pleased with the outcome, thinking that Bai Yun has fallen for his trap. Bai Yun, recovering from the punch, is surprised to realize that the beast actually has intelligence. He yells at the demon, telling him that he's angered him, and throws a kunai towards Su Yun Lan. However, Su Yun Lan is worried that the kunai might hit him and thinks that he might lose his head. Fortunately, the kunai is deflected by another weapon. Bai Yun wonders who could have deflected his attack, and then Yahu appears and attacks him. Bai Yun manages to dodge the attack, but suddenly Su Yun Lan's body and Yahu disappear. He wonders where they went and realizes that if Su Yun Lan and Yahu are on the same side, he can't pursue them alone. A few moments later, Yahu asks Su Yun Lan about his demon's whereabouts. Su Yun Lan reassures him that his demon will come back to find him once he finishes eating in the forest. Su Yun Lan then mentions that Commander Yi arrived just in time. Yahu expresses his surprise at receiving He Yan's emergency signal as soon as he arrived, which is why he had to come to the mountain one step ahead of the troops. He tells Su Yun Lan that they'll talk about what happened when they get back and that he has something to tell him. Su Yun Lan asks Yahu what it is, and Yahu reveals that something has happened to the demon lord. At the emperor's camp, the majesty comments that he didn't expect his little brother to be defeated, expressing a rare occasion. Bai Yun shrugs and responds, saying that he didn't expect Su Yun Lan to have the power of controlling demons. He further adds that Su Yun Lan's absence for so many years is the reason he fell for his trap. The second prince thinks about his uncle's arrogant and obstinate attitude. He vows to find out what happened to him after disappearing for so many years. Bai Yun then asks the second prince to get up and speak, indicating that he has kneeled long enough. The majesty orders him to get up. The second prince admits to his incompetence in letting Su Yun Lan escape and failing to arrest his henchmen in time. 
he further confesses to sacrificing two of the Imperial Guards and asks for his father and uncle to punish him. Bai Yun interrupts, asking the second prince what he means by punishment and stating that the Imperial Guards died because they were useless. An Imperial Guard speaks up, saying that they are only rats in front of the Emperor of the Tang Dynasty, and the commander. The second prince thinks that the imperial guard is a good one and that he could never get his own servants to say such inhumane words. The majesty then tells the second prince to forget about punishment, stating that his timely exposure is already useful enough. He then asks the second prince if he knows of any master in the western region who can go head to head with the uncle. The second prince replies that there isn't anyone who is good at fighting or a so-called master there, and he deduces that the one who saved Su Yun Lan must not be from the western region. Bai Yun adds that the person must be from the Tang Dynasty. The Majesty suggests that the only person who can come from the demon sect is probably the commander of the Black Knight, Yehu, who kills and destroys many demons. Bai Yun thinks that it must be him and that Xu and Qi had such a brilliant eye for spotting talent. The Majesty tells the second prince to leave it to his uncle and the Imperial Guards to capture Su Yun Lan, and that the top priority is to calm down the people in the western region and rescue the unconscious villagers as soon as possible. The second prince assures his father that he has already sent someone to study the antidote provided by Jie Yuiding, and he believes there will be results soon. He thinks that Su Yun Lan will never escape from the western region and will ultimately fall into his hands, including his tavern. He laughs maniacally. Bai Yun suggested to the Majesty that he believed Ying Er would be a better fit for the position of ruler. The Majesty responded, acknowledging that he also believed Ying Er would be a more suitable ruler. However, he then added that it did not really matter who became the next ruler since they already had Meng Po in their possession. The Majesty concluded by stating that he intended to remain the ruler of the Tang Dynasty. Bai Yun was surprised and responded with silence. At the camp, where Yuan Ying asks what happened to her stepfather, Yahu explains that every senior member of the demon sect leaves a trail of their blood in the core of the Great Mountain Defense Formation to light up the ever-burning lamps. Once the ever-burning lamp stops burning, it means that the owner's presence has completely disappeared from this world. Yuan Ying says that before she came to the camp, she saw the demon lord's ever-burning lamp extinguished. Yuan Ying turns to Su Yun Lan and asks what they should do. Su Yun Lan explains the situation, according to Commander Yi. His father might be in a dire situation and is cut off from the outside world, but he assures everyone that his father has Yu and Ying, who are skilled in survival. He also reminds them that they are far away in the western region and cannot do anything to help at the moment. He Yan apologizes for concealing what the 8th group was doing from Su Yun Lan, but Su Yun Lan reassures him that it is not his fault. He blames himself for letting his guard down and not expecting the second prince to have a trick up his sleeve. He also warns everyone not to sacrifice themselves for him in the future, stating that he only wants to bring a good life to those who believed in him. Meanwhile, Yahoo thought that Su Yun Lan had grown tremendously by exhibiting such a fearless attitude in a dangerous situation. Su Yun Lan then explains that they are in a terrible situation, and Tang Bai Yun and the Imperial Guard will come for them soon. He also reveals that he asked Mrs. Yang and her husband to send a message to Commander Yi and ask for the Black Knight as soon as possible. He noted that if he had not done so, all their efforts in the Western region would have been ruined. Yahu asks about the reason for bringing the Black Knight to the Western region and giving up protecting the Demon Sect. Su Yun Lan explains that everyone in the Demon Sect, except for Commander Yi, the Black Knight, and the Eighth Group, are all Chu Qi's men, so it does not mean much to protect them. He also reveals that he wants to build their base in the western region, so it is better to have the Black Knight stay there for good. He yet asks Su Yun Lan what their plan is now. Su Yun Lan replies that they should attack the snow-capped mountain. Yi Yan is surprised by this suggestion. Su Yun Lan suspects that the second prince is hiding something in the snow-capped mountain because of the sudden illness of people in the western region and the prince's wife's mysterious power. He Yan expresses concern that they might be stopped by the Imperial Guards before they can reach the snow-capped mountain, given the large number of people in their group. Su Yun Lan counters by saying that their biggest advantage at this moment is that no one knows that they know the location of the second prince's secret base. As long as they move quickly, they will be able to infiltrate the snow-capped mountain before the second prince can take notice. Therefore, he plans to send only a handful of elites to carry out the infiltration. Yahoo agrees that it is a good idea to attack the mountain while the second prince is unprepared, but he asks if they have specific intel on the mountain. Su Yun Lan admits that they do not, but he believes that the second prince's military strength is weak. Yahoo suggests making a prompt decision to kill whoever stands in their way. Su Yun Lan agrees but suggests taking a quick break first. He then instructs Commander Yi to take 50 black knights and follow him to attack the base on the snow-capped mountain with a one-eyed guy leading the way. Yuan Ying expresses interest in following Su Yun Lan, 
but he tells her that her wounds have not entirely healed, and she is given an important mission to dispatch the Black Knights. Yi-Yan is also given the right to dispatch the Black Knights and is asked to support ying -er by taking charge of the eight groups, which are a primary source of intel. The purpose of these assignments is to deal with Tang Baiyun's Imperial Guards and delay them for more time. Su Yun Lan informs them that the 8th group is not inferior to the Imperial Guard in terms of collecting intel. He leaves the battle in Yi Yan's hands but reminds him not to engage in a head-on confrontation with Tang Baiyun as he is incredibly scary. Their main objective is to rescue the key members of the Ying Yun Company and the Tavern, which are crucial cornerstones for their base in the western region and cannot be abandoned. Su Yun Lan leaves this task to Yuan Ying, saying that it is equivalent to meeting the second prince head-on. The eighth man assures Su Yun Lan that they will not let him down. Yuan Ying then chimes in and tells Su Yun Lan to bring the phoenix sword with him. Su Yun Lan is about to speak but is cut off by Yuan Ying telling him to stop nagging and suddenly kisses him, surprising He Yan and Yahoo who were also there. Yuan Ying declares that the Black Knight is her sword now, and Su Yun Lan's face turns red with shock, while he instructs that they can go and advises them to be safe. He then regains his composure and reminds everyone that they must win the Battle of the Snow-Capped Mountain. He goes on to explain that winning this battle will send a signal, and when the time comes, the Black Knight will attack and take down the Second Prince. At the snow-capped mountains, a one-eyed man informs Su Yun Lan and his team that there is a hidden cave up ahead that leads to the secret base. Meanwhile, in the wilderness, Yu asks the Demon Lord, Ma Zun, about the condition of Xiao Ying, whom Ma Zun believes is not dead but he is unsure of his consciousness. Ma Zun explains that Su Yun Lan once said that Ying has a unique physique, and he set a restriction on him, so it's possible that he is still alive. Yu blames herself for being too impulsive and almost leading Ma Zun to danger, but Ma Zun reassures her that it's all in the past and there's no point in blaming herself. Yu wonders when the Demon Lord became so gentle and asks about the heavenly thunder that had just occurred, and if he is really alright. Ma Zun replies that he didn't change, he came back. He explains that he had reversed his cultivation and became a demon when he was framed by the famous and upright sects. This affected his mentality, and he forgot all his emotions and desires while possessing substantial power at the same time. The heavenly thunder destroyed all his demon energy, and his original inner energy was already fragile since he confirmed that Su Yun Lan was back. Ma Zun declares that he, Xu and Qiu Yi, is back. Yu almost forgets that the Demon Lord is someone with blood and flesh. Mazen then explains that the most important thing right now is to find a way to break through the formation, which is so firm that they couldn't even make a scratch on it. Yu suggests trying to get out from below. Yu and Mazen explore a deep hole where they couldn't hear the sound of the ghost-faced man's corpse crashing. Yu thinks that something doesn't feel right, and Mazen smells blood, indicating that something is approaching them. They hide as a fire salamander appears, and Yu realizes that it must have eaten the ghost-faced man's corpse. Yu suggests following the salamander, and Mazun agrees. Yu then tells Mazun that if there are living things, there's water, and following the water could lead them out. They set off to follow the fire salamander. Mazun states that the fire salamander's lair is just ahead. As they approach the area, Mazun comments that they must be in the salamander's territory and suggests they look for a water source. Yu agrees and heads to the back. Suddenly, Mazun urgently tells her to get out of the way. A snake then attacks Yu, and the ground starts rumbling. The large snake appears in front of them, facing off with the salamander. Mazun asks Yu if she is alright and proceeds to carry her to safety. Yu's face turns red, and she responds that she is okay and asks Mazun to put her down. In her thoughts, Yu scolds herself for letting her imagination run wild in such a dangerous situation. The fight between the salamander and the snake intensifies, with the snake spitting poison and launching physical attacks to subdue the salamander. Yu observes that the snake must be an overlord-ranked monster, and its appearance in the salamander's territory suggests they have a grudge against each other. Mazen tells Yu to focus on protecting herself while he takes on the snake thinking that he needs to target the snake's vital area. Mazen engages in a fierce battle with the snake, but even his dragon bone subdual spell fails to fully suppress it. However, suddenly the fire salamander intervenes and attacks the snake with a fireball, causing it to scream in pain and fall. Mazen realizes that the fire salamander is intelligent. After the snake is defeated, Mazen approaches the salamander and proposes a deal. He tells the salamander that it can consume the snake's body to become the ruler of the underground world. In exchange, Mazen only wants a piece of the snake's scales in hopes that the salamander can help them find a way out to the surface. The salamander nods in agreement. Mazen then calls out to you to join them. After some time, they finally find the exit and successfully escape. Mazen expresses his gratitude to the salamander. Mazen bids farewell to the salamander and says that they will meet again someday. Mazen and you prepare to leave. Su Yun Lan and Yahoo arrive at the second prince's base camp, located on a snow-capped mountain. Su Yun Lan comments that they have finally made it and notes that it's a completely different world. 
He warns Yahoo to be careful. Yahoo expresses concern about the Black Knights who accompanied them, mentioning that they have already dispersed. Su Yunlan hopes that the Imperial Guard won't be able to track them for now, but he knows that he will have to ask Commander Yi to break in with him later. Yahoo tries to reassure Su Yunlan that it's just a camp and tells him not to worry. Suddenly, they are caught by guards who demand to know who they are and capture them. Su Yunlan and Yahoo exchange a look and quickly attack the guards with their swords. The guards shout for help, and more guards appear, commanding them to shoot Su Yunlan and Yahoo to death. The guards call for reinforcements, and Su Yun Lan realizes that the second prince has allocated a lot of resources to guard this secluded place. He knows they must finish their mission quickly. At the top of the snow capped mountain, a mysterious person comments that he didn't expect to meet Su Yun Lan and the talented demon sect after returning. He decides that he has to give them an enormous gift. The mysterious person snaps his fingers, causing a sudden red lightning bolt to strike the mountain, which makes the guards collapse. Su Yun Lan is shocked and confused by what has happened, wondering what is going on. Suddenly, both Su Yun Lan and Yehu are locked in a blood prison. Su Yun Lan realizes that all the guards who just came to reinforce their allies suddenly collapsed because they were used as sacrifices for the formation. Yehu is concerned about what's happening and asks Su Yun Lan what is going on. Su Yun Lan admits that he doesn't even know, but they can't afford to waste time worrying about it. Su Yun Lan uses his iron technique to break the blood prison, and he breathes heavily after his attack. Su Yun Lan and Yehu are struggling to find a weak spot in the formation that has trapped them. The mysterious person tells them to take their time, and they will meet again. Su Yun Lan comments on how complicated the formation is and how it uses living sacrifices to function, showing its vicious power. He realizes that there must be a master behind it all. Yahoo asks what they should do, but they don't even know what formation it is or how to break it. Suddenly, Mazen appears and tries to attack the blood prison where Su Yun Lan and Yahoo are trapped. Su Yun Lan is bewildered until Ma Zen arrives and explains that they are facing the strongest trapping formation in the world, known as the Blood Prison, which can only be broken from the outside. Ma Zen tells Su Yun Lan to spare the courtesy and acknowledge that they have finally met. Yu greets Su Yun Lan, calling him Young Master and says that it has been a long time since they last saw each other. Su Yun Lan then greets his sister, Yu, and asks his father Ma Zen, who suddenly appeared in the western region, if they are all right. He also asks if something happened to them because he heard from Uncle Yahoo that their ever-burning lamp went out. Mazen explains that they were able to find their way there thanks to the trace of energy that Su Yun Lan left behind with the Nine Circles of Hell's ultimate technique, Demonic Possession. Su Yun Lan realizes that it is the mark he left inside Xiao Ying and asks where he is. He also asks why only Mazen and Yahoo are there. Mazen urges them to leave the area first because they are still unaware of the dangers that may be hiding in the snow-capped mountain. He tells them that they will talk after. Later, in the cave under the snow-capped mountain, Su Yun Lan expresses shock upon hearing that Xiao Ying was possessed by the ghost face man. Yu confirms that Xiao Ying went missing after being possessed. However, Su Yun Lan assures Yu that they can bring Xiao Ying back as long as they find his body. Mazen then interrupts to tell Su Yun Lan about the blood prison formation that was used to trap them before, which is the same formation that was just used. This revelation flabbergasts Su Yun Lan, who realizes that it must be connected to their sect's enemy. Mazen suggests that the second prince is likely behind it all and that they should capture him to reveal the truth. He then asks why Ying Er is not with them, and Su Yun Lan explains that she and He Yan are dealing with the Imperial Guard led by Tang Bai Yun. Mazen recognizes Tang Bai Yun and decides to take him on, while Su Yun Lan and Ying Er go after the second prince. Yehu is instructed to reassign the Black Knight since it is time to show the Imperial Guard their power as the world's number one cavalry. Su Yun Lan expresses admiration for his father. At the second prince's camp, where the second prince is speaking to his wife, he tells her that if she drinks all the medicine that was given to her, she can come back to him. He declares that he does not care about the western region or the throne, as those things are just a show for others, and he will do anything as long as she comes back. The wife weakly responds, calling him Highness. The second prince is overjoyed and tells his guards to prepare for his wedding with his best attire, to which the guard agrees. The maidservant is confused and asks why the prince would want to marry a corpse. The guard then discusses how his majesty did not approve of the marriage initially, and how everyone in the imperial capital knew about it. The maidservant remarks on how it will be dreadful to have no guests present at the wedding. Meanwhile, in the camp, Su Yun Lan asks the eighth man who the second prince is marrying. The eighth man tells him that he is marrying the same special lady everyone has heard of. He then realizes that this lady is the prince's dead wife and wonders why he is marrying her again. 
Yuaning interjects and explains that their father did not approve of their marriage initially, which is why they did not get married before her death. After her accident, her brother kept her corpse with him and claimed her as his wife to the public, even though they were never married before her death. Su Yunlan suggests taking advantage of the second prince's infatuation by infiltrating the inner courtyard. The eighth man reports that only a few servant girls are allowed to enter and leave the inner courtyard, while the others are confined outside in the outer courtyard. Su Yunlan comes up with a plan to dress up as a woman. Yuaning questions Su Yunlan's motives, but he assures her that he is sacrificing himself for a greater cause. Yuaning agrees to go along with the plan and offers to provide clothes and cosmetics, but Su Yunlan insists on taking care of it himself. Yuaning expresses her doubts to the eighth man about Su Yunlan's true intentions, which the eighth man denies. Inside the second prince's camp, a group of women talk about the makeup of another woman. They comment that her makeup looks weird and is more suited for a funeral than a wedding. One of the women can't help but laugh, but the other urges her to keep her voice down. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan and Yuan Ying are disguised as maidservants and are walking inside the second prince's camp. Su Yun Lan is pleased with his makeup and believes it is in line with current fashion trends. He asks Yuan Ying if his makeup looks bad, to which she tries to hold back her laughter and assures him that it looks great. Suddenly, the second prince appears and confronts Su Yun Lan about his makeup. Yuan Ying panics, realizing that they were discovered too soon and that Su Yun Lan's disguise might be exposed. However, to her surprise, the second prince finds Su Yun Lan's makeup very cute and orders all the other maidservants to copy it. He then dismisses everyone except Su Yun Lan, who is ordered to serve the lady he is guarding. Su Yun Lan serves inside the tent. Later, while serving tea, Yuan Ying pushes the second prince to save him from an attack by his wife. The second prince then pushes Yuan Ying in response, and Su Yun Lan states that the second prince is ungrateful. He then possesses the second prince's wife with a demonic possession technique, his body passes out, and Yuan Ying tries to wake him up. Inside the second prince's wife's spirit world, he spots a demon's head, confirming his suspicions that it is connected to the demons and says that he has never lost a battle in the spirit world. Su Yunlan looked at a floating pink orb, his thoughts centered on the possibility that the orb may be the spirit of the second prince's wife. Suddenly, the orb began to shine very brightly, surprising Su Yunlan and making him wonder what was happening. In the memory of the second prince's wife, there was a place in the teahouse where she realized that by pretending to be an opera performer, she could easily use this as a way to gain some personal benefits. She suddenly spotted a man and indicated that she had found her target. She then acted and fell in front of the man, hoping to garner his attention and help. The man noticed her and rushed to help her, asking if she was okay. She thanked him for his help and called him sir. The man replied, saying that she was too polite and not to mention it. The man was actually the second prince from the past. He noticed her strange makeup and began to feel that something was amiss. Suddenly, he realized that his pouch was missing and began to panic. He frantically looked around, trying to figure out where the woman may have gone. Meanwhile, the woman was feeling delighted after having successfully stolen the second prince's money. She was happy with her accomplishment and was about to make her escape when the second prince suddenly yelled at her to stop. She was surprised and wondered how he found out so quickly. Despite his angry protests, the woman ran away, the second prince seething with anger and vowing to catch the woman. The second prince chased the woman into the woods by the river. He thought that the woman was too good at running and was surprised that she ran towards the outskirts. As he was searching for the woman, he heard her talking on top of a tree. She taunted him and asked if he was giving up, to which he replied that he dared her to stop running. She dared him to come and chase her and made a strange gesture. Suddenly, a man showed up behind the second prince and pierced a knife into his back. The second prince recognized the man's attire and realized that he was an assassin from the barbarians. The barbarian revealed that he had captured the second prince and taunted him, saying that he wouldn't live much longer. He decided to leave the second prince to perish on his own and walked away. The second prince was left alone, wounded, and in danger of dying. He thought about his dire situation and wondered if he'd ever make it out alive. The woman saw it and wondered if the person she saw was a barbarian and if there was a personal vendetta involved. She decided to investigate and went down to check. She saw the second prince who was badly injured and wondered if she should save him. She hesitated and decided not to meddle in someone else's business as she feared that the person with the knife might come back. When she was going to leave, the second prince then coughed repeatedly, trying to get the attention of his woman. The woman turned back in his direction. 
After some time, the second prince woke up and was surprised to find himself in an unknown place. He asked where he was, and the woman told him that he had been asleep for a few days. She offered him food and asked if he was hungry. The second prince wondered who she was. The second prince admires the woman's beauty. He asks her who she is, and she responds by handing him his pouch. The prince is surprised and recognizes the woman as the thief who stole his pouch earlier. He accuses her of being a thief, but she defends herself by saying that she only took the money as a fee for her errands. The prince realizes that he was wrong and thanks her for saving him. He mentions a jade bird in the pouch, which is a family heirloom that his mother left for him. The second prince then explains that the bird symbolizes finding true love. The woman listens attentively and learns about the significance of the bird. The prince becomes shy as the woman gets closer to him. Yunduo apologizes for not knowing that the jade bird was left by the second prince's mother. The second prince reassures her that he is not upset and is grateful that she returned the bird to him. The woman then suggests taking care of the second prince since he is injured, and it is her way of apologizing. She introduces herself as Yun Duo and asks for the second prince's name. He introduces himself as Tang Er. Yun Duo decides to call him Zio Er from now on. The second prince is a little taken aback by her sudden change in attitude. He thinks that she has a nice smile and starts to fall in love with her. The two continue to live together for a while, with the second prince fishing in the river while Yun Duo takes care of the cooking and washing. They even go to the market together where Yun Duo shows the second prince a pin, but he rejects it. However, Yun Duo talks to the seller, making the second prince wonder what they are discussing. One day, the second prince tells Yun Duo that he wants to take her somewhere. Yun Duo agrees, and they go on a walk. The second prince then tells her that he wrote a poem for her, and Yun Duo eagerly takes the letter from his hands to read it. The poem is an acrostic poem, and the letter of each line spells out Tanger and Yun Duo will be together forever and ever. Yun Duo laughs at first but then demurely tells Tanger that she loves the poem. The second prince then asks Yun Duo if they can live together there for the rest of their lives, to which she agrees. Six months had passed since the guards found the second prince. Yun Duo was surprised to learn that Tang Er, whom she had been with, was actually a prince. The second prince apologized for not revealing his true identity earlier to Yun Duo. He assured her that he would return soon as soon as he was done with his business and asked her to wait for him. Yun Duo watched him leave. In the Imperial Palace, the second prince refused to marry someone else. The minister discussed the ongoing war between the Tang Dynasty and the barbarians at the border and suggested that the best way to stop the war was through marriage. However, the second prince was firm in his decision and promised Yun Duo that she would be his wife for the rest of his life. Nevertheless, the majesty dismissed the idea of Yun Duo marrying into the royal family, stating that she was a commoner's daughter and could not enter the royal family. Moreover, the majesty questioned whether Yun Duo had the same feelings toward the second prince. The second prince responded passionately, stating that they were in love and that Yun Duo had saved his life. He argued that she was worthy of marrying into the royal family. The majesty questioned whether Yun Duo was even alive and demanded that if she wanted to marry into the royal family, she must at least be alive. The second prince looked surprised by what the majesty had told him. In a wooden house where the second prince called out to Yun Duo, he found her lying in bed with a letter. He then read the letter, which apologized for not knowing much about politics and not being able to hold him back. He seemed saddened by the contents of the letter. Suddenly, an ornament fell out of the envelope, reminding the second prince of a time when they were in the marketplace together. Yun Duo had wanted to buy a head ornament for him, but he had refused to accept it if it was bought with illegal money. Yun Duo talked to the seller that she wanted a job doing embroidery to earn money just to buy the head ornament as her gift for him. As the second prince recalled this memory, he began to cry, realizing the extent of Yun Duo's efforts for him. The second prince called out to Bai Zhu, who immediately responded, asking him what she could do for him. He instructed Bai Zhu to take his wife back to his estate and to take good care of her. He warned her that if anything happened to his wife, he would hold her solely responsible. The guards expressed their condolences for the prince's loss and suggested that he needed to marry a barbarian. However, the second prince rejected this suggestion and decided to settle the matter on his own. Three months later, a messenger delivered good news from the border. The second prince had defeated the enemy's army, and their army returned in triumph. The prince declared that he no longer had to marry someone else and that he wouldn't break his promise to Yun Duo. The story then shifted back to the situation where Yun Lan was inside the spirit world. Su Yun Lan commented on the second prince's sad past and infatuation. Yun Duo thanked Yun Lan for saving her from the blood energy that was eating away at her soul. Yun Lan informed Yun Duo that all that was left of her was a remnant soul that was going to disappear soon. Yun Duo accepted her fate and decided that she needed to leave the spirit world, but not before asking Yun Lan a favor. Back in the real world, the second prince called Yun Duo, asking if she was alright. Yun Duo responded with Zior, and the second prince expressed relief that she had finally woken up. 
Yuening expressed disbelief that Yun Duo had actually come back to life. The second prince then instructed someone to bring him medicine and continued to express his joy that Yun Duo had woken up. He told her how long he had been waiting for this day and seemed overwhelmed with emotion. As the second prince leaned in to kiss Yun Duo, Su Yun Lan became increasingly agitated, unsure of what to do as he still possessed Yun Duo's body. Yun Lan woke up and Yuan Ying called out to him, excitedly welcoming him back. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan acknowledged in his thoughts how dirty he felt and how much he had been through. A few moments earlier, the second prince expressed his desire to be with Yun Duo forever, but she responded playfully, telling him that he was too obsessed with her and that she was just an empty shell. Yun Duo then told him that even if she were not by his side, she would always love him. Suddenly, Yun Duo's body faded away. Yuan Ying asked if Yun Duo had really come back to life, but Su Yun Lan responded that she had not. Instead, Su Yun Lan used the possession technique to fulfill Yun Duo's last wish, as her soul was nearly exhausted after being engulfed and her soul had scattered completely. The second prince expressed disbelief and heartbreak over Yun Duo's passing, but Su Yun Lan confirmed that Yun Duo had passed away. However, the second prince refused to believe it, saying that Yun Duo would never die. Su Yun Lan revealed that Yun Duo had requested her to say goodbye to the second prince one last time. However, her soul had been trapped by blood energy in the shape of a skeleton head. Su Yun Lan asked the second prince if he wanted to know who had trapped her, causing the second prince to be in disbelief. The second prince recalled the time when Chu Qi approached him with a medicine that could heal the dead and bring his wife back to life. The second prince was shocked and asked if Chu Qi was serious. Chu Qi reassured him that the medicine would work as long as he followed his orders and gave his wife the medicine on schedule. Back to the present, the second prince handed over the medicine to Su Yun Lan and asked if it was connected to what had happened to Yun Duo. Su Yun Lan confirmed that the medicine was most likely the cause and asked who had given it to him. He then revealed that the medicine did not bring people back to life but instead turned them into demons. The prince was distraught and blamed himself for being deceived for so long causing Yun Duo pain for many years. He revealed that the medicine was given to him by someone from the demon sect, and Su Yun Lan guessed that it was Chu Qi. The prince confirmed that Chu Qi had given him the medicine, and Su Yun Lan asked if the formation in his secret base in the snow-capped mountain had been set up by Chu Qi. The second prince confirmed this and revealed that Chu Qi was the one who had invented the formation. The two of them realized that they had a common enemy in Chu Qi and decided to work together to uncover his secrets. Su Yun Lan asked for more information about Chu Qi's plans and unknown powers, but the second prince admitted that he only knew a little about Chu Qi's activities. He had been kept in the dark and had focused solely on reviving Yun Duo. He also revealed that Chu Qi was developing Solution Zero in that base. Su Yun Lan asked about Solution Zero, and the second prince explained that it was a solution that could make one immortal but had side effects that caused the human body to become fragile and easily fall unconscious. Su Yun Lan asks the second prince if Solution Zero has been developed yet. The second prince replies that it hasn't been developed because it lacks the blood of a powerhouse. He explains that Baizu, who was considered one of the strongest powerhouses in the world, was not strong enough for the solution. They need someone even stronger, like Su Yun Lan's father, the Demon Lord. Su Yun Lan understands the situation and tells the second prince that they can go ahead with their plan. He asks if the second prince will cooperate with him. The second prince agrees to cooperate, but only if he can kill Chu Qi for Yun Duo. He promises to do anything. At the snow-capped mountain's base, a guard informs Chu Qi that the Tang Dynasty's second prince is in trouble. Su Yun Lan of the Demon Sect has captured him and claims to have evidence that can prove his involvement in the poisoning of people in the western region. Chu Qi is frustrated at Su Yun Lan for connecting the case to the second prince so quickly. He decides that they have to go there despite the risks, even though it could expose the location of Solution Zero to the old emperor. Chu Qi emphasizes the importance of preventing them from knowing the secret of Solution Zero. He acknowledges that the Black Knight under Yahoo's command is not weak. Chu Qi orders Blood Skull to go with him and kill the second prince in secret while he draws attention to himself. Chu Qi also expresses his desire to kill Su Yun Lan during the confrontation, which would leave the demon sect with only Yahoo's group without a leader. Chu Qi hopes to obtain the Black Knight for himself. In the bedroom, the second prince asks Su Yun Lan if he's sure that their method can lure Chu Qi to come. Su Yun Lan explains that every time he almost discovers the truth about the Bloody Skull, key members are killed at the last second. He proposes a plan where they will show the public that they are on bad terms, and he will pretend to trick the second prince into exposing Chu Qi in front of the public. 
Su Yunlan believes that Chu Qi will do the same thing as before and kill the second prince to prevent his identity from being revealed. When that moment comes, they will show Chu Qi their irrefutable evidence, and Su Yunlan will see what else he can use to defend himself. At a public square in the western region, Su Yunlan appears before the crowd, stating that he has found the truth behind the poisoning of the people in the region. The people are curious and want to hear what he has to say. Su Yunlan accuses the second prince of poisoning the beef and lamb that were given to everyone. The second prince denies the accusation, but Su Yun Lan challenges him to bring everyone to the snow-capped mountain's base to find out the truth. Su Yun Lan warns the second prince to hand over the antidote without a fight, or else he won't consider his relationship with Ying Er. The second prince responds dismissively, stating that Su Yun Lan won't get the antidote just by capturing him and hinting that there's someone powerful behind him. Suddenly, Chu Qi appears. Su Yun Lan asks him why he is in the western region, and Chu Qi tells him that he is damaging the royal family's reputation by interrogating the second prince in public without the permission of the emperor. Su Yun Lan realizes his mistake and asks Chu Qi to follow them to meet the emperor so he can prove his innocence. Chu Qi agrees and helps the second prince up, apologizing for their rudeness. Chu Qi thinks that only a dead man will never reveal his secret to the second prince, while the second prince gestures a nod to Su Yun Lan. Chu Qi tries to silently attack the second prince from behind, but he breaks the attack. Chu Qi is surprised and wonders if it's a formation from the demon sect that can rebound attacks. Su Yun Lan then uses a spell formation to trap Chu Qi and tie him up with the spell string. Su Yun Lan explains that even though his ultimate technique couldn't invade Chu Qi's soul, he can still trap him for a short time. Chu Qi becomes angry and accuses the two of being in this together, saying he can't believe they set up the formation beforehand and waited for him to fall into the trap. Chu Qi thinks to himself that he can't believe he's going to lose everything because he fell into a sinister trap. He's worried that if the formation continues, he'll eventually turn into a pile of bones. Su Yun Lan says that he's going to take his life into his own hands. The second prince warns Su Yun Lan to watch out because something is above him. Suddenly, a blood skull attacks Su Yun Lan from above but he manages to dodge it. Su Yun Lan recognizes the Blood Skull as the ghost-faced man and calls out to him. The Blood Skull was there to save Chu Qi. Chu Qi is relieved that the Blood Skull has arrived just in time and smirks. The Blood Skull performs a formation to release Chu Qi, and Chu Qi laughs, realizing that the micro formation can only trap one person. He attempts to escape, and as a result, the Blood Skull ends up trapped in the formation. The Blood Skull curses at Chu Qi. The second prince tries to stop Chu Qi, but Su Yun Lan reassures him by explaining that Chu Qi can't escape and that they should deal with the Blood Skull first. Su Yun Lan then uses his ultimate technique, demonic possession on the Blood Skull to save Xiao Ying's body. In the spirit world, where Su Yun Lan confronts the Blood Skull, Su Yun Lan calls out to Xiao Ying, but the Blood Skull interrupts, laughing and calling Su Yun Lan stupid for entering his spirit world. The Blood Skull reveals his plan to swallow Su Yun Lan's soul and take over his body, especially since he's heard that Su Yun Lan has the Imperial Iron Technique. Su Yun Lan responds with interest and smirks, challenging the Blood Skull to see if he has the power to do it. Su Yun Lan shows marbles with formations in them, and the Blood Skull expresses surprise. He then summons a dragon using the ultimate technique, dragon summoning and performs the dance of the heavenly demon. Su Yun Lan thinks that he's consumed too much energy in order to control Chu Qi earlier. The Blood Skull laughs at Su Yun Lan, calling him a little earthworm who isn't strong enough to make a scratch. In reality, Su Yun Lan's body is puking some blood. The second prince tries to wake up Su Yun Lan, but someone suddenly appears and tells him to leave it to them. The second prince recognizes the person. Ma Zun reassures Su Yun Lan to leave the situation to him. He then places his finger on Su Yun Lan's forehead with power. Su Yun Lan finds himself in the spirit world, where Blood Skull confronts him, threatening to eat him. Su Yun Lan is trapped in this world until Ma Zun suddenly appears. Blood Skull asks what's going on, and Su Yun Lan thinks it might be his father. Blood Skull is surprised to see Ma Zun there, as he had previously trapped Ma Zun in the Blood Prison. Ma Zun laughs and questions if anyone in the world could trap him. He then uses his power to unleash thunderbolts, striking in every direction causing the heavenly demon's domain to disappear. Mazen then asks if Blood Skull is afraid, and strikes him down. Blood Skull pleads for mercy, offering information about Chu Qi, but Mazen kills him instantly, saying that no one can touch his son. Back in the real world, Su Yun Lan opens his eyes. Mazen asks if he's awake and smiles when Su Yun Lan calls him father. Yu appears and tries to wake up her brother Xiao Yin, who is talking about walking a long way and meeting her again. Yu assures him that he'll never leave him again. Su Yun Lan tells Mazen that he'll leave the place to him and won't let Chu Qi escape. 
Yu Ning appears and tells Su Yunlan that Chu Qi is not easy to catch, and that she was ready to ambush him, but he escaped using a diversion tactic. Su Yunlan tells her that he has a backup plan, and Chu Qi can't escape. In the interior of the snow-capped mountain's base, a guard pleads for mercy. Chu Qi tells the guard that his arm needs flesh and blood to heal, and since he is his most loyal servant, it is his absolute honor to be a part of Chu Qi's body. The guard decomposes, and one of Chu Qi's hands now has flesh. Chu Qi is displeased with the result and thinks that the guard was a worthless piece of shit, and didn't even heal him that much. Chu Qi looks around and realizes there are no living people in the base. He feels frustrated that he is in danger if he doesn't replenish his blood energy soon. Then he remembers that the western region is full of people. However, he also remembers that the experiments he conducted are enough to kill everyone in that region. Despite this, he orders all the half-demon and failed experiments to kill all the people in the western region. He laughs maniacally at this. Suddenly, Su Yun Lan appears and accuses Chu Qi of being responsible for the missing people in the western region and the appearance of children out of nowhere. Chu Qi is surprised and asks how Su Yun Lan caught up with him. He then mocks Su Yun Lan and tells him that he and his father are nothing compared to his group of demon babies. Su Yun Lan confronts Chu Qi about his sins and his plans to kill innocent people in the western region. He demands to know what Chu Qi's purpose is. Chu Qi simply dismisses Su Yun Lan's question as pathetic. Chu Qi denies that he framed Su Yun Lan and his father, and instead claims that they got in his way. He reveals that 10 years ago, he was supposed to take over as sect leader from Su Yun Lan's father, but Xu and Qiu Lan appeared and threatened his chances of becoming head of the martial world. So, he played some tricks to make the entire world come after Su Yun Lan's sect, hoping to eliminate them as a threat. However, Su Yun Lan survived and became the demon lord. Chu Qi had to continue lurking beside Su Yun Lan's father and wait for an opportunity to make the world his. Su Yun Lan accuses Chu Qi of being delusional and demands that he pay for his evil deeds with his life. Chu Qi laughs and taunts Su Yun Lan, asking if the two of them can handle his half demon experiments. Su Yun Lan points out that Chu Qi had just said they were half demons, and then he uses his ultimate technique to control the half demons and attack Chu Qi. Chu Qi tries to defend himself, but he is eaten by the half demon. As he dies, he warns Su Yun Lan that there is something even more horrible waiting for him and that he will see him in hell. In the snow capped mountain base where everything is on fire, Su Yun Lan asks his father if everything is over. Ma Zun responds, thanking Su Yun Lan for his hard work and confirming that it is indeed over. The second prince and his men are working with the help of others to make large batches of antidotes. The Black Knight is sending the antidotes all over the western region. Meanwhile, the Longman Tavern and Ying Yun Company have reopened for registration, and Menger is seen leading his men to send food to the recovered villagers. At the dock, Su Yun Lan asks him if he plans to stay, and he replies, that he wants to go back to the bamboo forest to farm and fish, as it is the only place where he can feel the presence of Yun Duo. Su Yun Lan allows him to leave and tells him that if he needs help, he can signal the Black Knight in the area. Yehu then arrives and informs Su Yun Lan that they have cleared out all the surviving members of Chu Qi's men from the demon sect, and that the loyal warriors have come to the western region. Su Yun Lan asks about Emperor Tang's whereabouts, and Yehu informs him that he left the western region quietly with his emissaries and returned to the imperial capital in the Tang dynasty. Su Yun Lan expresses his confusion but says that since the western region is now their territory, they should concentrate on making it a better place during this period. In the imperial palace, the majesty is laughing evilly in a youthful form, with two maidservants lying on the floor with their blood. He mentions that this is how it feels to be young again and comments on how Chu Qi didn't deceive him. The Majesty recalls that day when Chu Qi presented Solution Zero to him. He explains that by adding the Everlasting Lotus to the solution, the Majesty can consume it and then embed Meng Po into his heart, which will grant him immortality. The Majesty is surprised and asks if Chu Qi is serious. Chu Qi explains that the solution must be consumed on the night of the full moon when the yin energy is at its heaviest to cancel out the excess yang energy in the Everlasting Lotus. He then smirks evilly and says that since he has finished his job, he can take whatever he wants when the Majesty gains immortality. The Majesty thanks Chu Qi for his service. Shifting back to the present, the Majesty thinks that he had planned to dispose of Chu Qi after gaining immortality, but Su Yun Lan and the others move too fast. He realizes that Su Yun Lan and the Demon Lord are now the biggest threats and orders the guards to dispose of the two corpses and sends out a message on his behalf. He commands the guards to accuse Tang Ying, Su Yun Lan, and the second prince of armed rebellion with the demon sect and make themselves the rulers of the western region. He declares this a huge crime and orders the execution of Su Yun Lan and Tang Ying's matriarchal family members. He also commands to dispatch every imperial guard. The majesty thinks that as long as there is enough human blood, 
He can live forever and never die. Tang Baeyun entered the room and called out to his brother, questioning why he had ordered the execution of Yinger and the others. The Majesty responded by claiming they were conspiring against him. Tang Baeyun argued that they had saved the western region and questioned his brother's sanity. The Majesty became angry and threatened Tang Baeyun, causing him to realize something was wrong with his brother's behavior. He decided to trap him, apologizing and pretending to be on his side. Suddenly, the Majesty slashed Tang Baeyun's hands, and he realized his brother was demonized. Tang Baeyun used a spell to create a blood circle prison to prevent the demon from destroying the Tang dynasty, but his brother attacked him again. After the attack, the Majesty devoured his remains. The Majesty remembered another person from the Dong family who had delicious meat. He ordered his guards to lead an army to exterminate the Dong family. At Dong's estate, the guards received a report that Madame Dong had escaped to the north. Confused, the guards questioned the accuracy of the report and decided to split up to search the west and north. However, one of the guards suggested that the report might be a trick to lure them away from the true location of Madame Dong, and they hurried to search for her. At Wu Dock, a maidservant led Mrs. Dong to their boatman, urging her to hurry as they feared their pursuers were closing in. However, Mrs. Dong sensed something was wrong and called out to the maidservant to wait. Suddenly, the boatman slashed the maidservant in the back, causing her to fall to the ground. Mrs. Dong was shocked and angry towards the boatman, who commented on her impressive ability to survive even in her 60s. Mrs. Dong called the boatman by his name, Gao Qiu, and told him that a traitor like him did not deserve to call her his teacher. Mrs. Dong misjudged Gao Qiu in the past and should not have taken him as her disciple. She accuses Gao Qiu of being a traitor who is willing to sell his family out for money. Gao Qiu responds by boasting about his wealth and calling Mrs. Dong a soon-to-be prisoner. He claims that if the emperor had not wanted to kill Mrs. Dong personally, he would have tortured her until she wished she were dead. Mrs. Dong is not intimidated by Gao Qiu's threats and challenges him to try to carry them out. Gao Qiu becomes angry and insults Mrs. Dong, calling her an old woman. Mrs. Dong retorts that she will never give up, even if the emperor were to come himself, and she questions why her family, the Dong family, is being executed. Gao Qiu orders his guards to take Mrs. Dong away, but she laughs at him and calls him ridiculous for labeling her a traitor. She talks about the history of the Dong family, which has been serving the Tang family for generations, and laments the family's current situation. She declares that even if she dies, she will never suffer such humiliation, then puts her swords to her neck and almost cuts herself. Suddenly, a knife appears, causing the swords to fall down. Mrs. Dong groans in pain while Gao Qiu demands to know who the person is. Su Yunlan appears, calling Mrs. Dong and expressing his reluctance to part with her. Mrs. Dong is surprised to see him and asks how he got there. Gao Qiu accuses Su Yunlan of being a traitor and questions how he dares to return to the Tang Dynasty. Su Yunlan responds by saying that the Emperor was lured to the West and won't be able to come in time. Gao Qiu is shocked and claims that his army will arrive soon, making it impossible for the two of them to escape. Su Yunlan assures Gao Qiu that he overestimated his own abilities and reveals that he brought demons from the place where he first met Yinger and brought them as a late wedding feast. Gao Qiu is horrified, and the demon eats him. Su Yunlan says that he will protect Mrs. Dong from now on. Mrs. Dong expresses her gratitude towards Su Yunlan, and they discuss their plan to go to the western region. Su Yunlan reveals that he has been working on something in the western region during the past few days and that it's time to put it to good use today. In the Imperial Capital, He Yen reports to Su Yunlan that the Black Knight who sneaked into the Imperial Capital has taken down all the soldiers from the Tang Dynasty. He Yen also informs Su Yunlan that the 8th group instigated the people in the Imperial Capital to gather there. Su Yunlan responds positively to this news and gathers everyone around him. Su Yunlan declares that he entered the Imperial Capital for the sole purpose of saving the people. The crowd is surprised and asks if he is planning a rebellion. Su Yunlan denies it and asserts that he is a gentleman with complete integrity who wants to save the people from the injustices of the Tang Dynasty. He explains that the Dong family has been fighting for the Tang Dynasty for generations and they have been falsely accused and executed. He believes that if the Tang Dynasty can do this to the Dong family, they can do the same to anyone in the future. Su Yunlan urges the people to follow him to the western region for a better life. The people look doubtful and unsure about following Su Yunlan. He Yen expresses his concern to Su Yunlan that the people are not reacting the way they expected and that Emperor Tang will return soon. Su Yunlan says he can only do his best and listen to God's will. He accepts that they cannot force the people to follow them. An old woman speaks up and pledges her support to Su Yunlan, citing how he had provided farming tools that helped them harvest more food in the past. Another woman also pledges her support, stating that without Su Yunlan, the number of trafficked women at the border would have only increased. Other people join in and express their support for Su Yunlan, citing how he destroyed an ore refinery that had been harming them, killed the demons hiding in the imperial capital, and saved them from being troubled by it. 
the people become enthusiastic about following Su Yun Lan to the western region and urge each other to pack their things and prepare to run with him. He Yan feels delighted that the people trust them. Su Yun Lan expresses his surprise and gratitude for the people's trust, saying that he didn't expect all the good deeds he had done in the past to be rewarded. He then urges everyone to follow him to their new homes. At the Wujiang Dock, where the Majesty watches a boat move away, the Majesty calls out Su Yun Lan's name. Meanwhile, Su Yun Lan and Yi Yan are discussing the demolition of the docks and the wooden factory in the Imperial Capital. They hope that the people who stayed in the capital will live in peace. In the distance, the Majesty vows to personally lead an army to the western region and kill Su Yun Lan. An Imperial Guard informs the Majesty that almost 80% of the people in the Imperial capital have left, but there are still a few who haven't left. The Majesty smiles evilly and decides that those who haven't left are fitting to his appetite. 